Happy Monday, everyone. Welcome to the Irish Breakdown. I am Sean Davis. And of course, that guy, he's Brian Driscoll, the editor of Irish Breakdown. I want you guys to make sure you support, continue, like, subscribe, hit the notification bell so every time we go live, you'll know and share and let everybody know that the Irish Breakdown is the best in the biz when it comes to Notre Dame football. Of course, today is the mailbag. So if you have questions, make sure you hit MB. Put your questions. We'll get to it. It's going to be a very interesting conversation today, I'm very sure, yeah. surrounding Notre Dame football. So first of all, Brian, on a Monday after having a couple of days, how are we feeling right now? You know, Sean, I'm kind of looking at it from how I how I was as a coach. It's like, okay, what do you do now, right? And that was the the point of the article I wrote this morning. Is like, look, yeah, you know, I pointed it out. Lou Holtz in his second season at Notre Dame goes five and six in year one, year two. They're they're eight and one. They're coming off of a beatdown of number ten Alabama. They're looking mm -hmm. good, and then they just implode the last three games. And and Lou Holtz didn't say, hey, okay, you know, let's just keep doing what we're doing. We'll be better next year. He has gone on record as saying. I looked at this team and said, we don't have it. I've mm -hmm. got to make changes. And they went out and made changes. You know, I talked about how in Frank Leahy's second season, I think they went like seven, two and two. Yeah. Right. And, you know, like you, you keep building, you keep building on that foundation. I can't tell you what Frank Leahy did to get there because, you know, it was like 20 years before my, or like 10 years before my dad was born, you know, but, but what I know is, is that they, they rallied to the late season struggles. And then the next year went and won a title. Lou Holtz went out and won a title the next year. I talked about how Eric Parsezian did that. And, and, but here's the thing. Tyrone Willingham went through that and they didn't bounce back and win. Bob Davey yeah. went through that in year two and they didn't bounce back and win. Uh, Charlie Weiss went through that late in year two with the loss to USC and then the loss to, 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 to LSU. And his program was never the same. That wasn't because of that. But the point is, he didn't make the necessary changes to then go and win. And so the point is, I don't know who Marcus Freeman is going to be at Notre Dame. And he will not be defined by the loss to Ohio State or the loss to Louisville. He will be defined one way or the other by what happens next. And that's why, Sean, in the article, I didn't just talk about uh, Leahy, Parsegian, Holtz and Dan Devine, who also had some year two struggles before winning a title in year three. I didn't just like throw out those four, like, hey guys, it's all going to be okay, right? This is what happened. No, I'm not saying that because other coaches were in similar situations and they didn't do what they needed to do to succeed. So the point is, we're going to find out who Marcus Freeman is by how his team responds to this. It's very similar to last year, Sean. It's kind of eerie how we've seen some of these things. So Notre Dame's offense struggles out of the gate last year. They get outscored by their – they go one and two during that stretch, get outscored 64 to 55. Notre Dame is one and two in its most three recent games. Offense is struggling. They've been outscored 64 to 55. Like, what are the odds? You know what I mean? And then what did they do, though, out of that? They bounced back and went on the road and annihilated North Carolina the next week, right? They lose to Stanford. Horrible loss. They bounced back, beat UNLV, and then went on a roll where they kind of blew the next you know, few teams out, including a ranked Syracuse team on the road, a ranked Clemson team. And, you know, you say, but but what we've learned is we don't know that that's who Marcus Freeman is because that was last year. This is this year. We don't have enough data to say who he is going to be because I'll say this. Last year, they rebounded really well from bad losses. This year, they did not. They did not rebound well from the Ohio State loss. They did not play well against Duke. They didn't. They didn't show me as a team that that wanted to was motivated to bounce back and get back on track after that loss. And it's now been two games since the team has been that way. And so I'm concerned about it, but it's concerned just because of the unknown, right? Like there's a level of unknown. Like if Kirby Smart's team would have lost to, you know, let's say South Carolina early, and then mm -hmm. we had a close game against. Auburn, let's say they lost that. I just said th they'll bounce back. It's just he's proven it. You know, he, he he's that guy. You almost kind of expected Saban to kind of bounce back a little bit after some of their issues because it's like it's Alabama. You know, but there's a track record there. Now, whether it happens or not, we'll, we'll find out. But you 
you would have assumed it. And that's what we're going to have to learn about Marcus Freeman, Sean. And I know a lot of the questions are going to be geared towards this conversation. And a lot of the questions are going to be geared towards, you know, what do you do next and all that. And I certainly have my ideas. And, you know, Marcus Freeman says some things today that I liked, said some things today that I didn't like. You know, you have to determine like what's coach speak and, and, and what's not like the play calling thing. I saw you tweeted about that. I didn't love it. I didn't love it when Brian Kelly said it after the old Miss game. There's a way to let people know that what you saw wasn't good enough without throwing the coach under the bus. Right? right. We'll get to that. But but I've always said I don't care what coaches say. I want to see what coaches do. And what we learned under Brian Kelly is when he said, I didn't think the coaching was the problem, he meant it and nothing <laughs> changed. I don't know what Marcus Freeman's reaction, true reaction to that is. I don't. I don't know if – he says the right things publicly and then goes out and does things differently. I, I, I don't know. We're going to learn that here over the next, the next, uh, was it five games? So we're going to learn if, if yeah, he said that that's, he, you know, he didn't have a problem with it, but then he went on to list problems that he had with it. Right. So it's like, you kind of like, okay, I, I think he kind of gets it. So we'll see. I, I've, I've been told by, you know, things that I've learned from sources over the years, Sean, that Marcus Freeman says a lot of things publicly. He's always going to put on the, the smile and the good face and all that, but then he'll go into the coach's room and rip people, which is, I'm fine with that. Totally fine with that. That's what I want to see. You know, I never throw your coaches under the bus, never throw your players under the bus publicly. You take ownership. You're the head football coach. Like I loved his response and he, you could tell he meant it. This is this whole, we you, you know, when Notre Dame's by was in 1988, <laughs> After the ninth game the ninth of game. the year, yeah. they had played Michigan, Miami, Michigan State, Purdue, Stanford, right? Like they weren't playing like Central Michigan and right. like Tennessee State and, and and all these type of things, man. They weren't doing that. They, so, so this whole, you know, I was looking at some of these teams. They didn't have buys back in the 60s and 50s and 40s. Like they just started in October and would play the whole season, you know? So, and I loved his response of, no, no, that's not an excuse that this program's going to use. That's not an excuse I'm going to use. And, and um, you know, the people that are using it, it's like, hey, guys, we hated it when, when Brian Kelly used excuses. We didn't accept fan excuses when Brian Kelly was head coach because I didn't like him. And we're not going to accept those fan excuses and, and coaching excuses if he offers them, um, you know, because I like Marcus Freeman. The standard mm -hmm. is the standard. I don't care whatever my feelings are of the head coach, Sean. So that was kind of my – my feelings about it. And I, I know that some of the questions I just kind of answered, but uh, I'm, uh, how are you feeling, Sean, before we dive into this, uh, this mailbag, <clears throat> how are you feeling coming out of this? I uh, actually see Notre Dame fans. You have to understand this relationship here, right? Cause we do a great job of getting each other riled up. Right. So I am minutes from going into church to get my spirit right after that Saturday <laughs> night. And I get a phone call from my brother. And he says, I really need to tell you something. I know you're getting ready to go on the service. And I said, this must be really important. And you break the news to me about the information that was shared with the offensive line right before the game. Right, which is on the premium board. I won't get into the, the specifics, but yeah, it was not Absolutely. Good. And I said, Brian, why would you do this to me? Like, I've calmed down. This payback for all the times you do that to me. That's what it was. <laughs> How many times have you called me at like midnight and just throw a grenade into the room and <laughs> just sit back and laugh as I just go off for like 15 minutes? Come on now. But no, I am much better. Uh, as you said, I had some big, had issues with certain things that were said. But you touched on something, and I would like to say this. When it comes to college football, and I'm glad you said Kirby Smart, there are games where the coaches have to realize during the game, you know what, our guys aren't here today. We're going to have to find a way to win this game as a coaching staff. I think Kirby Smart and his staff did that on the road with Auburn. I think they realized, you know what, Yo, Q Freeze was ready for us. We really didn't expect the perimeter run game to impact us the way it's impacting us today. We're going to have to make some adjustments, figure this out, and gut this one out. 
all right? And some of the things that we wanted to do offensively, our run game isn't working. We're going to have to ride number 19. We're going to have to get him to rock and win this football game. And that that is because in a football season, you're not going to have perfect execution from your football team. And there's no way as a coaching staff you should ex ever expect your football team to execute at a super high level every game. You might have four to six games in a season where your team comes out and just flat out executes perfectly and beautifully. You have to find a way to win the other six games. Whether it's just mental toughness, leadership, your best players stepping up and making plays, you have to have a gumbo of reasons why you can win football games. And I think what we've seen is that Notre Dame might not have as many ways to win football games as we originally thought going into the season. So this might be a team that really has, because they don't really have a go-to guy, right? They don't have a Brock Bowers that could take over a game. Mitchell Evans is trying to become that guy. <laughs> Mitchell Evans is trying right. to become that guy. But, heck, it's been the tight end room that's been producing that for the past, what, right. six years? You know, we've been waiting for the elevation of the wide receiver room. And I think as the talent continues to pour in, in another year or two, that evolution will take place. Marcus Freeman, remember he said this last year, he said, we're running the offense that I think we need to run right now. But we're not necessarily running the offense that I want to run in the future. And when he said that, we expected this offense to evolve. But to realize it's really been only one calendar year. And I, from a talent standpoint in the wide receiver room, no one stepped up really to become that guy. So. Unfortunately, you have to find different ways to produce <clears throat> offense because we know if you're going to beat the big boys in the most important games, you have to score points. You have to be aggressive. You have to score points. And that goes to some of the issues I had Saturday night. If you have enough gumption to go for it on 4th and 11, then heck, why are we kicking 54-yard field goals on 4th and 2 and 4th and 3? But you're going to go for it on 4th and 11. But you're going to go for it on, on your own territory, 4th and 11. It's like, come on, be aggressive. That, that's an opportunity to give your team confidence. You know what, guys? Look, we just got a turnover. Let's go for the juggler. That's the opportunity to infuse confidence in a team that really wasn't playing with confidence on Saturday night. Right? right? That as far was as the, the play calling. Sean, that was the most obvious thing, and that right there is why I put the post on the board. If you go back and look at the times tables right before kickoff, I was like, I just do not have a good feeling about this game. I just don't. And that was because I just watched this team go through pregame, and I was like, what, what is going on? This team does not want to be here. And and I, I was talking to Tim O'Malley about this last night. I was like, dude, I was getting crazy Michigan 2019 vibes. I remember sitting up wow. with, with, with a parent of a Notre Dame player. You know who I'm talking about, Sean. Yeah. And he's like, we were talking about it and like neither of us felt good. And he's like, I, I, I said, I was like, what are you seeing? You're down there. He was on the field. He's like the team over there talking about Michigan. They're excited. They're jumping around They're They, they don't have raincoats on. They're just, they're fired up. They're ready to get after this. The other team over there does not want to be, they're miserable. They do not want to be here. And that's what Notre Dame looked like from a coaching and player standpoint on, on Saturday night. So it, that goes beyond play calling and, and what your game plan is. That is a, yeah. you did not have your team ready to play. And, and we talked about that. Now, I, we'll talk more about the receiver room as we get into the mailbag, Sean. But I, I just feel like whenever an entire room is having a problem, that's not a player problem. You're well, telling fair. me Notre Dame missed on all those kids? Every single one except for Jordan Faison? That's the only kid they got <laughs> right? Really? So yeah. we'll have that conversation uh, here. It's, it's kind of like with the offensive line. Yeah. You got all these highly ranked kids. You're telling me you missed on all those guys? You know, um, we'll, we'll get into that here as we get in the show. But uh, I'm ready to get rocking and rolling, Sean. That was a nice little intro to the show. Um, 
just because like I mean this is gonna be this is gonna be a fun show, man, because we're gonna we're gonna yeah. fire it up. We're gonna be fired up. So I, I am right. fired up. I am, especially it's USC week. Yeah, yeah. that little little bit yeah. to it. I know you were talking to your dad before the show. I know he's gonna have some comments this week. Oh you know? I have a bet with my daughter. I don't know why I took the bet, but hey, you might see me wearing some USC apparel for the entire week of podcasting next week. Well, I'll just say this. If that's true, you won't be on any hours breakdown <laughs> shows next week because I will not have it. I will not have it. Um, but if so Marcus Freeman started, is the yeah. guy that we hope he is, Sean, mm -hmm. your daughter's going to be walking around campus rocking some Notre Dame gear. That's all I'm saying. Yes, she will. Okay? That's yes, all she I'm will. saying. That's all I'm saying. You ready to roll? I am. Let's start with this super chat. Thank you, Nate Milton. Still glad to have CMF. He'll get there. BK still sucks. I be rocks. And Parson better athlete than Jay Smith. Your ideal Notre Dame starting O line next season. See, Nathan Milton thought that we were still, it was going to be me and Ryan today. And he's always trying to start this conversation because Ryan and I had a disagreement on who's a, be a better athlete, Micah Parsons or Jalen Smith, more explosive athlete. I said it's Jalen Smith. Mm -hmm. And and uh, you know, so Nathan likes to stir the pot a little bit. So look, I, I'm glad they have Marcus Freeman too. I mean, I, I I just if you're jumping off the bandwagon, that's because you just never thought he was the guy anyway. Yeah. You know, it's like people are like, oh, they're gonna fade like 2014. And I'm like, maybe, maybe, but the reality mm -hmm. is 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 the schedule's not like that. They won't be seven and five. They won't lose all of their last four games because they don't play as good of teams. USC and Clemson are the only teams on the schedule capable of beating Notre Dame. It's saw some silly stuff coming out. Oh, the, this team might lose to Pitt. I'm like, guys, they lost on us last second play to no, to, to Ohio State. Yeah. This this was a game until the fourth quarter, and they played like they they played like crap, and it was a game until the fourth quarter against a, a good Louisville team. We tried to because this is the problem is people don't listen to us. Mm -hmm. Oh, you guys are hyping up Louisville, blah 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 blah, and. It, well, no, Louisville's a good football team. Like the guy coaching that team is a guy that I've been saying for five years I wanted to be Notre Dame's next head football coach, right? Just a Our good football coach. team. Yeah. And and now, does that mean Notre Dame should have lost? No, it doesn't mean Notre Dame should have lost. But but that's different than Pitt sucks. Stanford <laughs> sucks. Like they're not going to lose to those team guys. They, they play like crap against Duke and still won. Yeah. Right. So it's not that it's let's let's not jump into somebody's like this is going to be like 2016 i'm like they could lose the rest of their games it's still not as bad as 2016 because they already have more wins yeah. than that in 2016 they lost a three and nine michigan state four and eight duke five and seven tech like can we just chill with the hyperbole and actually stay on point and not be that fan base right we can be pissed about what happened saturday night without jumping off a cliff and getting into the nonsense of like oh they're gonna lose to pit they've already beat a team way bet two teams way better than pit and Stanford and Wake Forest, right? So um, let, let's just worry about USC, and then we'll dive into that other stuff later. So, uh, and then, Sean, what we'll do is I'll go ahead and bring these up, and then you can read them, and then we'll rock and roll cool. um, and be ready to roll. And we'll go through the Super Chats first. We got another one from Joe Papiti. What's up, Joe? Heard MF say that he wasn't upset with the play calling. I turned off the presser at that time. Parker is overmatched, and Marcus Freeman doesn't know what to do. I would, I would never. I would. Uh, let me say, I would encourage you to never turn a press conference off over by that statement. Listen to what follows. Listen to what he says afterwards. I'm not defending it because there are some things I, I don't want him to say. Yeah, Jared Parker sucked on Saturday night. Because then, what confidence are the players going to have in Jared Parker or Al Golden or Marty Biaggi? Right. Um, then he starts talking about don't run that call. If we don't if we don't have ways to block that and do that, then don't call it. So he's clearly saying he didn't agree with all the calls. He talked about what he told the offensive staff. He's already had that conversation with the offensive staff. Clearly, he's not happy with what we saw Saturday night, but he's not gonna also come out in the press conference and say, Yeah, I, I was pissed off by the play calling Saturday night. He should never say that. That that because you don't want to coach for a guy that's going to do that, right? Because what if Jared Parker's out there on Tuesday night at the press conference and Jared Parker says, "Well, look, I was told by Marcus Freeman he, that we need that we needed to run this and 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 uh, and and it didn't work." Yeah, how's that going to go? Well, that's the same exact thing of Marcus Freeman saying, "Yeah, Jared Parker did a bad job on Saturday night." You always got to listen to what what he says next, 
right? And there were some things he said that bothered me. The offensive line played well. No, it didn't. <laughs> but there were also things he said about like, look, you put our offensive line in some bad situations, which they did. We talked yes. about this, you know. Yeah. We've got to have better calls here. We got to get this guy blocked. We got to get that guy blocked. Well, who who's supposed to block those guys? It's the offensive line. I that's one time where I would like to see him issue a little bit of a challenge. And, and there's a way to do it without being negative or like, hey, listen, you know, this is a program that's going to be built on offensive and defensive line play. And he said we didn't dominate the trenches on start. He said that. He goes, and and, and we're going to need that group to really step up and play their best football down the stretch. Right. That's a way where you're ch- issuing a challenge without saying, yeah, they sucked on Saturday night. Right. There's a right and a wrong way to do it. And and him saying I'm upset with the play calling would to me, that would have been a much bigger red flag to me than him saying I'm not upset with the play calling for me, just because of what I would want from him as an as a coach. But then when you listen to what he said next, it's like, OK, he's clearly not happy with the play call. You can just tell by what he said. He's just being what a, a head coach should do, which is I'm always going to protect my guys publicly. But behind the scenes, you're not getting the job done. You're not going to be too fond of me. And that's that's the impression that I got from what he said. I hope that that's true. That might be wishful thinking on my part, Sean, but that's how I read that. And that's what it needs to be anyway. And he speaks from his personality, as most people will do. Nick Saban is very short, so you're not going to get a lot from Nick Saban. He's straight to the point. Marcus Freeman is very much a storyteller. He is a people person, right? So when he gets questions from the media, he's going to give you a lot. And some people might think that he says too much or he's too honest at times. Okay. And today, I think he said some things that he probably didn't have to say that kind of contradicted other things he said in certain ways and as a head coach he'll become better over time at using the media to get his point across to everybody yes because he could have just simply said we all have to be better right. that's it and then if he wanted to go into some individual things to kind of support that right then that's fine because that's, that's spinning fine. the question in a way that you answer it the way you want. The problem, yeah. the, I say problem. The thing that Coach Freeman's going to have to learn, Sean, is how to reframe a question so you yeah. can answer it the way you want to answer it. The problem he yeah. had, the thing he does now is he just answers it. He the answers question what? was, did you yeah. have problems with the play calling? Yeah. So he said, no, I didn't have problems with play calling. And then List kind of went on the rest of the thing and had issues with the play calling. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So to your point, reframe the question. You know, look, when you lose a game like this and you lose 33 to 20 and you turn the ball over five times and you do this and you, you know, have fewer rushing yards and you had attempts like, yeah, th- there's things we got to evaluate and we all got to do a better job of. We got to do a better yeah. job from a coaching standpoint. We got to do a better job from a playing standpoint. And we and I got to do a better job of getting this team ready to play because this team was not ready to play Saturday night. And that's on me. Right. Boom. Nailed it. Right. And then move yeah. on. He'll learn that. He'll learn that. You know, but I'd ra- if you're going to have a fault, I'd rather your fault be. He's too honest. Yeah. He, he, you know, he tells you what what he what he thinks. And you know. Yeah. I'll give you, can I give an example? This is where he could have been inclu- an example of Cam Hart produces the turnover. Right? This post game, talking about the post game. Or or even today. Because people are worried about him throwing Jared Parker under the bus. Marcus Freeman is the head coach. He has ultimate veto power. He's on the headphones. He's listening to what's being called. Coaching 101. Even I know it. When you get a turnover like that at midfield or in positive territory, you come out and you try to go for the juggler. First play, let's go for it. You don't come out 13 personnel. And then run a toss. Then run a toss. You don't do that. Right? That's an opportunity. Marcus Freeman could have used that opportunity, that play, and said, you know what? Man, just take, for example, we get the quick turnover. We probably should have been more aggressive. And that's on me because, and he could have concluded himself in that without throwing the OC right. under the bus. That's right. something that we should have done, taking advantage of that opportunity to go at Louisville and seize control of the game. 
It's something as simple as that. Because you've got to practice sudden change. Right. Every team's supposed to practice sudden change. What do we do in this instance? Why do teams go for the jugular in that situation? Because defenses a lot of times are going to go to try to make a play. Yeah. We've got to go make a play to get the ball back or force them back or whatever. And so, you know, they were going to be coming heavy on that Mm -hmm. particular play. And they did. Yeah. And Notre Dame couldn't do anything. Imagine if they would have had a reverse scheduled for that play. Yeah. I mean, that was the perfect formation for it. I believe you had Chris Tyree on the field. I, be- I have to go look in that play again. I thought they had – I thought it was actually – I have to go look at it again because now I'm now I'm not sure. But, you know, that was a similar situation to where, if you remember correctly, and I, and I brought this up, and I've heard people say, you can't give Chris Tyree a, a jet sweep because he's not real shifty. And I'm like, how shifty was Braden Lindsey when he ran that 50-yard touchdown reverse against USC? Against USC. The whole point, or, or the jet sweep against Boston, the whole point of that kind of play is not to make people miss. The whole point of that play, when you call it, is to you think they're overplaying it. You can get an edge, and so you get it to somebody really fast who can get outside the edge and get up the sideline. That's the whole point of running that play. And and so when you when you have that type of situation, like that's why you go to it. And mm-hmm. and there just seemed to be, and this is what I said, Sean, after the show, to you know, and this is the issue I had play, play calling to. To Joe's frustration is this: there, there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of rhyme or reason to what they're doing. Mm. There's no method to the madness, so to speak, in my opinion. And that, that's my issue. If, if you want to be honest with you, that, that's my issue. And the only time that I really thought, like, okay, there's intentionality here. Um, actually, Sean, it's worse. They are actually in 14 personnel on that play. I was incorrect. They had four tight ends on the field on that play. And then they ran the toss sweep. And so there was 11 dudes in the box. <clears throat> yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Yeah. Basically 11 guys in the box. So there were 14 personal. It was even worse. Yeah. But, but that's just the kind of thing, Sean, is there's just no, there's no. And then, well, the point was when they did do something with purpose. Hey, they're, they're coming up. They're, they're bombing us. You know, we've ran a couple tunnels. They're flying downhill to the tunnel. Let's do a pump and throw it down the field. What happened? Boom. Big yeah. play. Yeah. They're just kind of running plays to run plays. They're not running plays with any intentionality. Yeah. And the other thing is a head coach, you get in that third and one situation and you see two guys getting ready to scream off the edge and you know, they're running downhill a gap run. Timeout. Yeah. Timeout. That's what they're there for. Timeout. Yeah. yeah. You say, well, you need to save your timeouts for later in the game. Well, later in the game, those timeouts meant nothing because you're down 30 to 13. Nothing. Yeah. You needed the points there. You you played like garbage the first half of the game. Garbage. It was 10, what, 10 to 10 at halftime? Seven to seven uh-huh. at halftime. Well, 10 yeah. was scored at halftime. 10 to 10, right? Seven six, yeah, 10, 10. Yeah. You come out, merely force a turnover and then put, put <clears> one in the end zone. That's a different right. ball game. Yeah. And that's the frustrating thing. There were so many top chances for that those moments in the game on Saturday where Notre Dame's down 17-13. They hit that big play to Mitchell Evans. Boom. Penalty. Face mask yeah. on your yeah. right tackle. It's like, what are we doing? What are we doing? So let's go to the next one, Sean. Thank you, Daniel, for your super chat. Hey, guys, what's your opinion on Tobias this year so far? I had high hopes of him having a breakout year, especially with Sam Hartman at quarterback, but been disappointed so far. Thanks for your hard work. Go Irish. I'm disappointed by what we've seen from Tobias as well, and there's two aspects of it. Number one is I have some issues with the coaching, what, what we've seen of how they've used him, but the coaching isn't the reason he do, he drops a crossing route against Duke. The coaching isn't the reason to me that he doesn't make that catch down the field. Like, you know, maybe his confidence is shot, but at the end of the day, your confidence is 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 partly on you. You know, yeah. like look, we we all have coaches we don't like or do a bad job or whatever. It's like, but I gotta still go out there and do my thing. He's not playing with a lot of confidence right now. And, and honestly, yeah. none of the receivers are. And again, Sean, I'm gonna point to this. When something is happening to an entire position group, that's not on them. Like I've seen Tobias Merriweather in spring practices and fall practices use releases where he's got the Notre Dame starters just spinning in circles with his releases. Yeah. You know how many times I've seen him do that in a game? Zero. Zero. And, and why? why? Why are they are they not being allowed to do those things in games? Like, Because, uh, again, this is something that's happened with all of them. Now, that to, Chancey Stuckey is not the reason Tobias dropped that crossing route against Duke. That's on Tobias. Yeah. 
Yeah. Chancey Stuckey's not the reason Tobias didn't catch that ball on that last drive against Duke. Simple as that. Mm-hmm. But you can you can keep – so you throw Rico Flores out there, and guess what happens? Same exact thing. You put J- you don't have Jaden Thomas last week against Duke. Man, our offense struggled because we didn't have Jaden Thomas. Okay, <laughs> what did Jaden Thomas do on Saturday when the game was in doubt? Nothing. He caught a four-yard slant. His other catches – again, this isn't a knock on Jaden Thomas. Mm-hmm. This is no matter who you put in the game, this keeps happening. So either A – you had recruiting evaluation misses on your entire freaking roster outside of Jordan Faison, or mm-hmm. they're not being prepared well. They're not being coached well. They're not giving being given the resources as receivers to be successful against good defense cornerbacks. And they faced really good corners the last three weeks. And they faced good corners against NC State. And for the most part, they've gotten <laughs> their lunch taken from them when they play those guys. Right? And so – why is why are these corners having the success and Notre Dame's guys can? And I'm watching some of these little walk-ons at Oklahoma running around the field making plays on 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 Texas, and I got to sit and watch all these four stars from Notre Dame, you know, because people love star rankings. All these guys that have talent, guys we have seen play make plays. We've seen Jaden Thomas make plays in the past. All of a sudden, he stinks against anybody any good. The guy that we saw do what he did last year, all of a sudden, can't make plays against anybody good. So am I to believe that Jaden Thomas has been doing nothing but eating Cheetos this offseason and not getting better? Or maybe there's a problem with how these guys are being used and the coaches need to stop blaming the players for it and look in the mirror and say, why is my entire position group struggling like this? Why are my only two guys that know how to win, run routes are my two true freshmen? Why, why is that? <laughs> right? Why is that? Because, hey, look, guys, we're a year and a half into this. As someone who's coached receivers at the Division three and 1AA level, if my guys can get their routes corrected in their first season, you're telling me Notre Dame guys can't, right? You're a year and a half into this. No more blaming Dell. You can say, oh, Dell left them with an empty roster. Tobias Merriweather, Jane Thomas, Chris Tyree. Like that. that's enough for you to have a good foundation with the freshmen to be able to have. And the tight ends you have and the running backs you have, there are plenty of weapons to be better in the pass game. This is a coaching problem first and foremost. And then – in certain situations, players got to step up and make more plays. Mm-hmm. But when your position group has no confidence and these things are happening over and over and over, none of your guys are competing for the football. None of your guys are making plays. Either A, you guys misevaluated this entire roster, or B, you, you're you're something is there's a disconnect with your in your preparation that you're not being able to translate practice field on the game field. And and I talked about it in fall camp. We said they're not utilizing good press release moves in fall camp. It's not a lack of ability. It's a lack of what are you doing? And then we would see in one-on-ones, we would see these receivers. So like during team in 707, they get eaten up. And then on one-on-ones, they do like the, you know, things like that. And they're shaking dudes. And then they get to team and they're not allowed to do that stuff. Well, I don't say not allowed. They don't do it. I don't know if they're not allowed to or not. They don't do it. Well, what's what, what's the disconnect? What's causing that? Figure it out, fix it, and then go let these kids play. Because it's 2023, man. This is yeah. this isn't. You know, I'm watching. I'm watching them uh, run quick routes against against Duke, Sean, and it's they're playing man. Okay, when you call it a play thinking it was zone. It's playing man. Okay, that, that happens. But there's teaching involved when you run an option route and it's man. You move. And everybody's taught how to move and where to go. So you don't have guys running into each other. Notre Dame's guys don't do that. They just stay there. They just stand there. Man. Until Sean Sam Hartman scrambles. And then here's the other thing. No stutter goes. Like what do oh, teams do? Like in those third and five, you like run a quick option, a nod, and then go. None of that. None mm-hmm. of that. Won't see any of that. I, I I've done that stuff at the division three level, the one double A level, but I you can't get Notre Dame guys to do that? Sam Hartman can't read that? I watch teams do this all the time, run mm-hmm. stuff like that. And then the one time they do something like that, Sean, what happens? Boom, 30 yards. Right? So at the end of the day, this is what we did under Kelly. Every time things go, oh, it's not the coach. Yeah, it's players. It's players. Bench this guy, bench the guy. Bench you guys are going to run out of guys to bench. Right? You you yeah. got – this is what I say. You, you, you can't afford to not – to throw Tobias Merriweather to the side. You can't afford to do that. You're getting paid six figures. It's your job to figure out what the problem is and fix it. 
and fix it with Jaden Thomas and fix it with Jaden Greathouse and fix it with Rico Flores and fix it with Chris Tyree. Because when your entire position group is struggling, you got to look in the mirror. And I have held that point of view, Sean, since yeah. you've known me. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I'll say this about Tobias. This staff wasted an opportunity to instill confidence in the, the young man during his freshman year. Period. You sit up here and you talk about he's not ready to do this, he's not ready to do that. Your job is to instill confidence for development for his sophomore year. If you're an elite program, if you get one, a one of one player, which is a Michael Floyd that can just come in as a freshman and dominate, then by all means, you get a one of one. He wasn't a one of one. He needed confidence. You wouldn't play him. You constantly kept telling him and saying it publicly that he's not ready. What do you think that does to a kid? So I blame this staff. Marcus Freeman reiterated. Tommy Reese would say it. Marcus Freeman would say it and regurgitate it. You're not building this young man up. So he's basically going through his freshman year of trying to gain his confidence right. in his sophomore year. And that's what you're seeing. You're seeing a kid out there with more reps trying to gain confidence, which is something he should have gone through in his freshman year. He should have been given reps and the opportunity to gain confidence and then came into the off season of his freshman year ready to take the next step. He wasn't given a foundation, so he had nothing to stand on this off season. Nothing. This off season was about him building his foundation. And the struggles you're seeing are the struggles he should have gone through last year. So that's a mistake of the staff in development, period. That's what it is. So next year, he should look more like what he should have looked like this year if they had done what they needed to do with the young man in his freshman year. But they didn't. It was a missed opportunity. Brian? I heard some things at the spring game weekend about Tobias that caused me to pause and say, okay, I got to take some time with this young man. I have to be patient with him because that's the word that was given to me. I expressed that. You know, fans were like, oh, he's going to have 80 catches and 1,000 yards and 10 touchdowns. And I'm like, mm, no. And now that we're seeing him go through what he was supposed to go through as a freshman, right? It's the similar thing. Braylon James should be going through certain things right yes. now that he's not going through. So next year, when we expect him to take a step, what's his foundation? Right. What's his foundation? And, and that's the issue that we have with the staff right now. Because like, he shouldn't be struggling like this. No, he, he should not. Be. He should not. Rico, and we said this, uh, Ryan and I, we said this on the recruiting show. We knew Rico and Jaden would come in ready. Yeah, their routes were we, taught to them in high school. We saw the current yes. staff. Yes, we knew they would come in ready. And then once I saw them in the spring, it was like, okay, yep. They're going to be ready to go out and produce, right? But no one thought that they would be the main receiver or leaned on to be the main receiver to the outside. They're both good on the interior, in the slot, running routes, running option routes. That's their strength. I'm not mad at Rico for not being a speed guy on the outside. That's not who he is. How can I be upset with him being put in a position? That's not who that's not who he is physically as a wide receiver. I can't be mad at him. Right. Hey, run this fly route. Okay, coach. All right. Right. I'm gonna, I'll do what you asked me to do to the best of my ability. Because we knew he was raw, Sean. But in this yes. era, in this era, the whole he's not ready to play thing 
when your receiving core is this bad, I'm tired. It's a, and it's the same thing with Tobias last year. I'm tired of those excuses. I am. Mm-hmm. And 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 we saw, you know, Tobias isn't ready. Then freaking get him ready. What what exactly is it's like that scene from what would you say you do here? Like Mike Mickens can get freshmen ready to play and turn into all Americans. Man, you know what I mean? Like he he can do that. We've seen other guys, we've seen other guys do that. You're telling me and again, I'm not asking for Braylon James to come and be the number one guy. Just throw a different something at an opponent. Because here's the thing, even if you're not going to throw him the ball, if teams are like, man, this guy's pretty fast, he can get over top of defense, and use him as a use him to run off the safeties to open up your tight end. Absolutely. You, you know what I mean? Like you can't teach a kid with his ability four routes yeah. to play 10 snaps a game. Again, I'm not saying, hey, throw Braylon into the boundary and let him be your number one guy. I'm not saying yeah. that. Yeah. But when you're going into the Duke game in week seven or week five and your game six for you. And this kid who was an early enrollee is not ready to go out and give you 10 snaps when you've got half your depth chart injured. That's a, that's a you problem because it's now, it's a pattern. It's a pattern that we saw last year. We're seeing it again this year. Well, Hey, they're playing Jaden Greathouse and Rico Flores. A, they have to Mm -hmm. at this point. And B, those guys showed up ready to play i don't give you credit for taking two kids from big time programs who already know how to play and say yeah hey, we're gonna play them right it's your job to coach up the guys who maybe aren't at that point and get them ready to play and and that's that's the frustrating thing so does that mean that this is all none of this is on tobias and it's on the coaches no yeah. and he's lucky didn't drop that crossing route because he didn't wasn't playing with enough urgency against duke that's not on the coach chancy stucky doesn't teach guys to push off on go routes i know he doesn't teach that yeah, but that's that lack of confidence thing that you talked about. But some of that, though, and here, we had a question, Sean, that I want to address too. That was down here that that I want to get to as as well because it speaks to this, and and I think it's something that you and I have talked a lot about, and I know that you have had a lot of conversations about this on your show. And it was about the players not having confidence in the coaches, and it's from Joe Papiti. So, Sean, this is why I think Parker's overmatched and not ready. He didn't recognize early enough that they were in serious trouble. I honestly don't think the players believe in the staff. And, and I, I want to say this to that. It, it, let's say that's true. That still doesn't excuse what we saw Saturday. Because I know for a fact, a fact, that some of the best teams the Notre Dame had under Brian Kelly had very little faith in the coaching staff. Very little faith in the coaching staff. They didn't care. They had the kind of leadership where they said, that's what that's on them. They can control what they can control. We mm-hmm. can control what we can control. And when we're out there, we're going to ball out. And they did. Yeah. And, and this is not a young team for Notre Dame. It's not a young team. What I'm concerned about is if that's true, it tells me. I'm not even concerned about it because I don't, I don't know that it's true. But if that were true, that's not a coaching problem. That's a player mm-hmm. problem. Because at some point in time, I I don't care if you what your feelings are about Chancey Stuckey as a coach. And I'll use this as an example. I don't know what Tobias' feelings are about Chancey Stuckey. I'm just making a point. Let's just say hypothetically that he doesn't have faith in Chancey Stuckey or Jared Parker. Well, Jared Parker just called a play to get you one-on-one on on a go outside go route in a big moment where you make a play to win and you didn't make the play. Mm. You had a chance to go catch a crossing route and, and make a play and you didn't. You had a chance to catch a, a a wide fade route, and yeah, the ball needs to be better, but you got to make that play. Those plays are not on the coaches. You've got to make those plays, and, and so that's why I say the blame is not on the coaches only. The blame mm-hmm. is not on the players only, but to me, it always starts at the top from coach head coach on down. It it should always be that way. You say, well, the players aren't playing with heart right now. Well, whose fault is that? You got enough depth now that you can say, you don't want to play that way? Fine, I'm going to put somebody else in and he'll play that way. It's as simple as that. And that's where accountability uh, comes from. Eli Drinkwitz. Eli Drinkwitz. I think, did I say his name right? The head coach at uh, Missouri? Yeah. Um, He goes by both. He shortens it to Eli and then it's, I think his name is actually like Elia. I think it's actually his name. Yes, you're right. Two years ago, I believe, Luther Burton. Burden out of uh, St. Louis was the number one receiver in the nation. Correct? Yeah, he was up. They, there. Brought, him, they brought him in and he, they played him outside. 
He's the number one receiver in the nation. We just plug him in outside. And he did take off. And then they brought in some other guys and put Luther Burton in the slot. And all of a sudden, he became a superstar. And Coach Drinkwitz said, we realized that that was the position he needs to be in. Right? So, you know, some people in the chat are like, you know, every kid coming out of high school knows how to run a, know, run a fade route. What does that mean? That might not be their most effective way to be used. Of course they know it. But if that's not the best place for them to play to be productive, then what are you doing? It's the job of the staff to put kids in that offense, in that defense, in the best position to be effective. D.J. Brown is not athletic. But Al Golden's job is to put him in the best position to be effective on the field. Period. The only receiver lined up to the outside being asked to run a fade is not the most effective way to use Rico Flores. It's in not. that moment, right. It's not. And it's as simple as that. So if you don't get the production, who is that on? That's like me coaching the Chicago Bulls in the 90s, calling a play for Will Purdue with five, five seconds left. What a, that's, my, that's, that's, that's not Will you. Purdue's fault. That's my fault. And I got See, Michael Jordan in, on the floor. You know why that never would have happened, though, Sean? You could have called Michael, that play all you want. Michael Jordan would have told me to go to hell. Right. I mean, Casey Jones has said this about uh, he, Casey Jones has shared, shared stories like this where he he called playing the huddle and Larry Bird would just be like, yeah, we're not going to do that. Just give me the ball and get out of the way. Just give me the ball. In this and you know what Casey said? Game. All right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because like that's what's going to happen anyway. Yeah. Uh, you know, but but that's kind of say it's like, you know, the, the, the at some point time players got to say, hey, look, yeah, I know this is what coach said, but um, just go yeah. ahead and give me the ball. Just you know go ahead I mean? and give me the ball. Right. You know, and it's that's a great analogy. Yeah. It's it's just one of those things where, you know, we have to recognize that everybody, everybody, and you know, I'm trying to be very um, understanding of the position that Jared Parker might be in. Right, trying to come in, he said, everything is going to be collaborative. We've seen that. I believe we've seen things in the run game that probably came from Coach Rudolph and Coach McCullough that they thought would be nice. Let's add this. Cool. So we've seen collaborative effort. What we have not seen, in my opinion, is Notre Dame collectively, players and coaching staff, against the best competition, being aggressors. Yeah. Notre Dame. From an offensive line standpoint, and because I know this is something you don't like, and you talk to me about it all the time, it's, you know, when you watch tape and film, Notre Dame has been catching for the past three weeks. They haven't been going out and putting themselves right. or putting force on the other team. They've been catching the other team coming with force and trying to hold up for four quarters and win it instead of being the aggressor and saying, Hey, yep. we're going to hit you in the mouth. They even get hit. They got hit in the mouth and they're trying to hold on. And it's like, no, we're Notre Dame. We're coming into your stadium and we're going to hit you in the mouth. I actually thought the first four plays that Jared Parker came up with, were there, I was like, okay, you come in, you get them to react to your heavy set, and then you spread everybody out and you throw the ball. I'm like, that's really smart, right? Open them up to then run the ball at some point. That was my expectation. I didn't expect them to stay heavy with Rico as the only receiver and then try to throw a fade route. That, that right there, I'm like, okay, everything's going good. This is a nice way to start the game to get Louisville off balance, show them some things that they didn't expect. But then you come with that, that play call. Right. That's that's not it. The play call I don't have a problem with, Sean. It's who you th- who you called the play for. Mm. 
right? Like that's my issue. Like you, you don't put Rico in that position. I mean, we saw Same. against Ohio State and against Duke. He's not, yeah. especially with the the release moves that they're using. He's not winning that. And this is this is one of the things that annoys me most about some Notre Dame fans. Is this comment right here from Ray? Ray and I love you, man, but I'm sorry, I just can't roll with mm-hmm. you here. BD, you were the king of blaming Dell Alexander. Now it's Stucky's fault. They need better players. Better than what? Their roster's littered with four star guys that had great offers. Yeah. Right. So you're telling again. So your your theory is they missed on all these recruits. Mm-hmm. Missed on all of them. And it's the players' problem. Where's Dell coaching right now? <laughs> how how many years has Chancey Stucky been a wide receivers coach? When when Clemson, his alma mater, needed a receivers coach, who, who, did they hire him? No, because he's young. He's still growing as a football coach. Yeah. Right. This is why I said. Jamarcus Shepard would have been the hire because here's the thing. You hire Jamarcus Shepard, guess who gets promoted to offensive coordinator when Tommy Reese leaves? Mm-hmm. Jamarcus Shepard. Tommy Reese didn't want him. So that's what happened, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so this whole thing about, oh, they need better players. Okay, go. let's go look at Washington. Perfect example. As second-year players, Jalen McMillan and, and Roma Dunze were mediocre players as sophomores, both highly ranked guys, but – Roma Dunes has 41 catches for 415 yards, four touchdowns. Jalen McMillan has 39 catches for 470 yards, three touchdowns for over the course of an entire season for an offense that scored 21.5 points per game. Lost games scoring seven points to Montana, 10 to Michigan, 24 to Oregon State, 17 to UCLA, 16 to Oregon, 17 to Colorado, uh, 13 to Washington State. Yes, they lost to Colorado that year. They hire a new coach. Kalen DeBoer comes in. He brings Jamarcus Shepard with him. Mm-hmm. One offseason, those same players, same team, they score 39.7 points per game. They go from 4 and 8 to 11 and 2. The same exact players. Jalen McMillan goes from doing what he did. And as a freshman, he caught two passes for 14 yards. He mm-hmm. goes out last year as 79 catches for 1,098 yards and nine touchdowns. Roma Dunes, a same kid. Right, caught six passes as a freshman, 41 as a sophomore, averaged 10 yards a catch, goes out the next year, catches 75 passes for 1,145 yards, and they almost double their point total. Same Mm -hmm. players, right? They got a veteran quarterback to transfer in, just like Notre Dame got. But their play got better, way better. Why? Because of coaching. Now, this is not a direct correlation because I think Jalen McMillan and Roma Dunze are better players than Jaden Thomas. They're they're better talents than Jaden Thomas. They're a year older than Tobias Merriweather. So they're not, this is not a direct tit for tat conversation, but it, I could give you 50 examples like this yeah. where you bring a new coach in and like that, the same exact players go out and all of a sudden start producing at a high level. So I'm supposed to say that, well, it, it, it's, it's coaching doesn't matter. But watch the film. Tell me that you're seeing these kids do the things that you see other co- other receiving cores do technically. Mm-hmm. Tell me you see them run routes in similar with similar techniques. Tell me you tell me you see them trying their best with all these different release moves, and it's just not good enough. That's not what we're seeing. Now, are we sitting there saying that this receiving core should be mirroring Ohio State's with the talent they have? No, but it shouldn't suck. And that's the whole point. And 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 so I just get so tired of this willingness to just throw players under the bus. At some point in time, these guys are getting paid a lot of money to develop these guys. Some are doing a good job with it. Some aren't. And you got to be willing to say that because I'll say it again. I'm to believe that Notre Dame's coaching staff missed on every single receiver on their roster right now, except for mm-hmm. Jordan Faison, who now everybody thinks is great, but then he's going to go out and have a struggle in a game or two, and then he's going to suck as well, and you need to go out and get new guys, right? That's the reality of it, right? Three weeks ago, everybody's ready to bench Mitchell Evans because of how well Holden Stace played against NC State. By the way, Holden Stace is a you know talented player. You know Mitchell Evans is a talented player. Use them both. But Mitchell, you know, Mitchell Evans doing doing pretty well this year. He's made a big yeah. jump from last year. I had two catches last year. Two, what oh, no, four catches last year. Had three in the bowl game. Now he's one of the more productive tight ends in college football the last few weeks against very good defenses. Yeah. Okay, well, how come he's getting better? But none of the receivers are. None of them. 
Right. You, you see what I'm saying, guys? Like, I understand, Ray. I understand where you're coming from to a degree. I do. But again, where's Dell coaching right now? If he's such a great coach, where, where's he coaching right now? You know, so. Uh, th- I'll, I'll say this. And you you just did an incredible job talking about development. Um, if you tap in late. I pointed out how the coaching staff failed to bias his entire freshman year and didn't develop him the way he needs to be developed. Let me go to the OC because, you know, people, you know, somebody in the chat said that Notre Dame has been aggressive. No, they haven't. I'll, let me point out. Say it again. I can't hear you. Oh, you're on mute. My father. Somebody in the chat said what? I didn't hear what you said. They said Notre Dame was have needs to do more multiple tight end sets because oh, their yeah. receivers aren't good and they have been aggressive. Notre Dame hasn't been aggressive. See, let me tell you what smart, aggressive OCs do. They use formations. If you know you have a wide receiver core that lacks speed, you know what smart OCs do? They go to bunch sets. They go to certain formations that don't allow people to come up and bump and run their receivers to give them a better release and to give them an opportunity. You remember late in the third quarter? Because Duke couldn't get off man-to-man against Notre Dame for two and a half quarters, Brian. They didn't have the talent at wide receiver to get open. You know what Chris John started doing? Motion. Bunch. And somehow, some way, his receivers were getting open in the flat, option routes. All of a sudden, Benjamin Morrison couldn't, couldn't cover this guy. Why? Because Chris Johns got aggressive and smart and said, my guys aren't good enough just to line up. Like, we're sitting here mad that the wide receivers aren't physically. Like, what do you want them to do? They can't get faster in one day. They are who they are. But the offensive coordinator just refuses to do anything schematically to help his receivers get a free release and to get into patterns. No, we're not going to motion. We'll motion to jet sweep on a third or fourth and one. Wow, that's when you want to use motion. But no bunch Mm -hmm. sets. Like I watch OCs do it all year long. I don't have talented wide receivers that can just flat out beat you. So I have to create ways for them to get free releases right. to be able to get open. It if happens you, all the time. If you do accept the but premise your receivers aren't good enough. Oh, they it, don't want to it's even that, worse. I don't know. Sean, it's even worse if you don't think your receivers are talented and can't play. It's even worse what they're doing right now. Schematic. Mm-hmm. It's even worse to your point because they're not doing things to schematically get them open. They're not doing ISOs. No. They're not do, using route combinations to get guys open. They're not using motion. They're not using movement. If, if The worst thing you can do with receivers who aren't good is be static pre-snap. It's the worst thing you can do against them. So, so again, if it's a talent problem, all right, if we're to grant – that's a great point you made. If, if we're to grant the premise that the talent is the problem, then it's even a, worse what they're doing. Absolutely. Schematically. It still goes back to the guys getting paid lots of money to do this. This is their job, right? And so yeah, I know it's easy for us to just throw players in the bus because players can't defend themselves. If they get on Twitter and respond to someone saying something stupid, they're the problem. Oh, you're supposed to just let that roll off your chest because I would have done that when I was 19-year-old and some moron was saying things to me on Twitter that were insane. I wouldn't have said anything. Yes, you would have. Right. And, and so they, because they, but we know they can't, they can't respond. They can't do that. And anytime they ever have responded, they get in trouble. Mm-hmm. Right. So we, it's easy to throw them under the bus. I understand that, Ray. But look, the reality is, is, does Notre Dame need a better place? We've always said that. We've always said that they need to continue to get better at receiver, which is why next year's class is so important, which is why the current freshman class was so important to get Jaden Greathouse and Rico Flores and Braylon James. But I'm sorry, we're just not seeing this group be developed. It's not just the results, it's how the results are happening. Yeah. Watch, I've said this, and I've tried to point this out. Watch how other receivers play. You've got to, as a as a fan, if you're going to be critical of the players, and this is this is some advice for you, is and I'm not 
taking a shot at you here, Ray. So please take this in the right spirit. You've got to be able to say, okay, let me watch my guys and let me watch other guys. Because what you'll learn is there's a difference between watching a guy and realizing he's slow and then watching a guy realize he's playing slow. There's a difference. Sometimes you're playing slow initially because it's purpose. I'm letting things clear out because I got something else coming up, right? You always yeah. got to mix up your speeds of your releases. But then you'll watch and say, you know what? These guys aren't playing with – this is why I say urgency. I don't say they're playing slow because as soon as you were to use the word slow, people just take that to mean something completely different, right? They don't play with urgency. And then you watch other receiving cores, and there's intentionality in everything they do. Yes. Right. If I'm coming off the line slow, there's a reason for it. If I'm coming off the line fast, there's a reason for it. I'm mixing up what I'm saying. So if I come off this way, sometimes it means I'm going to run something quick. Sometimes it means I'm going to something quick because I want you to bite and then I'm going to go. Right. There's method. There's method to the madness. There's purpose. There's intentionality. What's the intentionality you see from Notre Dame players from a technical standpoint, a receiver? Because even if they suck, they can still play with intentionality. They can still play with urgency. They can still play with good technique. Yeah. And that's what I'm telling you. And we're not seeing that. If we And here's the thing, right? If we were seeing that and it still wasn't good enough, I'd be sitting there saying they need to get better. They got to get better at safety. I mean, I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of Chris O'Leary as a coach. I'm not. But at some point in time, you got to say, I don't know what you can do with DJ Brown other than just, you, you got to put him in some different positions. Cause that's just, that's who he is. He's not good enough. Ramon Henderson's not good enough. You're, you're not winning, you know, championships with a defense built around your safeties if that's your talent of safety. You're just not. Yeah. I love Xavier Watts, but he needs to be, you know, complimented by somebody as good or better. And he's not. Town's got to get better. We've said that. As much as I defend the linebackers, I flat out said they need better players. I've said it multiple times. But you also need to be able to say, Yes, but you get those better players, and you're still going to have the better these problems against better teams. Because when you play Ohio State, you play Georgia, you're going to face guys that are equal to your talent level when you play Georgia. But if they're coached better, you're screwed. You messed up. You messed up. So even up. if they go out and get better, and they will have better players next year because Jaden will be a sophomore, Braylon will be a sophomore, Rico will be a sophomore, Tobias will be a junior, assuming he's yeah. still here. Jaden will be a senior, assuming he's still here. Hopefully Deion Colsey's back and healthy, assuming he's still here. You'll bring in Cam Williams. You'll bring in Micah Gilbert. You'll bring in Logan Saldate. Jordan Faison's now a full-time football player, you know? So you're, you'll be better next year. But if these problems still persist, you're going to see them continue to underachieve in the biggest moments. They'll look great against Miami of Ohio and Northern Illinois, and teams like that. But that's not what you're judged by at Notre Dame. You're, yeah. you're not. And and so that's the issue. And you can get mad at me all you want and say, oh, you're just blaming the players. Well, would you rather me go at the players? I mean, just blaming the coaches. Would you rather me just sit here and attack the players all games? that make you feel better? Because here's the deal. When it's the players, I'll say it. It's the players. They got to get better at safety. They got to get better at linebacker. But it also doesn't mean that when you make a call that does this and you slant right out of a play because they've got you scouted out and they know exactly what's coming, so they run off tackle right at your double-edged blitz because they know when you bring that double-edged blitz, you're going to slant the line inside, so they kick out those two guys and run power, and, yeah. and it's easy to – guess what? That's a coaching thing. Yes. And you knew Jeff Brom would have been scouted. Yeah, especially with Chip Long over there because you knew this Absolutely. is a game he wanted really bad. Absolutely. So, look, to sit here and say Notre Dame needs better players is low-hanging fruit, in my opinion. Yeah. Of course, every team in America, in order to win a championship, needs better players. There are only four or five programs that get the players consistently to win championships. Everybody else is in a search to get better players. Yep. Everybody else has the same task. Same task. So to say Notre Dame doesn't have talent, then I don't know what you saw at home against Ohio State. If you don't feel like Notre Dame doesn't have talent. Yep. I don't – look, the Louisville wide receivers, as dangerous as they are, didn't really do too much Saturday night. I feel like they were neutralized. 
by the defensive backs of Notre Dame. It was the running game of Louisville that really took over. Jack Plummer should have yeah. thrown three interceptions. Notre Dame dropped three interceptions. Yeah. Jack Plummer isn't good. He's not. And they didn't do a good job of pressuring him. And when they got pressure, they allowed him to get outside the pocket, like yeah. on the first touchdown. Yeah. They pressured. You you wish that Benjamin Morrison could have been a little stickier. Sure. On the reroute in the end zone, but he wasn't. Did we blame Mike Mickens for that? Did no. we blame Al Washington for Josh Burnham not bringing that sack? No. We blame no. the players. They didn't make plays. You got to make plays. But, be, you know, to sit up here, play, Sean? yeah, to be up here at this gloom of doom as if Notre Dame is just a roster without talent. Right. To beat Louisville. Louisville. You know, it is. I don't know what else to say. That's why I took time to calm down and not be emotional about the loss. And actually look at what the problems were. Because Saturday night was a program debacle. It wasn't a player debacle. It wasn't a coach debacle. It You saw yes. the entire program on display being in trouble and needing changes. Right. Right? Yes, it's a problem that Maris Leopold wasn't immediately removed from the game. After that penalty, yeah, Sean, we're gonna have a question about that, so don't go too far into that because I, I, I want to get your th no, I want to get your thought because that's a that's something I definitely want to address for that's sure. That's a that's a program accountability issue. Right. I'll just leave it at that. Right. You saw right. the full program on display Saturday night, so all of this, right. you know, this, that, that, this, elevating this over that, no, everything needs to be under the microscope. Everything. Right. That's where we're at. Like yep. your article said, it's a crossroad. Right. It's a crossroad moment. Everything needs to be evaluated. All right. We got some more down here. We got a super chat from Mike Nolan. Mike, thanks. For the super chat, is Sam just not trained to play action? He seems very poor, casual, and run fake. Never seems to hold any defenders. That's how they did it last year too. Like <laughs> they they don't really like they don't really. I mean, he's actually had some decent bootlegs actions, but they just it's just not a part of who they are. A lot of the stuff they're doing with the play fakes, it's like that's just what they're being taught to do. It's very obvious. Um, I don't. I don't quite get that. But, like, look, everybody talks about play action. What was play action going to do on Louisville on Saturday? They couldn't run the football. <laughs> you know, it's like they ran a couple bootlegs and Louisville was all over it. You know, guys weren't getting – you know, guys weren't open. So, again, there's a lot of stuff that's telegraphed from a play calling standpoint, Sean, because they do yeah. so much shift – like so much rotation. It's mm -hmm. like when they put these guys in, this is what they do. When they, You can get away with that early in the year, but you can't get away with yeah. that now. Yeah. You know, it's like it's like in the timing of some of the stuff, like the whole rotating offensive lineman thing. In theory, I don't have a problem with it. If we just take any out any context, I advocated for that during the fall. They should have fall camp. They should have worked Billy Stroud into the rotation. You just don't do that in week seven. Yeah. You know, like yeah. it, that's what you should have been doing at the beginning with a kid of his talent and a kid that in the spring was your was one of your best linemen. And um yeah. But yeah, Mike, it's it's it the the play action stuff is weird. Cuz we we've seen some a little of it and when a couple times they have done it, it's been pretty good. It's gotten guys open. I I don't quite understand why they're not doing it. Like yeah. And here's the thing is like one time on a third and one, you call a bootleg on on that 13 personnel thing where they run that that a a gap and you leave that backside just short and against that look sam hartman just keeps it on a bootleg and just runs for 15 yards before anybody gets to him that's going to make them think twice the next time that they do that i mean yeah that's the frustrating thing about this whole thing sean is that's football 101 stuff i mean and and, and we'll have some more to you know people ask questions about you know can sam audible there and coach freeman said you know he has some stuff you can tell by his answer that Sam Hartman doesn't have a lot of authority to make checks. You can tell by, by Coach Freeman's answer. 
But he says, you know, sometimes we just run and run the football. Well, I'm sorry. There has to be a mechanism built into what you do offensively that when you line up a 13 personnel with three to the left and you're running downhill a gap, I don't care if you are running away from the backside. If you're running downhill a gap, like mm-hmm. straight and not stretch, not power off side where that guy's got to come, but you're just running downhill and you got two guys off the, off the edge, whether it's Sam or the coaches or something, there needs to be some, something built into the mechanism of the offense that says, yeah, you want to run the ball fine. Then here's what you do on that play. You turn and pitch it backside and Jabron Payne jabs. First of all, you put Jeremiah Love in the game on that mm-hmm. situation, you know, but even with Jabron Payne, Jabron's a good athlete. He jabs. They crash, he goes outside, you pitch it, and he's out the gate. That would have had a much better chance of success on Saturday. And then it's like Jabron, and the teaching point that Jabron is, and I know Dylan McCullough get him coached up on it because he is doing a great job, is you run to the sticks. You catch that ball and you run to the sticks. You outrun the defense of the sticks. And you get there. It's on third and one. And that's going to make them think twice. But see, here's the thing, Sean, you should have had that built in because Duke did the exact same thing last week. Yes. Ohio State did the same exact thing the week before. They're seeing those short edges, and they know you're either going to run weak side or you're going to run power right at us. Yes. And so what we're going to do is we're going to crash off that edge, and even if you're running power, we're going to blow those guys up and force the running back to make an early cut. Either way, you got it stopped in that situation. But that's why I say you that one time that you do that little turnaround fake and then pitch it backwards, which we've seen teams do, now make them think twice about it. First time you do like a really hard thing and let Sam bootleg out, okay, they'll think twice about it. What did Ohio State's best defensive lineman recognize? He he got stuck in for two and a half quarters at the most pivotal moment. He saw formation and said, you know what? They've been trying to trap me with this guard pulling out all game. I'm beating him to the point. Because either the running back is going to try to kick me out or going to try to trap me in the guard. And either way, what he did blows up either one of them. Blows up either one of them. You know, in that situation, if you're an OC, you maybe think, we've been doing this all night. Here's the counter to it. Right. Here's the counter to it. You got to think. That's a great point, Sean. They're going to crash. Yes. Because we have been killing with this. They are a good coach, well coached football team. They do have a stud there at number 44. Let's use that to our advantage. Mm -hmm. You know? Like that's the thing is there's no there's no intentionality there's no building on the offense they're just calling this that's a great way to say it, Sean is when I say they're just calling plays just to call plays it's exactly what I'm talking about there's no we're doing this to set this up or great play callers say like Jeff Brom the the touchdown run that kind of broke things open in the second half <clears throat> Jeff Brom said we've been running this all day. We've got an idea of when they line up like this, in this, they're bringing this. So we're going to go right back to this in that situation. And he called it perfectly. That's what that's what the chess match of coaching is. And Notre Dame's offensive staff is not participating in that chess match right now. Mm-hmm. And that's the frustrating thing is they need to. They need to. There's too much experience in that staff at other positions that to, to not have more of a sense of purpose. And one thing I'm curious about, Sean, Somebody asked today, you know, how much more involved can you get Gino Gadulli and Joe Rudolph? And if those guys are involved as much as I've been told they are, sometimes you got to wonder if maybe there's too many cooks in the kitchen and everybody's getting their plays called and the things they like called. Mm-hmm. Like, and and it makes me think of this because I was at a I was on a staff one year and we year before we were really good, won a program record for games. I think it's still the program record. And the next year, the coach was trying to keep everybody happy. So, you know, he 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 had the O-line coach and the running backs coach designing the game plan in one office. And then I'm in mm-hmm. the other room put designing the pass game in my office. And there was no coming to together until we were like, okay, here's what we're doing. And so, like, our run game would be, like, out of 21 personnel. And our pass game to be, like, out of 11 personnel. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what they're doing run game wise. So I can't say, Hey, this is what we should be doing play action wise, or this is what we're, you know, how are we running zone this week? Okay. We're running it out of this. Cool. That's what I needed. Cause I needed to know that to say, well, then this is how we need to put our pass game together. And Hey, if we do this two, three times, this is what this team is going to do. So part of our script is we're going to run this play twice. And then the third time on the script, we're going to come to this and we're going to call a little whoop 
and then quick bootleg, get that sucker out real quick and, and hurt him with it, right? There's not, that's not going on right now. So part of me wonders is like, is there too much? Is there, and that may not be it. I'm just grasping at straws at this point in time, guys, because it's just, it's hard for me to believe that coaches that are at this level are, are just, are, are this, that think this is the way to go. Yeah. Because it's just, it's just not something you're used to seeing. And I, it's, um, I history. think, I truly think that Marcus Freeman believes he had a really good team or has a really good team. Um, you saw how they played against Ohio State. They felt like they were a really good team. But you just can't line up. At some point, you have to recognize you're not at that point as a program where you can line up and just know we're better, so we're going to win. Georgia can do that. And even sometimes an they win still ugly. Right. But I'm saying they that doesn't, I mean, Georgia gets coached. They do. That coaching staff coaches their butts off. But the Georgia lines up knowing every week we're better than you. We're flat out better than you. Notre Dame has leaned on that a little bit too much. Like, oh, all we have to do is execute. Okay, yeah. here it is. Here's the play call. If we execute, we should be fine. If we execute, we should be fine because we're better. Eh, but you're not that good. All right? You were able to get away with it barely against Duke. And you would think that performance would open the eyes of the players and the coaches to say, okay, wait a minute. We, we, we have to change some things because we don't want the same thing to happen. When we go to Louisville, we know we're better and more talented than Louisville, but we're still going to come have to come out and do a really good job as a coaching staff and as players. And they just tried to line up and they got lulled to sleep. You know why? Because they went to halftime and they were tied. And they said, oh, you know what? We'll come out in the second half and our running game will take over. We'll get the running game going. Right. And then they get the turnover, right? Now, this, this, this shows you the mindset. They get the turnover. What formation do they go to? 14 personnel. 14 personnel. In Louisville territory. That's what it, that tells you the mentality. We're going to line up. After banging their heads against the Louisville defense all first half, right? No adjustments to what Ron English was doing. First big opportunity you get in the second half, your mindset is, I mean, you're telling us what your mindset is. Right. We'll come out. We'll come out and, and physically push them over. Despite no evidence of that happening in the first half or last week. At all. Right? Yeah. And it's like, man, look, where is, where is 12? Right. Swing past the 12. Right. Screen past the 12. Anything. Get him involved and stop putting Audric S. You're not helping Audric estimate with these slow developing. No. Are you if telling that's, me that? Because that's all that's they're the, doing with him. Like, that's the right. problem is they've gone. Up, yeah, exactly. I mean, look, I've watched teams purposely, purposely, Brian, put receivers outside the numbers both sides of the field, to be able to run the ball. Mm -hmm. Here, we're going to spread you out so we can run. So we can give our running back some room, some options, and we can give our offensive line better numbers yep. to block against. Right, and that's the whole thing. Some said, well, you know, just you put all your tight – sometimes it's not good to have tight ends on the field because, like you said, there's going to be 11 guys in the box. You only have nine that can block. You know, it's like just – and when they do those things, there's no counters to slow – that's the thing we're talking about earlier. There's nothing to say, hey, when we line up like this, we're going to have this one thing that's going to – we'll occasionally run a play-action pass that's kind of easy to, to see because the, the play-action pass technique, if you watch when they're in those play-action, nobody buys mm -hmm. it because mm -hmm. there's tells in how the offensive line comes off the ball. 
And the whole point of play action, like true play action pass. Now I'm not talking about like, there's a play action pass where teams just do like that little, that little delay fake. Cause that's more for the linebackers. Cause I want to see what the linebackers are going to do. That's not a true play action. That's, that's also where it's, it's a way to kind of get my back into the right spot and to get the block and set up the right way to get certain looks. It's not a true play action. Mm-hmm. It's more of a flash fake. It's, it's almost as much of a timing mechanism as it is anything else, Sean, you know, than a true play action. I'm talking like true play action plays need to look like runs. It's like, do you go back and watch the fourth and one against Ohio state? Ohio state knew that was a pass at the snap of the ball. There was some Mm -hmm. tell that Notre Dame had that Ohio state knew it. And they played it perfectly because it was very obviously a pass play. And and again, you've got to, you've got to know what those tells are and why are teams doing this, but great play callers. And tis, like you and you nailed it earlier, Sean. You anticipate, hey, we've had some success with this. Mm-hmm. Part of it, and, and it's got to happen before people stop it. You know what Ohio State has seen. So what are you going to use to counter and create a big play opportunity? Right? Like, look what Louisville did first drive. First drive of the game with Jack Plummer at quarterback. They know Notre Dame's going to crash hard, hard off the edge. So yes. what do they do? They run a little delay. Let the DNs come up and they pitch it outside of them. Two two times they did that for big plays. That's great scouting and play calling. They didn't run it a whole lot after that because they knew no name's going to adjust. And but we're going to get we're going to steal some yards on this first series. And it didn't matter that Jack Plummer is not mobile. No, it didn't matter because it was schemed perfectly. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. It's they knew Notre Dame's tendencies, and they went at it. And and, and, Notre, and it seems like see Notre Dame that. doesn't put as much work into scouting tendencies, setting things up. They just want to line up. We're better. We're more physical. As I said before, yeah. there is no unit yeah. in Power 5 football that has more pressure for a program to win than Notre Dame's offensive line. Yep. Every time Notre Dame takes the field, if they're going to win, it's the offensive line that has to play in an elite level. No other unit in college football has had that much pressure. No, you're over yes, the last correct. over the last 15 years. Nobody. They have and, a bad and, game, they lose. And they and, and they get the blame. They get yeah. the blame every time Notre Dame loses. Every time. Right? It's not but if you compare Notre Dame, what they put in the NFL how they play for the most part. It's been, go look at other offensive lines. Just go look. Yeah. Go look at other offensive He's lines. Putting up a lot of points in games with offensive lines, not as good as Notre Dame. Because again, it comes to the point in time where it's like, look, man, everybody in the stadium knows what you're doing. I don't care if you have the 2017 offensive line. You know, it's not going to work. They got more people than you got. I mean, it just, that's the thing. And, and look, I'll, I'll say this too, Sean. Part of this has to be a, this has to go to the very top of coach Freeman. It does. And you've said this before you, you made the hires on your offensive staff right now. This is who you wanted, right? Like you made this point, Sean, like when he didn't get Andy Ludwig, there was no, there was no urgency to say, let's go get this guy. Let's go get that guy. It was immediate. Not at all. And, and, and okay, I'm I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. Yeah. Okay, you, you went with Jared Parker, but here's the thing. This is not the, the I don't believe this is the offense that Jared Parker would run if it was completely up to Jared Parker. I don't. I, I, which, I don't. Which is very interesting that when he spoke to the media and he said, you know, we're gonna run the offense that the players have been right. focusing on all off season and all of that, and it's like because it was strange because Tommy was there sure. early in the spring and he didn't leave to Alabama until. So right. the transition was, right. you know, kind of off a little bit later than normal. But other than that. But I'm referring to like this, Sean, RPOs. <clears throat> yeah. I know that's something Jared Parker wants to do. Why don't they do it? Did he does he not want to do it anymore? Did he change his mind? Is that something that is there something that being I, there's just so much oddness with this whole thing? It's like I'm watching teams, even Boston College, they're playing Louisville. What is Louisville doing against Notre Dame, Sean? They're crashing off the edge. Yeah. Well, 
11 personnel, you know, give me some inside runs with 11 out of 11 personnel where I'm running bubble screens on the outside or now screens on the outside where, you know, hey, we get them kind of thinking, hey, what's that guy going to do? If he's going to crash, I'm pulling and I'm throwing. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's stealing yards. And and those things are not happening. And, and you got to ask the question, why? And if it's a Marcus Freeman thing, a Jared Parker thing, a whoever else thing, it needs to get fixed because – those are ways that you can protect your run game. It's just that it's simple. It's like it's almost like if you're not doing it, and we said this when Tom Maurice was the OC. If you're not doing it, you're just you're cheating your team. Yeah, you're cheating your offense. It's just it, it it makes too much sense. Every good offense does it, and you can do it differently. But they just need to have that stuff. They ran an RPO early in the game on the first drive of the game. Went for like 10, 12 yards, and yeah. then we didn't. Once we get off script, we didn't see it again. And then then the only other they showed an RPO look later. And it was like so obvious, like motion him out, Mitchell Evans out, and they fake like a now screen and like come back inside. But even though it was really kind of obvious, if I remember correctly, they got like five or six yards on that play on the run. Yeah. Because it had Louisville thinking for just a second, uh-oh, they're doing this real obvious thing. At, uh, they're running the now screen. Yeah. And then they ran away from it. Like, okay, there was enough little stuff like that. But, Sean, that's got to be the whole game, man. You're always building on every play call – is meant to be effective, but every play call also has something that's going to follow it. And and when you're rotating, like I, I I I this is a serious question. Do you think Notre Dame's receivers spend more time running routes or running on and off the field? I'm serious question. With as much as they rotate, like I, I'm serious. Yo, and, that is that is that's an honest question. That's an honest question. Let me tell you something. This goes to what you're saying and our whole point of being aggressive on offense. The fan base is like, we need more talent. There is no coach in the NFL that does more to scheme his players open than Kyle Shanahan. And he has studs at every position. Kyle Shanahan could let his offensive players line up and just say, go beat your man one-on-one. -on -one. He has elite wide receivers, an elite tight end, an elite fullback, an elite running back. But somehow, some way, he still takes the responsibility as the play caller to scheme them open. Mm -hmm. He says, it's my job to make your job easier and and to make it easier for my hall of fame left tackle to block my hall of fame right guard to block i'm gonna make it easier for you i'm not just gonna say oh you're a hall of famer block michael parsons no i'm gonna motion i'm going to confuse and i'm going to allow you guys to run into space so you can use your talents even better that's play calling. That's coaching. That's your job as a coach. Right. Right? Sean. You don't just send your child to school as a parent and say, oh, teachers, teach my kid. No. Well, too many you parents come, do that, by the way. Too many parents do but that. Yes. You bring your child home. You look at the homework. You reinforce on the weekend. You know what? Read a book. Turn the TV off. Because it starts at home. This is what has to happen, man. We can't just keep saying, oh, the talented wide receiver isn't this. It isn't that. Well, if you know that, help. Against Louisville and Duke, right? Like, this isn't like, okay, they just got beat by Georgia 33-20 and thing happened. You know, they, they, their players aren't good enough. No. Absolutely. It's Duke and Louisville. And, and here's something else, Sean. I was just kind of thinking about this, kind of what we're talking about here. And man, I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. I'm just, I'm just, we'll move on. I'll, I'm going to think about whether or not I want to say it here when we get back. Let's, let's move on to the next question. Logan trailer. Thank you for the super chat. Was at the game Saturday, man. I'm sorry. You had to go through that Logan in person. Agree with the flat warm ups. If guys are tired, play guys like it on. Get the young guys some reps that actually mean something. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. right. This yeah. is this is exactly why you should have done these things throughout the, the first month of the season. And, and at times they were. I mean, 
you know, some of the positions they were getting younger guys in early in the year. I mean, now Washington's been using a deep rotation all year. And and so then when they shorten the rotation against Ohio State and those teams, the, the D linemen aren't wearing out the same way as like the safeties and the linebackers are. You know, and and, and you know, so I'm still still pissed about this. Like when you go play Central Michigan and JD Bertrand can't play. And instead yeah. of playing Drake Bowen and Jaden Osbury, you put Jack Kaiser there. Why? Why? You can't beat Central Michigan with Drake Bowen and Jaden Osbury? Really? Really? If your defense is too complex for Drake Bowen and Jaden Osbury to be able to play and get everybody going against Central Michigan, then then that's all right. Again, so is it a player problem? Do we not have enough talent at linebacker now to get those young guys on the field? Is that the issue? Mm. Or again, is it a coaching thing? It's a coaching thing. And that's the that's I mean, look, Jared Parker's got a red shirt freshman who missed all I'm sorry, not Jared Parker. Um, Dila McCullough has a red shirt freshman who missed all of last year and a true freshman at running back and another red shirt freshman at running back that make up the rotation and the, and the, and they're the ones balling right now. Mm -hmm. Right. The best player Notre Dame had on the field on Saturday was a freshman because he's freshman. got a coach that knows how to get those guys ready to play. Yeah. And, and there were mistakes. I mean, Jabron Payne had a blown assignment. Those things are going to happen. Right. So it's not like, oh, pff, now even Dylan McCullough sucks because of that. Right. Rise. Guys are going to make mistakes. You got coach them up, and get them ready. It was a, it was a mistake, but more often than not, those kids know what they're doing. You're asking Devin Devin Ford to come in and be a lead blocker against Ohio State, and you know what he does? He balls out. Balls, balls out. Balls out. A great job. Right. So so you can see the difference. You can see the difference, and those guys are being coached up by an elite coach. These guys are not, and you can see the difference for all the yeah. issues that we may have with Jared Parker as an OC his position group is playing really well right now, right? You can see who's being coached up and who's not. And, and you've got, you know, and I don't know if I can really give him credit. I mean, that's just, that's who? just, that's just tight ends that know the game. Well, no, what I mean is when you watch them play, they're, 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 they're playing the they're game. Sound, right? They're fundamental. They're well, they're get, they you know how to get them open. again as a freshman right. blocking. Well, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. 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 They're yeah. not just making plays. Cause they're like, you know, jumping over dudes. And I mean, there is some of that. Mitchell Evans has made some great plays, but like um, it, it's, you're watching them play the game and they're playing the game the right way for the mm -hmm. most part. That's what I'm referring to, Sean. Like you could just mm -hmm. say, oh, Dylan McCall's not that good of a coach, man. Who, who can't coach Jeremiah Love? Well, a lot of people. No name has had some of those guys, right? I mean, th there still comes a point in time where like you're asking your backs to do a lot and they're doing it. Why? It's amazing. That the, well. It's amazing that the old line seems to do a great job when Jeremiah Love's in the backfield. Like Jeremiah loves in the backfield. This is a 7.5 yard per yard offensive line. Amazing. Amazing. But 13, 14 personnel yeah. with all you estimate, all of a sudden we're a 2.7 yeah. yards per carry yeah. offensive line. It's like. Right. right. Yo. And then Aldrich is more than what you're allowing him to do. He's a better, he has better feet than what you're allowing him to do. He's a better athlete than what you're allowing him to do. He just is. You know, and that's that's just the frustrating part. Because I can live with um Brian. Nobody had to tell me that this wide receiver corp is going to struggle against good defenses playing man to man. You know, because I knew we didn't have speed. We have maybe one true speed guy. I knew that was going to be how Duke, Ohio State, and Louisville were going to play us. I knew that before and the NC season. State. Right. Yes, I knew that before the season. I didn't have to see film. I didn't have to watch them against Navy. I we, knew that was we talked coming. about it, Sean. Yeah, they're going to make you beat them with the receivers. Yes. So you got to figure out a way to do it. Let's go to this next, Sean. That's a segue to this next question. I think we can bring up this next super chat and we'll dive into to that part of it too. I'm sorry, Kirk D.A. Anderson Fitness. What can be done about our outside wide receivers not getting open and our rush defense, our average yard per rush given up has worsened each game from game one. 
Well, defensively, the last two weeks, Sean, it's very clear. It's the big mm-hmm. plays. Yeah, they have had they have had a lot of really good snaps in the run game the last two weeks. Mm-hmm. But both Duke and Louisville had two or three big plays mm-hmm. that got a chunk. I mean, Louisville, if you take their top three runs, that's over 100 yards. Like over half their yards were on like three carries. That that's that's the pro- missed tackles, bad fits. It's like clean up those. Go ahead. And and both coordinators stayed it for the second half. Duke got Louisville the running. Duke got Duke. the running game yeah. going late in the sec- late late in the game. And Jeff Brown told ABC coming out of the locker room, "Yeah, we're going to commit to the running game. We're going to get the running game going here yeah. in the second half." It was I think they also like made was- good adjustments at halftime and said, "Hey, yeah. look, this is the wrinkles." Like Notre Dame has a philo- basic philosophy on defense, but they don't run the same exact things week after week. So in the first half, you're trying to figure, okay, how are they going to attack us with this philosophy, this game? And then when you figure it out, then you got stuff to go to. And that's what that's what Duke did a good job with that. Yeah. And and Louisville did a good job with that as well on yeah. how to get guys going. And you know, so so Kirk, to your to your point, because I don't want to just be a show that just constantly complains and we don't offer solutions. Here's things that you do. Sean, Sean and Sean talked about some of them earlier. There's different things you do formation wise right? Where you stack guys, you use more motion. Here's another thing that works really well. Tempo, go tempo and, and do different things that way. Uh, be willing to do, to do things where say, look, we just, we're, we're we've got this one guy here that is a really good player and Mitchell Evans. And so we're going to do some things where it's not always just getting him the ball. We're going to use him as a decoy or we're going to use him from an alignment standpoint to, to present a matchup. So you want to go two tight ends in the field and you want to line up out, you know, <clears throat> with four wide that way. I like that. They're doing that stuff, but here's a thought, put your tight ends on the outside, put your, your, your receivers on the inside and do different things that way. So th- just yeah. from a sheer motion, pre-snap motion, alignment type, those are things that you can do. Here's other things you could do from a coaching standpoint to help them get open. Number one, you've got to allow them to – you've got to not allow them, I should say, you've got to teach them m- more nuanced press release moves. And when you're when your freshmen and your juniors are doing the same exact things, trying to get off the line, I mean, look, Jaden Gray, Jaden Thomas is not an outside receiver. We've said that. We pointed this out all last year. So, look, you know, we'll see if he can be better here as a junior. They think he's going to be there. We always kind of felt he's more of a slot guy. Yeah. But – He's still a junior and he's still a, a smart kid and he's still a good foot talented football player in, in certain areas. So it's kind of like, okay, why is he using these same exact release moves all the time? Yeah. It's just a stutter release outside. It, it is the most lame thing. There's no like double moves. There's no hard lean them out, trying to get him think slant and then yeah. jab it inside. He bites and then you get outside. It's like, well, you know, it takes to, when you're running a go route, there is no timing. It's win. Yeah. It's win. And then the quarterback gets to his drop. You read and evaluate the release and where he is on the release and then throw the football. But you've got to win versus single high. Got to win. Now, there are certain looks where you're going to line up and say, okay, we're running this route. And against this look, dude, you're not an option. You're a clear out. Then Mm -hmm. at that point, then just go. Do a little release and then just go. That's fine. But when it's, hey, we're coming with you, you've got to win. And over and over and over again, we're seeing the same exact moves. Guys, this isn't new. I didn't – like you know what I hate, Sean? I hate when people say, but this has been great, 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 and then you struggle, and then you start complaining retroactively about it. I was complaining about the release moves when they were 4-0 and scoring 46 points a game. It's like we talked about Jaden Thomas against NC State. You know, they're, they're doing this thing where they're kind of going like this, and they're just letting them get into yeah. their ribs. It's yeah. the same release move every time. They're getting ridden outside. We've been talking about this all year. Yeah. All year. We talked about it in fall camp. They're not utilizing effective press release moves. Say, well, you know, DBs were getting after the receivers in fall camp. Yeah, and they're still doing the same crap that wasn't working in fall camp now. <laughs> Whose fault is that? Are, you're telling me the scholarship players in their name aren't good enough to use a, a greater variety of press release moves that I know for – I've had Division three players use? One double A guys use that I watch other teams use week after week that I know don't have the size or talent that Notre Dame guys have. Yeah. I mean, the Stoops kid is better than Notre Dame's receivers. Really? Really? That's what I'm he's supposed techni- to believe. He's a, he's a technician. Exactly. Let me tell you something. Exactly. Let me tell you something. DeAndre Hopkins 
and Keenan Allen will be 45 years old in the NFL, still producing because they're technicians. The flow, two of the yes. slowest receivers you will ever see on the football field every Sunday. And they continue to produce. Why? They're technicians. They know how to release. They know how to run routes. They know how to get open. You know why Travis Kelsey? Yeah, he has Patrick Mahomes. Watch his releases. His releases are never the same. Travis Kelsey will come off the line of scrimmage literally walking certain times, just walking. And then all of a sudden, will release into his route. And most of the time, it's option routes because it's just about him and Patrick Mahomes knowing each other. And it's like, man, there is no variety. I think Devontae Adams says he has over 150 releases as a wide receiver. That's the uh, one. I'm just asking for Notre Dame kids to have five. That's five. He has 150 yes. that he can go to based upon, right. and it's all based upon just the defender. Give me five. The defender right. and how he lines up. How are you playing me? Yeah. That's going to dictate yeah. what I'm going to do to you. Here's some other things that they need to do. Number one is they're 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 not really a, a great unit when it comes to, and I think Chancey Stuckey knows all this. Chancey Stuckey played in the NFL for a while. He knows this stuff. There's just a disconnect between him being able to teach it right now for some reason, right? But you know, like little things. Here's a perfect example, Sean, of just the nuances that this group just doesn't have that they should have. And and again, Tobias Merriweather is a sophomore in college. He should know this. Yeah. He needs to be taught this, but here, here's something we see the Notre Dame receivers do a lot. I'm an outside receiver and the corner's playing me inside. So if he's playing me with inside leverage, what's he trying to take away? My inside. Yeah. So what I've got to do is I've got to try to negate that leverage. So what you teach is you get up and you get in and up on him to where you kind of are running at him vertically to where mm -hmm. now if I do some kind of move, he's got to protect so he's taking the inside away with the left with his leverage, and then he's going to play the outside. But once I get up on him, then he now has to. I still now have my two way go. And so what Notre Dame guys was, was doing is they were releasing on the outside, and they would do a quick jab and and then run to the post, a quick and 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 run right into the guy. See, I've seen this multiple times from Notre Dame. That's that's yeah. that's poor technique from multiple players, right? Um, we see the slot receivers when they run in cuts do a real choppy one, two, three in, and they're just getting jumped, right? Like that, they're all doing it. That means they got to be being taught that. If they're all doing it, they're being taught that. You yeah. need to see more in cuts that are sharper, Yeah. right? Where I'm selling that inside seam and I'm boom, I'm snapping it off underneath. That's where the separation comes from. But when, when you do one, two, three inside, that's getting covered up. Now yeah. that's great versus zone. Right, because one, two, three, you time it up, you get inside, you're okay, right? But against man, you've got to be, you got to be sharp. It's got to be, I'm selling, I'm selling, and then snap that sucker off and get inside, and yeah. then get that step of separation. You know, and, and to your point, Sean, there's dudes that ran four sixes at the combine <laughs> that are great at getting separation in the National Football League. Why? Because yeah. they're technicians. And I'm not asking Chris Tyree to be Cooper Cup. No. Or Tobias Merriweather to be Devontae Adams. But they're the basics that we see other teams do that they're just not doing. And there's there's more that this staff needs to do in regard to, okay, you're not great at this. Okay, so then what? Are, so we're just supposed to say, oh, well, our guys aren't good enough, so let's just chalk it up and another bad season. Let's Because now we're getting into the whole, let's wait till next year when Cam Williams is here. Oh, okay. But <laughs> as good as Cam Williams is, if he's not being taught some of these basic press moves, it yeah. may look great against Northern Illinois and Purdue and 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 Miami of Ohio and those teams, Stanford. But what about when they got to play those DBs at Texas A and M, Scott? Yeah. Or 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 you know they get into the postseason and all that other kind of stuff. You know um, what else, Brian? Sean McVay doesn't ask Cooper Cup to go line up out wide and run a, a streak route. Yeah. Just run by the DB. He doesn't ask right. him to do that. You know why? Right. He runs a four six. Right. That's a, that's and if he is strength. doing that, it's to get somebody else open. Absolutely. Right. But right. he can put him in a slot and ask him to run a fade to space. Right. Because he knows he's going to get a great release, get on top of his guy. 
you look, this is coaching. Like this is the this is the challenge of coaching. This is the challenge put before this Notre Dame coaching staff for the rest of the schedule. How do we put our young men in the best position on both sides of the ball right. to make plays? That's the challenge. That's the challenge. That and that within itself is part of execution. That's coaching execution. How do we execute the game plan to put our players in the best position? That that's the challenge put before everybody in this program right now. It is this is as crazy as it sounds. Las Vegas thinks this is this is a winnable game for Notre Dame. Notre Dame's favorite. I believe this is still a winnable game for Notre oh, Dame. Oh yes. I these watched are, the game John, these against things are all Arizona. These, all this stuff can be corrected in the, in in oh, season. Absolutely. That's the thing, Sean. This is not well. You know, we are who we are. Let's wait till the off season and fix mm-hmm. it. This is all stuff that you you put some of it in now. Mm-hmm. Some of these things you put in now for USC, and then you really hammer it in a bye week, and then build on it. Mm-hmm. That's the thing. It can be fixed, and 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 I'm hoping Coach Stuckey can be that guy. He's still learning. This is the this is the problem. It's like. It's no problem that Chancey Stuckey is an inexperienced coach in and of itself. It's no problem that Jared Parker doesn't have a lot of in-game play calling experience in and of itself. It's no problem that Marcus Freeman's an inexperienced coach in and of itself. The problem is when you put all these things together, that that's where, you know, you, you need, you need to have some sort of mechanism that says, Hey, look, this is why we said, what did we say that there's the one hire that Notre Dame should have made this off season. What's the one hire that they have to make right now. They have to make, Hire David Cutcliffe as an offensive analyst. Pay him a yep. million dollars. Yeah. Why? Because he can help you with some of this stuff. He can help. Yeah. Right. And uh, so it's all fixable. That's the good. That's the encouraging thing. It's all fixable. Mm-hmm. Now it just needs to be fixed. Because here's the thing, Sean. As pissed off as we are right now, you go out and win this ball game on Saturday night against USC. Going to the bye week, getting ready for one and five pit, and all of a sudden, yeah, the season's not going to be what it should have been. It, it isn't. Mm-hmm. It isn't. But all of a sudden, you can you can get some momentum back, and you can go, you know, then you can go beat, you know, Clemson. Because you just think about Clemson. Clemson's offense is as bad as Notre Dame's is right now. Very, maybe true. worse. Very true. Right. So you, if you can get, if you can do what you need to do to win this game, push the right mm-hmm. buttons to win this game, you know, yeah, maybe you can go on a roll and beat ten and two, and all of a sudden say, hey, yeah, okay, it, it wasn't what it was. But you know what? This team got back on track. They pushed the right buttons. You know, this, this, and this. They improved here. This guy did this. And now you go into next season and you go into a New Year's Six game. You're like, okay, now let's see what we can do. There won't be any excuses in a New Year's Six game about how tired they are or anything like that. It'll be a big game and you can get a chance to go get that signature win. And all of a sudden we're feeling good about ourselves, right? Because the team that existed three weeks ago hasn't disappeared. It's just they're not doing the things to get all of that out of this team. They they could just out talent those first four opponents. Yeah. Even NC State, they just out talented NC State. They did some really good things in the run game, but they're they've just they've lost their way. We've seen this before. It happens yeah. to good teams sometimes. The yeah. question now is, what do you do about it? And that that again, Sean, is what the point of the article was. It wasn't. I'm I'm not crushed like some guy on Twitter's. What are you talking about? It's the second year. I'm like, yeah, it's kind of what I wrote about in the article. It's yeah. not going to be defined by what happened. It's going to be defined by what you do next. Yeah. That's that's what this journey is about. Right? Frank Leahy, Eric Parsegian, Dan Devine, Lou Holtz, they all had those year two struggles and built on it and had those bad losses. Like I think one of the coaches, I think it might have been Coach Parsegian or Coach Devine. It might have been Coach Devine. They lost to like a four and six team, like in year two, like four and six team. Yeah. Right. That's not what Notre Dame lost to on Saturday or three weeks ago against Ohio State. So you've got to be able to bounce back. But the point here, the Kirk's question, Sean, is you've got to be able to identify those things, and say, hey, fix it. And fixing it is sometimes putting a different player in the game. But putting a different player in the game and then asking that guy to do the same exact stuff that the other guy did, and he's not being given the resources to do better at it, is not fixing anything. It's yeah. blaming. It's blaming this guy. For your mistakes. That's my problem. You just said something that triggered uh, something I thought was amazing. I was watching uh, Sark is one of the best play callers. And it's not because of the play. 
it's his feel for how to counter what he knows you're looking for. They get down the goal line in the red zone. He takes, I forget, number zero, his All-American tight end. He takes his pass catching tight end out and puts his blocking tight end in the same formation. But because Oklahoma sees that it's the run blocking tight end, they, the safeties, bite on the run. And he free releases and runs the corner route. And the safeties just let him go. Why? Because they saw the pass catching tight end go out. It's the same formation that they would have paid attention to the tight end. He changed. He knew that he would affect the safeties by simply putting his run blocking tight end in the same formation and got a cheap touchdown. It's just small things like that. It's just, as a play caller, small things like that, anticipating and knowing what your defender and what your defensive coordinator wants to do and what they, their keys are. And you can get, like you said, Brom got cheap yards in the first half off knowing the tendencies of Notre Dame. Just cheap yards. And didn't go back to it. With didn't go clump. back to it. Didn't no, overuse did it. No. Just said, we're, we're going to steal it. And then once we get that first drive, if it works, we're going to, you know, we, we, yeah. And I was sitting there like, oh, Sark, that was amazing. It wasn't a play call. It was the nuance of when to use it, pulling. As soon as the All-American tight end runs to the sideline, the safety's immediately like, okay, this has to be a run. We're keying in run because this guy, he doesn't, they don't throw to him. And it's, yo, yeah. that, we could talk about this all day. As far as there are plenty of ways to get these wide receivers yeah. open. Plenty yep. of, Even plenty if of you work. accept the premise that they're not talented. Even if you accept that premise. And matter mm -hmm. of fact, if you accept that premise, it's even more reason to do the stuff we're talking about. Even more yeah. reason to do that. We're not going to ask them to go win one-on-ones because they're not good enough to do that. Okay, so then what do you do? Yeah. How do you get there? And that's the things they got to do. You go fourth and 11 and you got Audrey yeah. me out wide. Why? Yeah. Why? That makes no sense. If you're going to have him on the field, if you want to have a running back out there and empty, put Jeremiah Love in, put Jadarian Price in, Jadarian yeah. Price in, put one of those guys yeah. that are, if you're, if you're going to have Aldrick out, have him pass block. Like there's just things like that where you're just like, what are you, what are you doing there? Because it, it wasn't set up to use him as a decoy to your point, Sean, where it's like, yeah. well, they're not, they're not going to cover Aldrick. So, yeah, you know, you run some clear off and then Aldrick comes and runs and, and in your out. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it wasn't like that. It's just, what's he doing? He's just taking up space. Yeah. You know, and it's like after a timeout, that's what you came up with. Yeah. So there's plenty of things they could do. And if you accept the premise that the players aren't good enough, and again, I don't accept that premise, yeah. then it's even more reason to say we've got to really, if it, here's the deal if your players aren't super talented, it's a thousand percent more incentive to make sure they are the most technically proficient players you have. Yeah. Have to be. Have to be. Robert Hainsey didn't have nearly the talent that that Ronnie Stanley had. Yeah. Why was Robert Hainsey so good? He was incredibly Technician. technically proficient. And he was tough, right? Mm -hmm. I don't care how tough you are, you've got to be technically proficient to be that kind of a player. Yeah. Have to be. Have to be. And so, yeah, it, again – if you if you're gonna say that well they need better players okay cool I get that all right let's let's accept that premise that's even more it's even worse that they're not great route runners from a technical standpoint it's even worse so you're not even then making the point that you think that you're making it's it's an even worse coaching malpractice if the players aren't good enough and they're asking them to do this stuff you know just run by guys on the outside with no release moves well maybe it's that player it's but it's across the board. And release moves, if I'm not mistaken, Brian, you coach the position, is so nuanced. That's why you'll see the great ones measure, oh, let me take a step in, half a step in. If I'm trying to get outside, let me give myself a little bit more room. Or let me come out a little bit wider. Or let, it's and about it's all the setup. The DB too. He, if he's doing this, yes. why? Yes. If he's doing that, why? How can I, how can I, how can I stress him? Yes. 
right? If he's inside of me and I just do an outside release, I'm not stressing him. But as soon as I get up even Steven with him and I get my two-way go back, right, which he's trying to take away with his leverage, then I can win that. But you watch the Notre Dame guys. They don't really have a – they don't seem to have sort of an understanding of that, Yeah. right? And if your players aren't elite talents and if we were to grant that, then it's even more – it's even worse yeah. that they're not doing these things. Yeah. And and so that's that's where it comes from. So that's where my frustration comes from from this. And it's 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 because here's the thing, Sean. What I don't want to do and what we don't do here is like you mentioned earlier, the low hanging fruit. It's easy to just blame coaches. It's easy to yeah. just blame players. But there's a reason why I'm being. There was a reason why I was critical of Dell, and I pointed it out consistently. And I'm and there's a reason why I'm critical right now of Chancey Stuckey, and I'm telling you exactly why. So in the reason, so you can go watch it. You can go watch it now, and you can look at it and say, "Nah, he's full of crap." They're doing all that stuff, and prove me wrong. And, and if and if I'm wrong, I'll admit that I'm wrong. But it's like you've you're not seeing those things, and watch other teams. And I'm not talking about watching teams that have like don't watch Missouri. You're you're not going to learn Luther Burden's better than talent wise. Anybody Notre Dame has, so mm-hmm. you'll say, "Well, man, look at Luther Burden's doing, like uh, talent wise," but. Your point about how they, how they, even a guy like Luther Bird, and they said he, he's more effective here. Mm-hmm. And so we got to do it there. Jaden Thomas, throughout his career, has just been a much more effective inside player. Yes. So yes. you may say, hey, look, we can't have him and Great House and Tyree and Jordan Faze on all being slots. All right, cool. But here's a thought How about at times during games, out of your 11 personnel, you put Mitchell Evans out in the boundary? And get Jaden Thomas in a matchup in the slot, yeah, and let him go to work. What about that? What about you use him on different things where where, where you're you're using on different route concepts, or you're moving him around, or so? There's just a lot of things they should do. And when they start doing that, and it's still not good enough, then I'll say it's the players. I'll, I'll say that it's the players, yeah. and maybe that's just my coaching mentality. But when 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 I was taught this at the beginning, I got into coaching. When a kid on your team is making a mistake, he's the problem, and it's up to you to fix it, right? That's what I was taught. So this guy's not doing right. Your job is to fix it, get him right. When it's the whole group, you're the problem, and I'm going to fix it as the head coach, yeah. right? That's that's the difference. All right, let's 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 go to the next Super Chat, Sean, because we got a ton of questions, and we're not <laughs> – got to get to Man, somebody. thank you for the Super Chat, Rob. Basics, where did they go? Don't care about the game plan if the basics are not there. Might need a basics boot camp one week in order to move forward. It's a good point, Rob. I mean, it's the false starts. It's the hands to the face. It's <laughs> taking away a 30-yard gain. It's just – he's right. I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff that you and I just talked about from a technical standpoint, but, but some of the things that hurt Notre Dame on Saturday were just – watch the ball. Why are you false yeah. starting on third and one? Right. Yeah. Like, you know, why are you putting hands? You're an offensive lineman. You know, you can't get your hands in the face of a guy. You know that that's football one on one. Right. I mean, yeah, he, he's not wrong. He's not wrong. And that's where it comes to point, Sean, is there's much a bigger problem here than just Jared Parker or just Chancey Stuckey or just Al Golden or whoever else position coach you want to blame. There's those are things that we'll address. But there's something else here about this team was just not ready to play the last two weeks. And, and it's and it's not just Marcus Freeman. Yes, he's yeah. the head coach. It's, it, it, but at the same time, it's also, what's the leadership doing right now? What's the leadership doing to say, hey, guys, what we did on Saturday is not acceptable. I don't want to hear midterms being an excuse. I don't want to hear we're tired being an excuse. Yeah. Uh, guys, yes, we are tired. So does that mean we should just call up USC and say, hey, guys, we're tired. So we'll just go ahead and give you that W. We're going to rest up, and we're going to try to salvage the rest of the season because we're just too tired. We need a couple weeks off. Or you say, yeah. hey, you know, dig deep. You're at Notre Dame. You represent something. Dig deep. Because, guys, we get through this win, we'll be able to recover next week. We get to buy yeah. next week. We got to leave it all out on the field this weekend. Right? That That's a player thing, Sean. That's not a Mar- – if, if Marcus Freeman needs to be the person to get that message across, then you have a much bigger problem with your football team. Yeah. You have a lack of leadership and accountability. Because I'll say this. There's accountability that needs to be done at the head coaching position – or the pos- coaching position I had – all the coach position, and we'll get into that when that question comes up. But there's also a level of accountability, a level of accountability needs to happen in the locker room. And in the last two weeks, we haven't really seen that. Yeah. For, for and I don't want to say why, because I don't know why. We're not there. I haven't gotten enough intel back to, to kind of hear why. But the fact is, is that 
when a team comes out flat like they did on Saturday, that's partly on the coaches. Yeah. That's also partly on your really veteran football team with a sixth year quarterback, with yeah. a junior running back, with a three fifth year seniors, a linebacker, a fifth yeah. year corner who actually played really well on Saturday, by the way. I'm just listing all the veterans, right? Mm-hmm. Fifth year tackle, senior D tackle, sixth year D end, senior defensive end, sixth year senior starter at safety, another senior starter at safety, another senior backup at safety, right? When you're that veteran, it's up to you to say, hey, guys, we're, we're, we got something to do, prove here this weekend. Yeah. Whatever the game plan is, we're going to come up and, and give you everything we got. And, and then we can address if there's issues over there. But yeah. that, that, I can only blame the coaching staff so much. It's like, where's your, where's your, you're playing a night game on the road against a top 25 opponent, right? Yeah. I mean, maybe they had, I don't know, I was getting ready to make a joke about the contact buzz maybe they had because, like, literally, <laughs> The entire it's felt like the entire state. I've never smelt more the smell of weed than I ever have than being in that stadium on Saturday. It was absurd. They it was nuts. But I'm 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 trying to be flippant there because I'm tr- trying not to get too fired up, Sean. But at some point in time, the players do have to look in the mirror and say, "Hey guys, we we shouldn't need Marcus Freeman to because we've said that if you need the head coach to give you a rah rah speech, get ready to play a game, you're yeah. not ready to play a game. That's on you." That's on you. I'm sorry. That's on you. Because like everybody talks about the save Jimmy Johnson's thing for me. That's what sent that team was ready to play over the edge. But they were already like ready. It's not like they were like, gee, I don't know, guys. Yeah. I, don't know if, I mean, there's a reason they got in a fight in the in the in the in, in the, the, in the before tongue. that. Because yeah. they were ready. That's what sent them over the edge. It wasn't like they were uncertain and they weren't fired up. And then he says, save Jimmy Johnson's, you know what for me. And that got him ready to play. No, that was like yeah. <laughs> you're in trouble now, you know. Hey, it, see, it, Notre Dame, bro, Notre Dame needs my mom. See, when we, anybody, maybe you can really go on family vacation, right? And when you get to the destination, the reservation is wrong. They can't find the reservation. And everybody in the family, right? Because you've been up early. The babies have been crying on the plane. Everybody's frustrated. They're hungry. That's everybody else in the family. My mom is right there at the front desk, dude, focused. No, explain this to me. Here are my reservations right here. Explain to me how, let's, let's figure this out. Let's figure this out. Okay, you can't, you don't know what's going on? Where's your manager? I need to speak to your manager. Oh, manager, you still, oh, who else can I talk to? She will stay there an hour. And finally, and it's happened multiple times, finally everybody gets to their rooms and they're discounted with an apology and extra coupons to go to restaurants and to get into Disney or whatever. She is that person for our family in the midst of chaos when everybody else is all frazzled. She's the one that says, Hey, why you guys acting crazy? We're going to, we're going to take care of this and figure it out. Right. And the leadership of this team has to do that. Like, okay, that's cool. All you guys in emotion, and it's it's very possible that Notre Dame tried to react off an emotional situation with Ohio State. They tried to react emotionally to get themselves out of that doldrum. They tried to go from one end of the spectrum to the other. What they need right now is they need to be as even keel as you can be. And someone said it. Yeah, get back to basics. Hey, that's cool. We don't have to get super hyped to get back to being us. We don't have to get super rah, rah, rah to get back to being us. This is who we are. We're going to run this play over and over again until we get it right. We're going to do this in anticipation of our next opponent all over and over again until we get it right. And we're going to come out of the tunnel on Saturday as us not because we got hyped and super emotional no because of our preparation because we put in the work we put in the work we're notre dame we're walking on this field as notre dame and it's going to be it's going to be good for them to get back in home settings i think the energy they're going to get from being back at home is needed they're going to need the notre dame fan base on saturday 
that right there. I know y'all are pissed. As upset, as, upset as you all are. I know it's, it. It's going to be mean a lot to this team that's yep. been on the road for two tough games. Yep. They need you more now. Bingo. Than any other time this Don't season. Don't the first time there's an incomplete pass. No. No, boot, like if the, if and things don't go well on Saturday, then we'll have a lot of stuff to say. Yeah, if things take a bad turn in that game, yeah. I understand it. But this team, if you're going to be there on Saturday and don't sell your tickets because you're pissed off, still support this football team because Sean, that's a great point. They're going to need that energy on Saturday. Yes, because y'all may not think players care about that. They do. They absolutely they notice that stuff. They notice when there's a lot of red in the stadium. They notice those type of things. You mean, oh, they shouldn't notice that. They do because they're yeah. kids, right? And 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 they're out there playing for everything that Notre Dame stands for, including you and us. Yeah. Right. So yes, be out there and support them on Saturday. There's no Look, doubt. We let can me talk about during the week about they got to do better than this. They got to do that. No, Look. that's all fine. But when you get out there on Saturday, yes, be loud for those players. You no will doubt. see. Notre Dame receivers running open on Saturday. <laughs> if they're not, you and may I'm not a bad me, man. Yes, you may see me have a different. I may, I may have a yeah. If Notre yeah. Dame receivers aren't running wide open on Saturday, then we have some serious issues. Yes, I, I'm, and I'm not a betting man, but I'm pretty sure Notre Dame receivers will have room to run on Saturday. They will have better. room to run. And Notre Dame running backs will have room to run on Saturday. Yep. So if we're still like at 14, 17 points offensively Saturday, yeah, you're right, Brian. It's a whole that's a whole nother show. Yep. <laughs> that's gonna be uh yeah. All right. Next super chat. Tyler, thank you for the super chat. What is going on on third down with the offense for the past two weeks? A couple things. Uh, execution has not always been good when there has been stuff there. Uh, number two, I just, again, Sean, I think it, it kind of boils down to a bigger problem. There, There's like, say what you want about Tommy Reese. He normally had really good third down offenses because they had a plan. They had a third down, they had third down stuff where they would only run this stuff on third down. And there was a there was a plan. They would a lot of times move guys. They'd get guys in motion. They'd get it, especially when they had Avery Davis. They'd like always put him moving and get him yeah. isolated in some kind of one on one, and he just would win. And and that's part of it too. Is part of the thing on third down, and this is where it is a player thing. You got to have guys that want the ball. And right now, other than Mitchell Evans, is there anybody at Notre Dame at receiver? And again, this is where I'm. This is this is a player thing. Is there anybody at Notre Dame right now that just screams, I really want the ball that catches the football outside of Mitchell Evans? Is there anybody doing that right now? No. Now, there's yeah. maybe reasons for it, but at some point in time, you got to be like, hey, I want this ball. You knew in 2020 on third down, number three was like, Ian, look look, look here. Third down, yep. my number's three. This is yep. my down. Get me yep. the rock. And he's good. It was good there. Uh, so, so the plan isn't, isn't where it needs to be. Uh, that's part of it, but the execution in those downs also needs to be higher. So it's a combination of those two things. In my opinion, like the third and one, that play had no chance of going that, that yeah. I, there was no, there was no miss block. There was one miss block, but it wouldn't have mattered if the backside, if you know, but the point is like you had no, that play had no chance of success. Yeah. Cause even if you blocked everybody, there was two guys screaming off the edge that weren't accounted for. In the blocking scheme, just no no chance, yeah. no chance. So that's that's not a player problem. That's 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 a coaching problem, right? Like, I didn't love the third and two call. I understand why they did it. Coach Freeman explained it today, and and they're trying to do that little trick play. But they were crashing you hard off the edge on third down. Yeah, you you got to have enough. Hey, look, we we practice this, but right now in this circumstance situation in the game. It it's not that's we need to maybe go to that on first and ten, but on third and short, they're coming hard off the edge. It's gonna this is a play that requires timing, and they're gonna blow this up. That that's that situational awareness that you need to have as a coach. Where sometimes you practice something and you're like, guys, we can't go to that because they're, they're we thought they were gonna play this coverage on third down, but they're actually playing this coverage on third down. So we need to actually go here. Yeah, and um, you know, if they'd have done that like on the first drive on third down, I'd have been like, okay, I get it. You didn't quite know yet that they were crashing. Hey, props to Louisville for, 
for adjusting and having a different third down plan than they'd seen on film. That sometimes that's just what it is, Sean. It's like, hey man, it's a great call. Yeah. And they did some of that on Saturday. Yeah. There was some of that on Saturday from Louisville. But you also have to be able to say, yeah, we know that they're going to do that. And that's why on the first third and one, we ran a naked. No, no receivers running routes. Nobody, it's a naked because we know what they're going to do. And like you said, tempo. Tempo is so important, right? Uh, I think styles make fights. If Texas and Oklahoma play three times, Texas would win the series, in my opinion. Texas is the better team, in my opinion. What Oklahoma did schematically on both sides of the ball is they knew where they could take advantage of Texas. They didn't try to run up the middle against those two 340-pound defense tackles, but they got to that perimeter in the run game. And you, that is what you have to do. You just can't sit there and say, well, they got two big guys, first-round NFL picks, and so we're just not going to run the ball. No. There is a way. Figure out a way to run the ball. And their tempo was the answer. Their tempo was the answer. Those guys get tired. Well, we're going to get these big guys tired. We're going to make them chase to the sideline, chase to the sideline, and eventually late in the game, we might be able to get some leverage up the middle on a couple of power plays or things. Or if we can run a quarterback trap and take advantage of that. Right. Notre Dame, in that position, man, rush to the line of scrimmage. You got a six-year quarterback. A six-year quarterback, if he can't run tempo, look and decide, hey, there's nobody in this gap to my right or to my left, quarterback sneak. It's starting half a yard. Why, why are we waiting for the heavy package to come in when we can rush to the line of scrimmage? It's third and less than one. Hey. And on the play that got the false start, I'm sitting there saying, just sneak it. Just sneak it. There's no one to your right in the gap. There's no one to your left. They're not even playing the quarterback sneak. And you're sitting there, and eventually it turns into a, a penalty. We have, to, we have to give ourselves an advantage, right? Because if you're going to run the same plays over and over again, at least tempo will tire the defense out and put right. them at a disadvantage. Right. But when you're being, method- yeah, you're being methodical and running the same stuff over, what are, you, what are we really doing? So, um, yeah, put your players in better positions to be more efficient on third down. Bring somebody, have somebody run in motion and just run it out to the flat. It, it's simple. They can't get open. They don't. Okay, run across the formation, run out to the flat two yards, roll out, hit them right there. Simple stuff like that. Sean, I want to bring something up because there's a point that's being made that's pushing back on a narrative that we've seen um, from people making excuses for for what we saw Saturday. This is a a great comment from USMA87. He says, I don't buy the argument by by some that Notre Dame is everyone's Super Bowl. Guess what? Championship teams will win every game in that situation. Notre Dame is not a championship team right now. Th- that's something that frustrates me too. It's just that it, it's every it's you're telling me that Ohio State's not everybody's biggest game. Oh, they're telling me right now when Georgia like you're telling me last year Georgia wasn't everybody's biggest game. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, like mm-hmm. no, I, I you're telling Notre Dame's the only Michigan's back to back. Big Ten champs. You're telling me that, that that's that's not Minnesota's biggest game of the year on Saturday mm-hmm. was playing them. You're telling me it wasn't Nebraska's biggest game on Saturday was playing or two weeks ago was playing was playing Michigan, right? Like, it, look, guys, there we we can sit here and say, hey, listen, no, Notre Dame's not where they need to be. They're this, they're that, the other thing. But it's like people talking about like, well, what if what if Louisville's this year's TCU? Then you're going to look back at this game and say, how did you not? You, you had a chance to be that. That should have been you. Yeah. Right, like I just sometimes it's okay to say, "Hey, it's not good enough." Yeah, it's not good enough. So let's get better. 
right? Like it, it's all, we're also not saying, oh, they're screwed. The say season is over. All this other nonsense. We're not saying that either. But at some point in time, you've got to be willing to say, hey, guys, this isn't this isn't OK. Like, yeah, they're tired. I'm, I'm sure they're tired. They've played six, six straight games. But I, I'm sorry that that's not an excuse for what we saw on Saturday. It's not. It's at not. some point in the season, it doesn't matter where you put the bye. You're going to play consecutive weeks of football. Right. There's everybody's going to be tired. Now, you might not play as rigorous as a schedule of a schedule as Notre Dame. That's fair. Sure. But every team is going to play five, six games in a row. There's only so many buys you can put in the schedule. You can be strategic and maybe put it in between uh, Ohio State and Duke for emotional reasons. I know talking to a lot of players um, in 2014, I think Cam McDaniels always, Cam McDaniels, like the worst thing at the Florida State emotionally was playing Navy. He was like, it was the worst thing in the world. He was like, if we had won that game, the Navy game still would have been tough. Yeah. The next week. On like us. we talked about with that Marshall last year for the Yeah. Day. Absolutely. So, you know, you have tough stretches in your on your schedule. That's part of being um a good team. Right? Everybody talks about the early schedule for Michigan. Yeah, it was brutal. It was soft. It was terrible. Don't worry. Don't worry, Penn State and Ohio State right. in a four in a four week stretch is coming. Right, it's coming. So, you know, you can't run from the schedule. Eventually, it gets tough for everybody. Right. right. Well, and Sean, in the last five games, uh, Alabama's had to play Texas at South Florida, home against Ole Miss at Mississippi State at Texas A and M in a five week stretch with no bye. You're, you're like right after the opener against middle Tennessee. And guess what? They're doing what they need to do to win games. So, so Notre Dame has one extra week of practice and games. Just one extra week is the reason they played like that against Louisville on the road, but Bama just went on the road and played Texas A&M and won their, did their job, right? Because they're not where they need to be yet as a program. Fix it, figure it out. We're not doom and gloom. The program sucks. It's terrible. Fire. No, we're not saying that. We both want Marcus Freeman to be successful at Notre Dame for a lot of reasons, mainly because if he can coach the way he recruits, this is going to be a fun stretch of football. That's reason number one for me. Reason number two is I think he's a good man. He's a good person. Yeah. You know, I want to, I want to be able to cheer for a good person to win us to win to win at Notre Dame. Right. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like we can also still say, what we saw on Saturday wasn't good enough, and there's no excuses for it. There's no too many games, and that's the best thing that Marcus Freeman said. And you could tell by his body language, Sean. He was like, "No." He right. starts as the guy's asking it. You could see him starting to, to to be like, "No, no, 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 no." Yeah, that made me. That was probably the most. That's probably why I wasn't as upset about the play calling thing as others, because that's the thing that mattered more to me. Because I under, that's just who Marcus is. He's not going to throw coaches under the bus. I mean, we can say he should have said this. He should have said that. But this is something he's been consistent with. He just doesn't criticize coaches publicly like that, or players for that matter. By the way, um, he's just but too that honest. Was the, yes, but that's he's the one where he honest. was like, "No, no, yeah. we're not using that." No one in his life. Because you remember when Notre Dame lost to Stanford in 2017? Oh, yeah. yeah. And Brian Kelly was like, "Well, you know, we've flown across the country, and all of that guys are tired." Yeah. And, all, and, and and I know coaches at Notre Dame at the, on that staff that called me afterwards, like, "Man, this is why we lost." That's why we lost. Yeah. It's that right there. Because the coach, he allows too many excuses in this program. Oh, it's yeah. midterms. It's, we had to fly across the country. It's like bull crap, man. This is, you know, and, and so to me, Marcus is like, nah, no, nah, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. And that's something yeah. that I was happy to see, Sean, because that yeah. was the most emotional response he gave today. That's the one where his chest kind of got out. He got like a little like more tensed up. Like, mm -mm. no, like he almost wanted to cut the guy off. Yeah. Like when he was asked, did you see that? Like that body language on that? I didn't know if you were just yeah. listening or if you also watched. No, I watched. How, he, how his body reacted to that question compared to all the others was like, all right, cool. He's not going to become that guy. And that's that's the one thing that um, and that I, made me feel better. I see someone in the chat. This is me. 
can't speak for anybody else. Because my opinion of Notre Dame and the expectations I have for Notre Dame in this program, I just recognize are a little bit higher than some other people. I, I don't have BKPSD. I, it doesn't affect me. I know the talent on the roster. And if that talent plays at the level it's supposed to play at, I don't care what Duke, Louisville, or any other ACT, ACT team gets in the transfer portal. Notre Dame is double digits better. Yep. If that talent plays the way they're supposed to play, right? So Duke and Louisville giving Notre Dame tough games has nothing to do with the transfer portal because four or five years ago, Duke walked into Notre Dame Stadium and played Notre Dame a certain way. And the transfer portal wasn't popping in. And that day, it wasn't about Duke. It was about Notre Dame playing below their standards. Jeff Rom has walked into Notre Dame Stadium twice over the past five years with Purdue and took Brian Kelly down to the wire. It has nothing to do with the transfer port. Either your talent plays up to its capability or it doesn't. That's, P- that's it. Either Bobby Petrino did that in 2014, Sean. He brought Absolutely. a little team here with a true freshman quarterback. True freshman who quarterback. Who wasn't even a starting quarterback, and he beat Notre Dame at Notre Dame Stadium. Transfer Before portal four. wasn't popping back then. Right. It has nothing to do with transfer portal. The best and, teams have better Notre talent. Notre Dame has plenty of transfer portal impact on this football team. And their quarterback's a portal guy. Their best defensive end this year has been a portal guy. Like that's, That talk like that. Is letting Notre Dame off the hook. That's that low hanging fruit that I'm talking about that lets Notre Dame off the hook. The transfer portal has nothing to do with the fact that this program and its players are playing far below right. where they should be playing. Right. That's period. Whether it's the players, the coaches, you want to blame the AD it's for both. not allowing hires and all of that stuff, sure. whatever it That's is. Fair. That's fair. This program is not meeting the expectations right now, players and coaches, period. Because if they were, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about a close win over Duke and a loss to Louisville, regardless of what happened. We wouldn't be talking about both. That's my thing. Like we talked about this last week, Sean. You look at Georgia in 2021. They had a very Mm -hmm. close – was uh oh no, it was last year, it was Missouri. The year before, I'm trying to remember who it was the year before that had a really close win over an, a not very good team. Last year was Missouri, they didn't play very well against Missouri, but we said coming out of that game, they got back on track and rolled. Mm-hmm. Right. So you're always gonna have that that we I talked about this with LSU 2019, that game against Auburn, where they barely won. The offense didn't do a whole lot scoring wise, had some mistakes, cost some points, you know, and, and they 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 won, was it like 23 to 20? a team that averaged mm-hmm. like 50 points a game, right? Won 23-20, but they came back out the next week and they all, they got on a roll and, and beat a really good Bama team on the road, 46-41. to 41. Now, if you go back and watch that game, the offense came out, they were killing Bama early. Bama came back a little bit late. It wasn't quite mm-hmm. as close as the final score showed, but they bounced back that next week and said, okay, we're going we're gonna to get better. So I don't mind the Duke game. I don't mind the Duke game in and of itself. Uh, the Louisville game would frustrate me if it was just with no context because, you know, it's not a team you should lose to. But you can look, hey, look, that's a top 25 team on the road. Stuff happens. Mm-hmm. It's the sequence of these games that's the concerning thing, including the Ohio State loss because they played their butts off that game. But as we talked about post game, there were too many things where you Missed didn't get away from who you are. You didn't take yes. advantage of opportunities. You should have won a game. And now it's three games in a row. I understood Duke being a hangover game from Ohio State. We talked about that. We That's why it was a trap game. But at some point in time, who's pushing the buttons to say, this isn't enough? And that's going to be the key this week, Sean, is it's got to, from a coaching level and from a player level, it can't, if this team's be, ability to turn around, and I'm going to talk about articles with Marcus Freeman's got to push the right buttons and all that, and that's true because he's the head football coach. But if it's only Marcus Freeman that's pushing the buttons this week, this team's in trouble. That's the reality of it. Because it's got to be, it's got to come from an assistant level and it's yeah. definitely got to come also from a player level. Yeah. Where, you know, Joe Walt's got to go into that locker room or that meeting room on Monday today or whatever and say, hey, fellas, I'm I'm an All-American. Yeah. I'm a captain. And I didn't play like it on Saturday. Yeah. And that's on me. 
and yeah. we're going to get this thing fixed. Because you know who would have done that at Notre Dame? Q. Quentin Nelson Man. would have done that. Hey, Man. I played like crap, and I promise you that's never happening again. And I'm going to go out here and do this, and I'm going to make sure you guys do it with me. Right? That Alex Bars has said this to me show, uh, in a show. Where he's like, the greatest thing about Quentin Nelson as a leader was, like, if you weren't matching his level of intensity, he was going to let yeah. – it wasn't that you missed a block. It's right. like, hey, man, it, why aren't you bringing it today? I'm bringing it today. I'm the best dang offensive lineman in college football. I'm bringing yes. it today. Yes. You know, you got to match that. Yes. And and that's where we need to see that. And I don't care what the players do or any of that other stuff. You've got to match that. That and, is the responsibility and, yeah. of greatness, right? Right. Joe Alt, you are a great left tackle at Notre Dame. It comes with the territory. Right. Yes. I, it might be pressure to have to dominate every play, every sure. game, but that's what comes with the territory. And, dominate. And, and technically, you don't have to, Sean, but it's when you don't, that's your chance to say, yes. I'm going to own this and I'm yes. going to lead us out of this group. You're because yes. he's not just an all American, Sean. He's got that C on his chest yeah. as well. Sam Hartman, you're not just a quarterback. You got that C on your chest. Right. Right. I know things aren't going well for you right now. And I know that some of it's not your fault, but you're still the leader. You're still the one that's got to go in there and say, hey, guys, that's not good enough. And it begins with me. You know, like, you know, you know, when you watch film, Rico needs to make a better play on that ball. You know that Chris Tyree needs to catch that ball, but you also know yeah. I didn't make a very good throw. Yeah. That's on me. I'm going to get the it. Tyree, the Chris Tyree ball, I thought he was a little late, just a tad bit late. Well, and it was also too far outside. Too far outside, yeah. Yeah, like he's he's running there. You've got to get oh, that. Oh, I'm not here. talking about yeah. that one. You're talking about the touchdown if you drop. Yes. Chris yes. Tyree, I was talking about the over route that, that the uh, DB didn't take, kind of stayed. If he had thrown it a little bit earlier, it wouldn't have been yeah. directly right there. Right. The DB yeah, would have had to come laterally. I was talking about the drop, the yeah. later drop. Yes, yeah. Chris Tyson, he's got to catch that ball. Like, there's no excuses, yeah. Chris, you got to catch that ball. Absolutely. But that needs to be a better ball. So my point is not that you're justifying what Chris Tyree, but you're the leader. You've got to take that. Hey, you know what? I need to put that ball right there. That's on me. I'm going to get back to you next time. Because, like, I'm trying to remember what the game was uh, this, this year. I'm just, I don't remember if it was a Notre Dame game, but it was. I was watching a game where a guy uh, dropped a pass in a game and it got picked off. And the very next series, the first play of the game, they called a pass play to that kid. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, it's like there's got to be some of that. And and we talked about this with Dion in the Colorado State game where the Horn kid makes this big mistake. Mm -hmm. Dion pulls him over. He's in his ear, blah, blah, blah. And they went right back to him the next series, right? It's mm -hmm. I mean, last year we saw that with Audric. You know, Audric has that bad fumble against UNLV. He gets benched. What they do the next game, first two plays of the game, Audric's getting the ball right up the middle. Right? Like, so so there, there's a coaching and a player response to this, right? And, and, and the Louisville game sucked. It can't, can't change it. Mm -hmm. can't, can't, can't do anything about it. Can't go back in time, do it all over again. How do you respond now? We're going to learn a lot about this football team. We'll talk about it more tomorrow in our show and, and a little bit tonight in the, upon further review. We're going to learn a lot about the character of this football team. And and we'll, and we'll we have we've had plenty to say about the coaches, but there comes a point in time, Sean, when you've got to look in the mirrors, the players, and say, I don't care what call plays they call, we got better yeah. players than them. Yeah, like I don't care what plays Jared Parker calls on Saturday, you got better players than the USC defense. And if you think Jared Parker's a bad coordinator, you haven't watched USC's defense this year. Yeah, because they just gave up forty-one points to Arizona's backup quarterback. A team that scored 21 points the week before against Stanford. Yo, and look, if you think Notre Dame has issues, I understand USC has zero in the loss column. Mm -hmm. Go check out that press conference where Caleb Williams basically had to jump in on the questioning of the head coach and stick up for the defensive side of the ball. Yeah. Like, there's a lot going on on that team. They know Alex Grinch is not a good D.C., the players know. The players know they're getting gashed. The players know the only reason they beat Arizona is because of that quarterback. They know that. Sean, if they don't have him at they quarterback, know they're a 500 football team. They're a 500 football team. They're they a got Superman playing team. quarterback. That's the only reason they're winning games right now. The Yo, that, they'd have lost to San Jose State if they didn't have Caleb Williams and Zachariah Branch. I mean, that play, it was like a a run play from the two-yard line where he basically drags a linebacker 
over the goal line for a touchdown. I'm like, okay, this, yeah, he's the difference maker. And, you know, hopefully with C.J. Carr, Deuce Knight, Kenny Minchie, Notre Dame is now recruiting and getting difference makers at that position because it helps to have a difference maker at that position. And the offensive line doesn't have to be perfect every time you're in a big game. They don't have that pressure. Hopefully Cam Williams and the, the freshman wide receivers develop you know, the coaching staff grows and play calling and everything gets better and we'll see that grow and things are now done collectively as far as we're going out here as a team and executing. Because right now, that's just not the way it is. That's just not the way it is. Man, USD is coming into this game with just as many questions as a team as Notre Dame. They just happen to have a quarterback that's kept them undefeated. That's the only difference. The only difference. Because if Caleb Williams was on Notre Dame, Notre Dame would probably be a team with questions and undefeated. Period. That's the small little difference between, and maybe that's why Vegas has Notre Dame favored, because they right. recognize, yo, that's the only reason this team yeah. isn't horrible. Well, and I think they also recognize too, Sean, that 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 as as frustrated as we are right now, this is still a team that took Ohio State down to the wire. This is still a team that blew out their first six opponent, th four opponents by an average margin of like forty six to eleven, right? Yeah. Like that's the thing is this team can be that team again if the leadership is right. This team can be that team again, and, yeah. and again, this is why I wrote the article I wrote today, Sean. It, it wasn't the bang on Marcus Freeman for how could you not have your team ready to play. I. I I just when I walk went through warm ups I'm like this team's just not ready to play. Yeah, it is what it is. Yeah. But it's more about who do you want to be now? Yeah, right. Who do you want to be now? Because you don't have to let this continue. It's up to you. As players, as coaches, you don't have to let this continue. It's like this: do something about it. If you don't like yes. how you're feeling right now, do something about it. Yes. If I'm Marcus, hey, you know what? If I'm, let's just say he's getting on Coach Parker. If you don't like it, man, do something about it. And I, I'm not saying that like in a step up and fight me. I, I'm saying like yeah. fix it, right? If you don't like, if you don't like that I'm not playing you more, then go out there and just ball your butt off in practice this week. Do something about it. Go make a play. Do something about it. If you don't like how you're feeling right now, do something about it. And that's the opportunity. That's what I love about football, Sean. No matter how we're feeling, man. Okay, you got. Talk, this I just. I just found out that during the Brian Kelly era, Malik, uh, CJ Procise, Greg Bryant, all the kids that were the youngsters, they had a saying in practice and in games, change your life. When you get when you get the opportunity, change your life. And Malik talked about that Michigan State game. Will Fuller changed his life. Like he made a couple of plays against Michigan State. I think it was a game where Michigan State had all of the uh, pass interference calls. Oh, twenty thirteen. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it was like that. That was the game that they saw. Like, oh, oh, okay, Will. Okay, change your life when you get the opportunity. Change your life, CJ Pro Sites in the Music City. But like, dude, when you get yeah. the chance, change your life. Right. And that's the way everybody in this program has to be. Yeah. When I step on the field, this is my opportunity to make a play. And that's what I'm going to do. Offensive guard, center, rotations, whatever it is. This is your opportunity to change your life. Because they said, if, if you went to your junior year and you hadn't done anything on the Brian Kelly, you were more than likely going to be forgotten. So we knew we had these two years to make our imprint. And, and that is that is so true, man. And that's you know, not like, just because, a Brian Kelly thing. That's true to a lot of places. If that's, you haven't done that's a lot of places. Year, they, they're over-recruiting you. Yeah, that's not a shot at Brian Kelly. That's just that's yeah. college football, man. That's college football. You know? yeah. and, and to go to this point, man, look, there is nothing wrong with Notre Dame players saying everyone, we're everyone's Super Bowl. Sure. Because that's a privilege. It's true. That's a privilege. It's true. 
as a right. program, that's a privilege, right? The Chicago Bulls knew, hey, when we go on the road, <laughs> we're everybody's NBA finals. Georgia knows that now. Yeah, and Michael Jordan and the Bulls, they took that as a privilege. And we're going to come out and we're going to put on a show tonight. All of y'all came to see us? Oh, that's great. Come on, put on a show. And you walk in with bravado. And Notre Dame has to get back to that point mm -hmm. where it's not just something you say to explain why the game is going to be tough. It's something that you wear as a privilege. Yes. That gets you ready for the game. Yes. It's not about the other team. This is why we prepare the way we prepare. You remember when you were in high school, nothing brought more joy than when you went a blast at a team. And because like when you'd look at your schedule and mm -hmm. you're like, oh, they made us the homecoming game. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> All right. You made us your homecoming game. Uh -huh. You're okay. going to regret that. Absolutely. You, you know what I mean? Like there's got to be some something like that where like in this one we've always said like with Lou Holtz, Brian Kelly would always use academics as an excuse why the team couldn't be good. You Holt, Lou Holtz used it as a reason they were going to be great. Yeah. Same same situation. Yeah. Go ask, you know, oh, it's easier in 1988. Well, not according to the other players. They didn't <laughs> think it was easier. Like they they no. knew what the struggle was, right? Yeah. And and back then you couldn't watch film from your dorm room like you can now. You had to Absolutely. go to the football facility because they didn't have like iPads. Now they send it to you on your iPad. Yeah. yeah you can you know, be in so bed. It's, like, <laughs> it's like 30 degrees outside and it's cold in November and it's snowy. You can't just sit in your dorm and watch film at 10 o'clock at night. You had to go over to the to the football facilities, right? Yeah. It's 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 not it's not saying that hey, it's it's every game is not Notre Dame Super Bowl. Of course yeah. it is, but that's always yeah. been true. So so are you gonna use this as a as an excuse not to play well or are you going to say this is why we play well yeah. because we know you're going to get your best shot you're their best shot and we're going to be ready to play and um they weren't on saturday yeah that statement i honestly i love i love that you should feel that way yeah we get everybody's best that's shot. why you come to notre dame that's why absolutely. you come to notre dame absolutely, absolutely. Right. charlie weiss last belt lou hi gents it feels Sam isn't allowed to make changes when he sees what the defense is doing. Freeman answered during the PC. Didn't make me comfortable. You talked about it a little bit earlier, right? Like, it doesn't seem like Sam has too much, you know, yeah. power yeah. to do so. Which I think is problematic. I mean, I guess with a lot of things, Sean, is just what did you bring him here for? You're not – he's not hardly doing any of the stuff he did at Wake Forest. He's not – allowed to you know and and it's a lot easier in tempo to get checks made it, it can be hard in in the way that they're running when they're in the huddle and then they get up the line of scrimmage there's not a lot of time to necessarily go through and make a lot of checks and things like that i mean it's just kind of like what, what was the point of bringing in a sixth year senior if you're not going to do those type of things so yeah i i didn't like it charlie i wasn't a big fan of it Joe Papiti with a super chat. Joe says, I've not coached at the D1 level, but have coached teams that have underperformed based on talent. I would do a full reeval of myself, coaches, practices, and messaging. What would your strategy be? Well, here, here's two, there's two ways of looking at this, Joe. And, and you, anytime you lose, you've got to be able to do a self-evaluation. The, the, the concern, however, and the, the danger is you've got to make sure that you're not overreacting to every positive or negative. Just like if you go out there and beat a team that you weren't supposed to beat, you don't then say, well, we've arrived. You say, okay, we did. what did we do that week that's repeatable? What are maybe some of the adjustments we made in practice that are repeatable that we can go out and say, this needs to be what we do? What are the things that you did that maybe you felt didn't have you prepared that you can look back and say, you know what? I pulled off the reins on these guys last week. And I'm not saying this happened. I'm just giving you an example, right? Maybe he said, you know, we, we, our guys are tired. So we backed off of them during the week. And we mm -hmm. didn't do as much. We tried to do more mental reps. And the result was they weren't ready to play. The speed of the game was too much for them. That's all me. Never doing that again, right? Or at least with this team. Then there may be other years where you've got a team that's just like, hey, this is the kind of team that we can do that, and they're going to handle it well, and it's going to allow us to go out there and dominate. So, like, it's not always this worked for this team, but it may not work for that team, Yeah. right? So there always needs to be a, a self-evaluation, and and that's what, a, that's what teams do. I mean, you adjust as you go through the season, but you also have to be careful – that you don't overcorrect and you don't overreact to everything. For me, the, the the strategy would be, you know, we've got to find ways to get our running game going. 
and it's a personnel thing, it's a formation thing. You've got to look at some of our tendencies and see how teams are attacking us and what can we do about it. Because yeah. I'm going to tell you right now, the first time you hit a bomb on a 13 <laughs> personnel backside post route for a touchdown against – it's going to make teams think, hmm, may, maybe we should – you know, maybe we can't come as hard as that. And, you know, the first time on the third one, Sam Hartman runs a naked and he runs for 20 yards before anybody gets to him and he dips out of bounds. You may say, hey, you know what? They've got an answer for that. Like that was the thing that frustrated me about the call at Coach Freeman. The thing that Coach Freeman said, Sean, is he said, look, sometimes you just need to be able to run the football. Well, I get all that, but what if they're lined up in something and you can't run the football? You've got to have something built in to say, hey, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. And right now, teams know when they line up like this, that's just what they're doing. And and they have no answers for it. So, you know, and because here's the thing about that pitch play. Only three people need to know you're doing that. That's it. The quarterback, the tailback, and the and the receiver to that side. That's it. That's it. The linemen don't need to block that. Block what you were going to run anyway. Now you got to be careful that you know you're 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 you, know, you got to have some awareness. If you're running a buck sweep, you can't do can't do that. <laughs> Right. But there's things yeah. you can do where you just turn around and you just make that little quick check. You know what I mean? And, 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 you know, Hey, look, 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 easy, easy, easy. Hey. And then you check the inside zone. You had buck sweep called, you check the inside zone. And then you line up and you tell the running back like, Hey, you know, give them the, whatever the signal is. And then you do it and then you're good to go. You don't have to make an audible with everybody. That's like, that's the beauty of RPOs. You don't have to audible yeah. a dang thing. The offensive line right. blocks the run. Yeah. You know, it's like you pull it and you throw it, and the receivers are, are they, they don't need to audible. Yeah, you got your route. This yeah. is what we're doing, and that's some of the beauty of RPOs. So I mean, it's just it just really comes down to Joe for me is, you know, challenging your coaches to say, and and here's the thing: the coaches can't then go make this a a, a, a week of practice. This is pure hell. You're pissed off. I, the coaches, you know, this is this is a human a, a human nature response. Sean is, I just got my butt chewed out by the head coach. Or the, the the OC just got his butt chewed out by the head coach, and then the OC just chewed my butt out. I'm not saying this happened. I'm just giving you an example of things. So I'm going to go out there and take it out of my players. Yeah. I honestly think this Notre Dame team, they need a very stern talking to in the meeting room. When they get out on that practice field, it's got to be, let's go, fellas. Let's have some fun. Let's get after it today, man. Let's compete. Let's get, you know, and, and, and when they make great plays, man, like in, in there's days we would do this as a coaching staff on some of the good, Hey guys, when, when we do something good today, our guys are just dragging today. Like when they we're, man, we are going to be, let's get, and then there's times where, you know, you feel like your team's feeling a little bit too good about themselves. And so no matter what <clears> they do today, we're going to be all over a man. Like it's just not good enough. Cause they're starting to feel, they thought they could go through the motions yesterday and they, they think they did something cause they scored 60 last weekend. Like, uh, uh-uh, that's, that's not who we're going to be. Cause you're not practicing like you did the week to score 60. You think you've arrived, and so we've got to do something. That's part of reading your football team. Right now, this offense needs a confidence boost. And just going out there and ripping them all week is not going to do anything. You know, I've said before, I didn't like how in the past they would they would always scheme for success. You got to be – this is one of those weeks where it's like, guys, the first two days of practice, every look we put the scout team defensive in, it's going to be what USC does, but at least the first day – we are putting ourselves in the right coverage to get big plays because we need these kids to be confident. I got to put Jaden Thomas in some situations. I got to put Tobias Merriweather in some situations. Yes. I got to put this guy in some situations to say, hey, we're going to go out there and we're going to call this play for you. And here's the thing. And if he doesn't step up and respond, then you know I can't win with that guy. Yeah. Like we literally made it easy. We set it up perfectly for you and you drop the ball. Yeah. <sighs> You know, may, maybe we do need to go somewhere else, right? But it can't be a week where you're just crushing them all week. You, you can't. I I know that's what we all as fans want to do. We want to get in there and rip their buttholes. And you guys yeah. don't care like we do. Trust me, y'all. They do. They do more, in fact, because it's their futures that are on the line here. Yeah. And and so that's part of it too. Is sometimes you just got to know, guys. We just need to we need to do something to get some confidence in them today. And it doesn't mean that you hold their hand and sing kumbaya but we're going to have some fun today and we're going to set them up for success today Yeah, because we got to get them going. So that's, that's, that's what I would do offensively. Whatever it is that you need to do to push the buttons, to get some confidence back in the first couple of days of practice this week, I'm flat out doing it yeah. flat out. doing. And then if you go out and get a couple of big plays against early against USC early, it's like, okay, so you are that team. You guys stumbled. You are that team. 
but you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to get it figured out and we're going to do what we need to do. Good morning, Iris. Thank you for the super chat. Coach Marcus Freeman made comments on being ultimate competitors in the press conference. It seemed like the team didn't want to be there and compete. Similar to your observation from pregame. Can you talk about why that might be? No, I can't because I don't know. I mean, honestly, there could be a thousand reasons why that team looked the way that they did on Saturday. I mean, for all we know, there there might and 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 if it was true, I don't know that Marcus Freeman would say it. Maybe there was like the flu was going through the team all week. You know, maybe it was because of midterms. Now that's not an excuse. That means you guys didn't prepare correctly. But may, maybe that's the reason. I'm not saying these are excuses as if it's okay. But I'm saying, but maybe midterms were the reason. That's wrong, and you didn't do a good job of preparation. But you know what I mean, like. Notre Dame had midterms the year they went 12 and 0, right? At yeah. some point in time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, so it's it's about it could and, and if I start saying why it might be, then there will be some people that will take and say, Driscoll said they were not ready because this happened. Yeah. You know what I mean? If I use an example, that what if this coach was ripping them all week because he was mad about it? And oh, Driscoll said that they they weren't successful because Coach A went out and and ripped them all week and they their confidence was shook. Well, I just gave you a general example. I didn't say that's what what happened. So honestly, I don't I don't have a good enough read on this team to be able to tell you why. I, I don't. I can just tell you that it was in the look the faces of the coaches, the players. There just was no confidence on the field on Saturday even on the defensive side of the ball in, a, in some instances, just no confidence. I don't know where that came from, but they need to figure it out and, and fix it quickly. The, Eventually uh, yeah. you need to see the ball go in, right? Right. As a shooter, yeah. like they don't tell shooters to stop shooting, but then eventually as a shooter, you need to see the ball go in and start feeling better about yourself. And, um, you don't have to tell Notre Dame's players that they're not executing at a high level right now. You better not. They know that. You better not. They they know that. The coaching staff knows that they're not coaching at a high level right now. But Sean, can I ask you something? Yeah. This kind of goes back to what I was saying, what you just said. Shooters are off, right? You know, eventually has to go in. But what happens when the ball starts to go in? Hey. They get hot. Why? Because the confidence hot. is there. I've said yeah. this so many times. Momentum is nothing but confidence. Momentum is not a thing outside of confidence. We believe in ourselves because when you have confidence, sometimes a coach will – and I've said this before. This isn't new. Sometimes a coach will make a call that's not a great call. But you're so confident in yourself. You're so confident in the guys in front of you. You're so confident in your receivers yeah. that as a quarterback, you're like, all right, cool. I'm going to execute. I'm going to get the ball out because I know my guy's going to go make plays. Yeah. But if the, the exact opposite is true, you may call a play that's going to work, but you have that doubt in your head about the call. Mm -hmm. You have that doubt in your head about the guys blocking in front. And I'm talking about court, from a quarterback's point of view because that's what I played. I'm, I'm giving this my example. I don't have confidence that my receivers are going to catch the football. So you know what? I, I, that play, This play's not going to work. Why? Because yeah. I didn't have the right mindset going into it, right? Because I didn't have the confidence. But then you start getting confident, and all of a sudden it's like, okay, I'm going to do whatever I want because I'm, I'm feeling it right now yeah. i can do whatever the heck i want you know what i mean and and that's they've got to figure out a way to get that back with this offense because this offense was a confident group going to the Ohio state game it only and takes one it's look it only takes one shot for shooters it could be a something something as simple as one play yeah. for notre dame come off a screen knock down a 15 foot jumper and it's like okay i, I got this I'm, you know it could be no it could be tobias merriweather catching a ball on a bomb and, Sean, I'll say it this. Could be, it could be Jeremiah Love breaking one. It's USC one 2015. Mm -hmm. Notre Dame played them in 2014, got their brains beat in. And 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 thanks to Coach Sark for calling off the dogs that game because it could have been that could have got ugly. He Man. flat out called off the dogs. You come out the next year, first drive of the game, Cody Kessler takes the USC offense right down the field and scored. And that stadium was pretty quiet. Yeah. Because it was like, here we go again. And then that first play, Deshaun goes to throws a bomb to Will, and the place goes nuts. And that Notre Dame team was a completely different team the rest of the game. Because it's you know what, guys, yep. we are that team. 
And uh, to your point, it, it takes one play, one throw. You know, like you said, Tobias goes and makes a big play in the first play. He's fired up, and all of a sudden, it's like, okay, guys, we're we're good. We're yeah. good. You know. Yeah. And this is why every week in game keys to the game we talk about in these games: start fast, start fast, start fast. It's 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 why it's important, and, and that's what's so frustrating about that interception against Louisville. Because first three plays on there, doop doop, first down, first down, first down, pick. It's like because yeah. hey, at first you're like, okay, yeah, they came ready to play today, boys. You know what I mean? So no matter how yeah. I felt, the first three plays, I'm like, okay, you know what? That was just me. Whatever I got going on, there's things going on in the world that are really kind of just were hard to deal with on Saturday, and just you know, just all these type of things. My buddy's dealing with a, a tough loss. I know what he's going through personally, and there's just a lot of things. And it's just like maybe it's me, and I'm just reading into it. And then pick, yeah. And then Louisville goes right down the field and scores. And you're like, nope, yeah. I wasn't wrong. And I hate when I'm. I, I wanted to be wrong, man. Yeah. <sighs> Charlie Weiss with another one in response to Ray and needing better players. I bet Kirby's staff could do some wonderful things with Indy's players. I bet Shepard would have Indy ball. I, I mean, it's Shepherd easy to say. The the coach in yeah, Washington. Right. Yeah, but, it, it, and that's why somebody earlier was trying to say that I, I called Chancey Stucky a home run hire when Marcus Freeman hired him. Like, that's just not true. I said, look, we'll see what he can do, but he's an unknown, right? He's an unknown. And the thing, the reason I wanted Jamarcus Shepard is because he was a known, he was a known commodity. We'd seen what he'd mm -hmm. done at Washington State and Purdue and some other places, and he was a known commodity. The lineage, because anything, if you're associated with Jeff Brom from an offensive standpoint, you're probably going to get the benefit of the doubt <clears> from me. You know that, Sean. And and so, I mean, it it would be easy to say that, but we don't ultimately know, right? What what if he came here and he was handcuffed? by the head coach, right? I mean, we, we don't know that he would have done that. I just – I would I'd, – I'd feel a little bit more confident in it because he's a more of a known commodity, in my opinion. Do you feel like – and this is, you know, focusing on that Kirby staff. Kirby strikes me as someone who is not afraid to coach – anyone yeah and we'll quickly identify okay if this veteran doesn't want to do it right i'll find somebody else i'll go through whatever i have to go through with this kid and coach his butt up now that puts more on kirby's plate yeah to get that freshman ready that's that's more on him but he takes that and kirby will go out there and play four or five freshmen and he'll go through the growing pains because he knows in three or four by November, weeks, yeah, yeah man. by November, I know what I'm going to have. Yeah. Now, playing certain players on Notre Dame's defense makes it easier for the coaching staff because they don't have to do too much. Because those guys are going to know where to play, right. where to be, but they're not going to make athletic plays, difference-making plays. But I don't have to worry about teaching where to be fundamentals which puts more onus on the coaches i just think that's very interesting based upon the comment you know because basically you're saying kirby it points out that kirby's not afraid to coach that's he embraces it that's his job and that right? means two things sean is i don't care if you're a superstar no you're gonna get coached and and where did he get that number one where did he get that from he got that from Nick Saban. Nick Saban, right? Number two, Kirby's also a pretty arrogant guy. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean that in the positive, like the really confident, like, you know what? Like, uh, because that bleeds in his players, right? And 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 I've always said this, the, the, the players are going to be, in a, they're going to, the, you're going to have the personality of your head coach and your quarterback. I've said that a million times. I said, that's why, and you can tell Malik, I said this, I've said this for almost 10 years now. That's why the 2015 team was so much different than the 2016 team from a mentality standpoint. Because the 2015 team, they knew who the leader was. It was number, it was number, it's number eight. Everybody knew who it was, right? 2019 or 2016, they didn't know who the leader was. Yeah. And everybody thought it was going to be Deshaun, who didn't work, yeah. didn't have the right attitude, didn't, you know. So you're going to take the mentality of your head coach and your leader. Those are the things you're going to do. 
Yeah. Right. And so that's the, so that's a, so like there's this level. Hey, look, I don't care who you are. I don't care what your five star ranking was. If you can't if, if you're not doing what you need to do, Coach Saban's going to put your butt on the bench. Yeah. Coach Smart will put your butt on the bench. And and, um, you know, they're, they're, we I want to we'll find that question here at some point in time, Sean, because it, it ties into that that accountability aspect of it. But we got yeah, some, you have to have accountability. Man. Yeah. You have to. John A1. Why is it Notre Dame doesn't know how to utilize its speed skill players? Tyree, Merriweather are asked to do what Flores, JT, and GRT should do, and vice versa. That's a it's a good question. I think they're 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 trying to do that a little bit in the run game. I think Coach McCullough understands that we got to do some different stuff with Jeremiah Love than we're doing with Audrey Castame. But like, so like, here's the response that I get from people when I when I advocate for Chris Tyree needs to get some jets and some reverses, and people say, "Well, he's not a make you miss kind of guy." And I think people fundamentally mm-hmm. understand how a jet sweep is supposed to work in this type of offense, or how a reverse is supposed to work. When you're calling those plays, I don't want you to make anybody miss. I need you to outrun the defense to the edge. And I think of the the play in 2015 from uh, Braden Lindsay, or no, excuse me, it was 2019 from Braden Lindsay. Right. Brain Lindsay hadn't really done anything that year, playing some mop up yeah. minutes, but they had this play where they knew USC was going to overplay the buck sweep action. And they did it a couple times against USC. Chip Long did mm-hmm. it to them the year before as well. And I'll get to that in a second. But so what they did, Sean, they faked, they had run toss a couple times. Remember, they were tossing it to Tony Jones. And they mm-hmm. were hurt. So what they did was they put, they went in a bunch formation, same look, and they faked the toss, but instead they, Pitched it to Braden Lindsay, and all he had to do was basically get around the edge. He did the one little nod and just outran everybody to the sideline. Did the same thing against Boston College. Yeah. 2020, with Chris Tyree on the field, they ran a play with Chris Tyree at receiver. They went a two-back alignment, and you can do this with Chris Tyree or Jeremiah Love, and they ran an off-tackle play. Chris Tyree faked the reverse action, and they handed it off, and Georgia Tech did not react to Chris Tyree running the reverse. The very next play, Tommy Reese lined up and did the exact same play, handed it to Chris Tyree, and he gained 25 yards. Yeah. But you don't know that they're not going to overplay it if you don't ever even fake it to him. Fake it to him, yeah. Right? Like, yeah. that's the thing that frustrates me. It's like we watched the game against South Carolina where South Carolina was petrified of Chris Tyree for some reason. He didn't do anything in that game. But the constant yeah. using him in motion – at running back kept them from like in, in running the outside sweep. They kept rolling down to him yeah. and it set up other opportunities. And, and so I don't need you to, if, if I have, if you got to make people miss on a reverse or a jet, we didn't call it right. We, we didn't call it the right time. And they good tap, kept, tip of the cap to the defense. They played it well. I need it to be speed. I need you to get the ball and get outside. And, and so those are things that you need to do because it's kind of like we're seeing the same thing with this stat that we saw in the previous staff, and that's what's frustrating me. And that is, it's always about we've got to call the right plays. Yeah. And and Jared Parker says things like it's not about me, it's about the players. And and early in the season there were times when we would see that, but like it's now, it's like it's not like okay, Chris Tyree is not a natural receiver. He's not. And and there's people in the chat that want to bench him because the one drop he had is a little It's the first drop he's had all year. He's literally caught every other ball that's come his way. But, yes, every time a guy – hey, guys, I, I hate to break it to you. If you're going to bench a kid every time he drops a ball, you're going to run out of receivers really fast. Real fast. Real fast. And and so – but it's like, you're are you, are you really getting the most out of him? Because if, if you – here's the thing, Chris. Uh, with Chris Tyree, Sean, you got to hit it once. Yeah, and that's gonna that smoke is gonna work for you the rest of the year. Where you're running Audric downhill on your G scheme, and you got Chris Tyree faking, or you're running a toss, and Chris Tyree's faking a a, a reverse, and the backside's not pursuing because they're worried about number four going on reverse. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, he he's not. Then do it. He can't make people miss. Okay. Whatever. I, I don't buy that. Again, that's not what you're calling for. Fine. Do it, Jeremiah Love. Do it, Jordan Faison. I don't care. Do it with someone that's fast. Do it with Janarian Price. I genuinely don't care. It's not even about Chris Tyree. Do it with somebody. And then the one time they did run it against Duke, they did it like near the red zone where it's like it's not going to be as effective because the safeties aren't worried about throwing the ball down the field or any other. It's a shortened field. So it's just those things where it's just like 
it, it, it's I think Jared Parker understands that this has got to be built around the players. I just don't know that they're necessarily doing a good enough job of building it around the players uh, 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 to a degree. They're starting to it, Jeremiah Love, right? Yeah. But like Jadarian Price, that's an explosive dude. He had one carry for two yards on Saturday. Yeah, like, that's yeah, it. yeah. It is the great coordinators call plays. But then it's certain to- – it's a certain point of, of every game where you call players' numbers. Like, this isn't about the play design. This is about getting the ball to that dude right there. Him. We've seen it for three years. When Georgia gets in a tough, a tough game, 19 is getting the ball. It's been that way since he's a freshman. He's getting the ball. That's our game breaker. Throw the ball to 19. And that's it. And at some point, Notre Dame has had that guy. I mean, it's been Michael Mayer for the last three years. Before that, it was Will. And it was Chase one year. And with a mixture of Cole Komet. It, you know, this year it's been tough because a lot of things happen, right? And I didn't, I didn't say this. I said this yesterday, and I said, look, it's tough when you come in and what you come back with, there's issues with the wide receiver that's returning with the most receptions and the most receiving yards in your wide receiver room. He's coming off a tough year, some other issues. Deion Col- and then you got Deion Cozy. Deion Cozy just can't stay healthy. He just best ability is availability. He can't stay healthy. So now this guy transfers. This guy is not available. So so now where where are you at in the wide receiver room? Where are your veterans you can lean on? Okay, Jaden Thomas. Okay. He is better in the slot, but because we don't have anybody else, we got, we got to move to the outside. To put him in the boundary in, the, in, in third down. Yeah, and Have your third you know, down package be him in the slot. You, you know what I mean? It is. Yo. That's, that's what happened, right? What? Should have been two receivers, two veterans we can depend on for different reasons aren't there. All right? They aren't there. That's tough. Now you're asking Jaden Thomas to do something that is probably really not his strength. He's a slot guy. Allow him to be a technician. He should be your third down guy. He should be the guy Sam Hartman is looking for matchups on linebackers and safeties on third the third downs he should be that guy because and then and then you work the freshman in you work Jaden greathouse in you work rico in tobias should be in every play i need the defense to see him on the field every play like they need to know okay this guy can run past us you take and him actually get a ball thrown to him yes you take him off the field, there is no one that makes the defensive backfield say we have to worry about them running by us. There's no pressure. I don't care if he is struggling. He needs to be on the field to help your offense. Figure out ways to get him going. That's what coaches do, man. That's what coaches That's do. What coaches do. That's what coaches do. I mean, hopefully the, the reception he had, you know, late in that game, We'll get them right. going. I didn't want to say anything about it because it's just like I just, but it's like it is kind of that. We'll see. We'll you know, see. we have to. We cannot give up. You can't give up on kids, man. Not that early, especially you when you're like like next year. If a guy's not doing well and you've got Cam Williams and you get okay. If there's another guy that can do the job, I understand that. But we're not yeah. in that situation because there isn't somebody else that can do that job. Yeah. So it's um yeah, it's one of it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. Raymond, thank
Thank you for the super chat. Hey, Brian. And it's, it's good to see you, Sean. Thank you, my brother. Hope MF can get this turned around. Go Irish, beat USC. Absolutely. That's one thing that in this chat we can all agree on is that we all hope Coach Freeman get it turned around and that they beat Oh, USC. heck yeah. Heck yeah. yeah. Sean, I'm yeah. going to read this next one because it's for you from Garth right. Cassidy. Thank you, Garth. Appreciate you very much. He goes, Sean, you think it was a Notre Dame as a brand loss. I agree, but it won't change because Notre Dame and Jack Swarbrick are not going to invest, but only so much money. Um, the Louisville you, loss? Can I ask you a question, Sean? Yeah. Do you think Louisville spends more on its football program than Notre Dame? Oh, heck no. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Yeah. And I think I, most fans know that. And most I think Garth knows that. I I, I get where he's most, coming from. Most fans would have angst with not so much what's spent, but how it's spent or what it might right. be spent on in today's landscape of college football. And I understand that frustration. Um, but this is my thing. And I said this yesterday. The Jack Swarbrick is about to be fishing in like four or five more months. Like, let let that go. And the reason I say let it go is because the moment Marcus Freeman stepped up to the podium and introduced Jared Parker as the offensive coordinator, he accepted the terms that were being laid before him at Notre Dame, which means he said, okay. I know what I'm dealing with. I accept the challenge to go win a national championship with these terms. He accepted it. So anything that Marcus Freeman does that's that I critique or possibly Brian or anybody else critiques has absolutely nothing to do with the athletic director anymore. Right. Your head coach accepted the challenge. He accepted the challenge. And if and well, if and when when Pete Bavakwa finally takes office, what he decides to do and how he decides to operate and move Notre Dame for athletically, not just football, the entire athletic program. Right. It's something we have to sit back and wait to see. I will say this, and somebody was shocked when I said it. As much as we've heard about them having conversations all last year, Marcus Freeman is not Pete Bavakwa's guy. Sure. Just keep that in mind. It'll be interesting. Got another Marcus. super chat from Garth along the same line, Sean, just to kind of continue it. He goes, you know Notre Dame is going downhill when Tommy leaves and he Stan leaves and Bayless leaves. What are the issues? It is administration of Swarbrick. A couple things about that. Number one is Harry Heastan did not leave because of any issues with Jack Swarbrick, the administration. Uh, Tommy didn't leave. They were more than willing to pay Tommy whatever he wanted to stay at Notre Dame. Tommy wanted, Tommy needed to get away from Notre Dame. He needed to kind of get out and do something somewhere else. And Matt Bayless leaving had nothing to do with the administration or Jack Swarbrick. There are plenty of things that we can be critical of with the Notre Dame administration. And I have no problem doing that. I I will Mm -hmm. flat out sit there and and Sean, we've done it where I will be critical. I don't love the schedule. I'm not saying the schedule they did this year is perfect. I said the schedule should have been the week before USC, though. That's what I said. You you play seven games, get a bye, and then have your last five. That's what mm-hmm. I thought they should have done. You know, but it's but it's still not an excuse for what we saw on Saturday, right? There are things the administration flat out needs to do to do a better job supporting the football program. We've talked about that plenty of time on these shows. I know you guys have talked about it on your show. You and I have talked about it on the show. But mm-hmm. I'll say the same thing about Marcus Freeman in the football program now that I said about Brian Kelly when he was the head coach, because I am not going to be inconsistent. When you start doing everything you can to maximize the resources you have and it's not enough, then I will say the administration needs to step up to the plate. But if you're not even maximizing the resources that you're being given, how am I supposed to go and say, hey, I need more? It's like if I'm running a business and I give your uh, you know, your branch of the company, Sean, X amount of dollars. Okay. Mm-hmm. And you come to me and say, Hey man, you're not giving me enough resources, but I'm like, <clears> Sean, <throat> you still have $200,000 in the bank. You're not even spending the money you have. 
or you spend the money. But I'm like, dude, you went out and, and spent the money on this. This very poor management of the money you have. What's my motivation for giving you more money? Because you didn't properly right. use the money I gave you. But right. if you come to me, and there's a parable about this in the Bible, Sean, which is one of my favorite parables. <laughs> but if you come to me, say, look, we've invested well. We've increased our revenue because we took 10% of what you gave us. We invested it. We were able to kind of get some extra revenue. We've done this. We've done this. But listen, in order for us to get to these goals, we've shown you a plan. We've done everything we can. Here's my bit proposal to come to you. Say, look, we need 15% more next year. And if you give me that 15% more, I promise you that'll allow us to then get this amount back, which actually is going to make you more money than what we're doing now, right? That's that's yeah. business, yeah. right? So if I'm Marcus Freeman, look, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're maximizing this, we're getting the most out of this, and I need more, then you can do that, right? But to me, they're not doing that. They're not failing right now because the administration wasn't willing to spend money because yes, that you didn't get the offensive coordinator that you maybe that you de de definitely wanted. They offered two guys the job before Jared Parker. I'm not going to sit there and say Jared Parker was the number one choice, but the point is, are you really telling me that you're making the most of of what your team can be right now at Jared Parker. I don't believe you are. Yeah. Right. And then, but the other thing too is, but even if that's true, we're talking about Louisville guys, you know, Louisville. So I don't want to hear about talent and administration when you're struggling to beat Duke. I promise you that Notre Dame spends a whole lot more money on football and gives a lot more support for football than Duke's program does for football. I promise you that. Yeah. We're talking about Louisville. They do not have a roster to beat Notre Dame. So again, I understand where y'all are coming from, but and and, and to it, if we're just talking big picture, Garth, then this is an off season thing. I, I'd I'd be more prone to say, hey man, I'm with you. The administration needs to step up. But in response to why they lost to Louisville, I'm I'm just not sympathetic to it. Uh, I'm just not because that's that's not the reason they lost to Louisville. It just isn't. I, I don't. I don't. <sighs> Maybe Notre Dame fans have not been aware. Well, most Notre Dame fans have been aware. Notre Dame has not been. Notre Dame has always been under what Jack Swarbrick said when it comes to athletics. They're about good stewardship. That's not something new. Meaning that Notre Dame's not just about the frivolously just go out there, just spin, 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 spin. Just to say, we we spent X just number say, on the program that Georgia yeah. spent. Right. They're not about to go and match Georgia six million every year. Georgia spends six million on recruiting every year. That's just recruiting. Mm -hmm. Notre Dame's not about to do that. Nor but do they Notre, need to do that. To no, be honest. Notre Dame. Notre Dame's in the top ten of schools that spend money on recruiting. Um, I believe, and this is why I said we, we're entering a land of unknown, right? With Marcus Freeman at a crossroads and with a new athletic director coming in. I believe that Jack Swarbrick was uncomfortable with where college football was headed and did not want to have to make certain decisions as the athletic director of Notre Dame and possibly be viewed as holding Notre Dame back. And I think he chose to step away to give Notre Dame a better person that might be able to deal with how things are moving forward in that relationship. And I, if that's the case, I commend him for that, for being honest enough to say, look, I don't want to be in this position dealing with this. I know what I believe in and somebody else probably needs to be in this seat to better handle how things are evolving. And if that's the case, that's, that's a very mature and responsible decision on his part. But as I said, man, you have a new AD coming in and you don't know how he's viewing things. Right now, you don't. You don't know relationships he has in the you coaching don't. world, right? You, you got to go you handle don't. your business, man. Yeah, you got to handle yes. your business. And again, Notre Dame did not lose to Louisville on Saturday because they were unwilling to pay for 
things or commit enough resources. I the, guarantee you, Pete Bavacqua, going back to something that was said, bro. I guarantee you, Pete Bavacqua, if he was there, I don't know if he was, I, I assume he was there. I'm sure he watched if he wasn't there. But wherever he was, I'm sure Mr. Bavacqua was not sitting there saying, man, boy, whew, this transfer portal is making it tough on us. No. I'm sure he was sitting there with disappointment. Like, yo, this is not, uh-uh. Right. This isn't, this isn't Notre Dame football. It comes down to it, Sean. If you are maximizing the resources I'm giving you or anywhere close to it and it's not enough, then we can have a conversation about you need more. And any smart business owner would do that. Yeah. You've got to give me a reason why I need to spend more money on your department. More. Yeah. Yeah. Because guys are just, ah, you guys didn't do well enough and you need more money. Cool. That's not how successful businesses are run. And the reality, guys, is athletic departments are businesses. Yes, the, the athletes are not professionals. But it is a business in regard to how it's run from an administration standpoint. We can discuss whether we like that or not, whatever the case may be. That's the reality. And if I'm giving you X number of dollars and these are the decisions that you're making with that money, like Brian Van Gorder in 2014 and 15 was one of the higher paid defensive coordinators in college football. Yeah. Fact. Tommy Reese last year was one of the highest paid offensive coordinators into college football. Fact. Right? So – was it really that they weren't able – Brian? I remember when it was released that Brian Van Gorder made the money he made. I was getting text messages from Notre Dame coaches like, I can promise you nobody else on staff is making that kind of money. right? <laughs> but Brian Kelly, when I got the money to – if you had a million dollars to spend on D coordinator, there's other yeah. guys you could have got that were better than Brian Van Gorder. Yeah. So it's kind of like, well, I gave you a million dollars to hire a defensive coordinator 10 years ago, and this is what you did with it. Why should I give you more money to go do a buyout now for this guy when – you know, you, you what, what are you going to do with it, right? Yeah. yeah. And and so when – and this is the thing. When the football program starts maximizing its potential within the constraints of what it's doing, then you'll have more of a beef to say, hey, we got to we gotta do things different, right? And, and, and yeah. I'll promise you this too. I promise you, Brian Kelly and Marcus Freeman are working under a far more supportive administration and athletic director than Lou Holtz ever had. Facts. Facts. And and that itself, my brother, as we transition to the next question, is let me be clear. Because I don't want anyone saying Sean said there's a shit. No. I'm being very clear. We are going into a place of unknown. No one knows what Pete Bavakwa is thinking. No one. I don't know how he views Marcus Freeman. I don't know how he views the current state of Notre Dame football. Right. I don't. You don't. You don't know what right. he's thinking. As Brian said, you don't know the relationships that he has with certain college coaches or NFL coaches. No one right. knows. And there's no so, implication there that we do know. No. It's simply put, that's the reality anytime a new athletic director is hired. Absolutely. Just a fact. Now, for all we know, he may look say, if, if I was there, I would have hired Marcus Freeman too. Right? Mm hmm So, yeah. Or he might have an understanding of what Marcus is dealing with and say, I want to be the athletic director that comes in and lightens the load yeah. and helps out. Yes. Hey, he I, understand the, well. I understand Absolutely. the limitations the football program has, and I'm going to make mm -hmm. sure we work to fix them because – and here's the thing that frustrates me. I made the argument that the administration is not going to do X because of this. But the other, the thing that I've always said is if you're willing to spend the money on the football program to make it work, it you will get a greater return on that investment than if, than what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes like I'm going to make, I'm going to spend a thousand, a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. To make $200,000. Yeah. But if I'm willing to spend $200,000, I can make a million. Spending the two hundred thousand dollars may be more risky for you, but yeah. that's part of it. Is like, look, I know I have belief that if we do this, then the return is going to be worth it. There's always risk involved in that, and to me, Notre Dame yeah. has always been a little too risk averse. 
because yeah. they don't, you know what I mean? They like keeping their money. And that's, you know, I, I understand that. But you've got to give them a reason to do otherwise. Yeah. And that's the point that we're making here. You've and got I to give them the, a reason to do otherwise. The point you're making in, in correlation to Lou Holtz has is certain things that span eras and time, right? The college football, the game of football is not the same as it used to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, low-hanging fruit. We all know that. But relationships with the administration is still the same and the importance of it. Correct. That Correct. never changes. Toughness is still toughness. That, that never right? changes. Fundamentals are still fundamentals. All this stuff about all the game has changed. It has, but it hasn't. And my point is, yeah. Lou should have had growing power similar to power that Nick Saban and Kirby Smart had. Right. If they're institutions, which goes to what you've been saying financially. Right. They have and no problem. They made more, more way money. more money. Yes. It would have made them a way better academic institution, a way Absolutely. better research institution. Absolutely. Would have been true. If the Notre Dame administration had poured into the football program because Lou showed, he proved the value of the program. And that it should have been poured into more. And the administration didn't want to allow him to have that much power or that much say so. That's the issue. And what we're saying is Marcus Freeman has to win to get to the point to give reason to the administration to say, okay, yes, we understand. This is reason to continue to pour into recruiting, NIL changing some things in the transfer portal to make it more advantageous for us. Yes, that's what has to happen. That's why missed opportunities like three weeks ago against Ohio State hurt because it's bigger than the record. It impacts recruiting. It impacts the administration. Donations. And donations. And you had an opportunity at home in front of all of those people to, to state your case. Yeah, I'm going to end, and end it with this, it. Sean. I'm going to end this part of it with this. We'll move on to the next question. And it, it, here's this. The administration did not call, force Notre Dame to make the play calls that they made on that last offensive drive. They did not force Notre Dame to not have Audrick Estime on the field on that last drive. They did not no. phone down and say, oh, hey, this is Father Jenkins. Tell Al Golden to run a prevent defense on third 19. Yes. That did not happen, right? Right. He's not there taking the headset from Ron Paulus and being like, no, 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 I'm going to get some calls in. Right. So to your point, you can't blame me. You say, well, what if they had a different coordinator with what you had, you had chances to win that football game. Yes. And you didn't get it done. Yes. You didn't get it done. Sean, I'm going to bring up this next question. I'm going to read and have you answer, and I'll be okay. right back. If I'm not back in time when you're done, just move on to the next I got one. you. Yep. Patrick S. Duffy with a super chat. Thank you, Patrick. He says, looking at the current state of the team, do you still think Notre Dame should seek a – because I answered this last week. That's why I want you to answer it. I want to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, mm. Notre Dame should seek a transfer portal quarterback for next season or get Minchie in to start gaining confidence, both his own and that of his teammates. All right. Thank you, Patrick, for the super chat. Let's have an honest conversation, right? Um, do, you guys, do you guys remember when uh, Brady Quinn made the statement earlier this year that this is the most talented Notre Dame team that he's seen? Right. And if you guys had tapped in to Lucky Lefty, we pushed back on that and laughed. Right. Because we knew the limitations of the wide receiver room. We knew. We knew the limitations of the interior of the offensive line. We knew that the Notre Dame defensive line for consecutive years was given up coming off of giving up 124 yards per game on the ground. We knew all these things existed. So when we heard that, we're like, wait a minute. The 2015 team was stacked. The 2012 team was stacked. And the 2015 class led to the college football playoff in 18. And so we're like, wait a minute. I'm, wait a minute. That's now. I fully expect next year's team to be more talented 
than this year's team, right? And I fully expect the 25-26 team to be more talented than that year's team because Marcus Freeman is going to have an opportunity to go out and get more and more talent, right? So now your young wide receivers are sophomores. Tobias is a junior, right? Cam Williams, you expect him to be a really good player as a freshman. The wide receiver room is going to be more talented next year. Don't even get me started on the tight ends next year. The tight end room is going to be absolutely bananas next year. Ridiculous, right? Most of you suggest that Joe Alt and Blake Fisher come back next year. So if, if they both come back, along with the experience that the offensive line gains on the interior, along with the freshman class of Jagasaw and the rest of his buddies getting better and being sophomores, the offensive line room should be better, right? What about the freshman defensive lineman? The great things we're hearing about Brennan Vernon. He's, he's getting snaps in games already. Devin Houston, the great things. He's been the scout team defensive player of the week. And all of these youngsters, you're hearing all of these great things. Next year's team is by nature going to be more talented. So now, this is the question you have to ask yourself as a head coach. With this talent at the tight end and wide receiver position next year, do I want to hand those keys over to a youngster with no experience? Or do I want to go get a difference-making quarterback that can properly handle the talent upgrade? And the running back room is going to be fantastic next year. That's with or without Aldrin. With or without him, the running back room. So basically, it comes down to – it's, the, it's as simple as this, Brian. Gino Gadula. That's it. Gino Gadula has to look Marcus Freeman in his eye and let him know whether or not one of the quarterbacks in the quarterback room can handle this Ferrari and this talent next year. Right. Now, the challenge will Marcus, be... Marcus Freeman is going to have to trust him. Right. He's going the, to have to trust him. The challenge will be one of the guys that will be in contention for that is still in high school, right? I mean, yes. in CJ yes. Carr. CJ Carr. L let me ask you this follow-up to this question, Sean, because th this – my answer was threefold. Number one is how does Kenny develop the rest of the year? That's number one. He, he's not ready. Yes. You've got to make a move. Yes. Number two, you have to be open about who is in the portal, yes. right? I mean – and then here's the third part is the, the the dynamic that has changed is the 12 team expansion for next year. Yes. Because you don't need to, we've got to do whatever There's we got no to do to win that AM game. Yes. Right. You could technically be 10 and 2 if you if if you're hot enough at the end to, for Notre Dame to get in. Yes. That matters to me as well. Is is the quarterback that we're going to bring in good enough to stunt the development of my young quarterbacks by a full year or not? Yes. And so it's got to be that kind of guy. That's the other dynamic too, because it's, which would be a little different if it was a four team playoff. Cause if the 14, play, Hey, I got to give us the best chance for the guy to get the best chance to win in September. Cause if Absolutely. we don't win in September, then it doesn't matter who we are in November. That's not necessarily true. Now, when you look at A&M being that first game, and then you've got Northern Illinois, Purdue, Miami of Ohio and Stanford the next five weeks. Mm -hmm. So even if you take an L against Texas A&M, if you really believe in this kid that he just needs that opportunity and give him five, six, seven starts and we could be, we could be dangerous, mm -hmm. you know, then, then, it, then it, it's, cause I got so look, Sean, they got to go to the portal next year for quarterback. The question is, is what type a new starter or a depth guy to, cause it could be a guy that's simple. It's like, Hey, you're going to be the guy until Kenny's ready. Right. That may be game one and maybe game three and maybe game five right. and maybe game six. Well, that was kind of the you plan with Jack Cone, right? Right. What's that? Wasn't that kind of the plan with yeah, Jack like Cone, you got with a, Tyler yeah, coming in? Kind yeah. of. Yeah. I mean, they knew he was going to beat Tyler out, though. But it's mm -hmm. similar. It'd be mm -hmm. if you had Tyler Buckner and let's say you also had I'm trying to think of a, a quarterback that you know they, they could have had <laughs> some of the offers they made. Good lord. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're 
Tyler Buck, two Tyler Buckners, right? <laughs> Which is kind of, mm-hmm. you know, at the time we all thought Tyler Buckner was going to be a you know, big time quarterback. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, let's just say kind of you had two of him in back to back years, which is more appropriate now because you've got Kenny and CJ Carr. Mm-hmm. So it's not just Kenny or just CJ. Because mm-hmm. this is the one guy you got to go get a dude that can can help you win football games. But my understanding is when they brought Jack in, yeah, Tyler's going to get a chance, but it was going to be Jack. I mean, it was yeah. this is a little different for me. This is more of a like, a, you know, hey, you, you've got to go out there and and um, and show me a little something because I got these young kids that are really talented and I'm really curious. Yeah. And then the other thing, too, is the overall dynamic the team is going to be very they're going to be a much more physically talented team next year but they're also going to be a significantly younger team next year. You know, so do you want to bring in a veteran quarterback for a really young team? That's an argument you can make. That's or an you can make, do I want yeah. to just kind of turn into the skid and let's go full young and maybe the light goes on and we've won enough games to where, you know, if we can't be at A&M, we got a chance for the next five weeks to win some games and get some confidence. And now, you know, so it's it's not an easy decision for this coaching staff. It's not, it's a tough decision. It just comes down to, you've got to figure out what gives your team the best chance to, to be competitive next year. uh, Not just in September, but in November. And And I'll, I'll say this B. um, And I'm just using this example. I want to get your feedback with the head coach being a defensive guy and the struggles that we've lamented with play calling and other things. I want to use the example of the decision Chip Kelly made. Chip Kelly had a filler guy that could have held the place until week five, six. But he made the decision early. You know what? Let me just get him ready. No. He's going to take some bumps once we get early on in the Pac-12 schedule. I already know that. You go watch that Utah game, that first road test, brutal, brutal. Come back and watch him against Washington State last week. Totally different quarterback. Right. That's that's a coach taking the responsibility to coach. Right. Like, I can sit back and play my three-year guy and not have to worry about certain things or – I can say, man, my team in the long run is going to be much better if I coach this kid up. Yeah. And he took that accountability and responsibility as a coach. So when we talk about Menchie and C.J. Carr, it is going to be on this stat to say, if that's the direction we go, we're going to have to coach. Right. We're going to have to coach much harder. All the if position groups, all the O-line, position you guys got to step yes. up. Receivers, you got to yes. step up. Running backs, you got to step up. Yeah. Yes. Yes, because we yeah. talked about it. I mean, heck, if Cam Ward in- enters the transfer portal, I wouldn't mind him coming to Notre Dame. I yeah, wouldn't. like Riley Leonard's the guy that I've talked about too. Riley right? Leonard? Like, Cam, my only issue with Cam Ward is that's a really big scheme jump for him. Mm-hmm. That's my only issue. Is, is that because you got to think about that because he needed a, a, a year to adjust going to Washington State. Would he need yeah. a year like that to? I don't know. Like r- the thing about Riley Leonard is we we know who Riley Leonard is, and this is part of the attractiveness of Sam Hartman is like you've seen Sam Hartman play against a lot of teams that are on your schedule, yeah, right. And, and so, yeah. uh, that the, the that's the thing for me, it's got to be, but it's got to be that kind of guy, Sean, right? It's yeah. got to be that kind of guy, it can't be like. Like I, I like Hudson Card. I'd have taken him this year. I've used this as an example, but I wouldn't take a player like him next year because yeah, he's talented, but he just doesn't have the. Ex- and when I use Hudson, it's because he has talent, but he doesn't have the experience. He hasn't played a ton of football. Yeah, it's got to be a guy that we know. And I think the Chip Kelly at UCLA example is a really good one because yeah. I think Chip Kelly also knows this. We're not a national championship football team this year, mm-hmm. but we've got a lot of talent and coming back that we can be. And Dante Moore is the kind of guy that I can build around and recruit to. Absolutely. You know, like, and, and, and he made that decision. And Do they so, make that? Here's the difference. Notre Dame's got two guys that you can think about with that. Where UCLA had one, it was Dante. If Dante wasn't ready, you were going with the older guys. Like there isn't like, 
that's the thing that for Notre Dame is it's it's part of it's like a concern, but part of it's like a like an excitement. Like, dude, you got two future potential studs in Kenny Minchie and CJ Carr. Yeah. Like, we are always forgetting yeah. about the guy that's already there because like when when we Notre Dame gets Deuce Knight, it's kind of like CJ who, like uh, that kid's still pretty freaking good, you yeah. know. And they get CJ Carr, and you're like Kenny Minchie who, uh, that kid's still pretty freaking good. Like, let's not yeah. assume that the next guy is going to beat it out. But that's where you want to be as a program is that you are. Where if Kenny doesn't pan out, you're not well. We're screwed now because we yeah. try. We decided to go like that's kind of what happened with Notre Dame last year. If Tyler Buckner yeah. didn't pan out, Notre Dame was going to be in trouble. Yeah, because Drew Pine was a great backup quarterback. That's all. That's what he was. That's what he was. Right. And and but you weren't going to be that team. Whereas like you go next yeah. year and you decide, hey, we're going to go with Kenny. Kenny's our guy. Yeah. Well, if Kenny doesn't get it done, you're not putting in. Brendan Clark or Drew Pine or something like that. You're so okay, CJ, your turn. Right. Let's, let's so go. it is not um like some people look, Jared Parker's not going anywhere. He's not. Like he's not going anywhere, right? He's just not. I I I think Jared Parker will be a better OC next year because physically Notre Dame will be more talented offensively. They're just – they're going to have more talent offensively next year. So if certain things you're going to see and you're going to be like, oh, man, they're better at this. Yeah, more talent. More talent. You know, they had to get Tyree to transition to wide receiver and do this and do that because they didn't have a guy that they could really do that at wide receiver. Next year, that won't be the issue. Yeah. They still got KK as a freshman that's red-shirting. That is that slot guy. Yep. Punt Jordan return Faison. guy. Right. Jordan Faison. Right. They're going to have more talent next year. Right? More speed and, for sure. Yeah. And you bring in Kedron Young next year. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, and Anise Williams. Williams. Right. right. Jeremiah Love. and Jadarian Most talented be, tackle on your roster is going to be enrolling next year. I mean, Jadarian you know. Jadarian is going to yeah. be a year. Because this is my belief. I think they're purposely trying to get Jadarian through this first year back yeah. without a heavy healthy. workload. They right. want him to be healthy. And I'm all for that. But one, give me five. Like his touches should have been what Jeremiah Love's touches were on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And then Jeremiah probably should have had a little bit more. Because like here's my thing is like mm -hmm. use those guys. Like here's the – they had the perfect strategy with the running backs against Ohio State. You rode Audric early. Then you brought the speed in to give him something a little different. And then you were about to – go to Audric again late and put it away as an 11-yard run, and then you kind of got yeah. a little too cute. But, like, that's what we should have seen against Louisville, the way they were playing the other day. And they were just <laughs> – use that speed to get outside a little bit. Yeah. You know, and um, and then bring the hammer back in. And they they just yeah. – it's been weird. It's just been weird. Like, forget, forget football. Like, for people that are talking about Jared Parker, just Notre Dame's not about to be paying two offensive coordinators. It's not happening. <laughs> Referring like, back to our previous <laughs> You know Notre Dame administration. They're not about to be paying. They wouldn't well, even pay the buyout to get yeah. The I hope he I hope want. he does well. I, I hope he figures it out. I do. I hope they find answers and it's not even a problem at the end of the year. I, I do because it's gonna mean we're gonna have a lot of fun the next month. Here here's a follow up question from Brian Felton. Sean, you want to know some interesting. Brian yeah. Felton and I were high school football teammates. That's what's so, up. Yeah, I haven't talked to him in a long I'm time. To, but, uh, give, him a, give Brian a call and yeah. get the, uh, the real stories. Yeah, go for it. Uh, <laughs> Brian Felton says, shouldn't the rest of the season be used to get Kenny Minchie ready and see what he's got? Here's my, why my answer is no. Number one is uh, you made a commitment to Sam Hartman, and Sam Hartman's not the reason Notre Dame is struggling. And, I, and Brian's not saying that. He's saying, like, your season's over. Mm -hmm. Like, to me, that – I've never been a fan of that, and here's two reasons why I'm especially not a fan of it with this team. Number one is you have a lot of kids that are veterans that this is their last chance. I want to see them go out with as many wins as possible. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, there's merit to playing Kenny. I understand. It's not a silly thing to say or a dumb thing to say. I get that notion because in some positions I am ready to make that move, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. But number one, you're gonna, you're, you're, you owe it to your, your current players and you owe it to Sam that as long as he's doing what he needs to do. Now, if Sam comes in this week and he's got a crap attitude and he's half-buttoning in practice and he he's checked out, then sit him. 
you know, sit him. And then he's, he's got to go, you know, but that's not where they're at right now. I don't believe with Sam Hartman. So you could, because the other mm-hmm. thing too is you still have a lot to play for folks. If mm-hmm. Notre Dame writes the ship with Sam beats USC this weekend, beats Clemson in three weeks. Okay. We're back on track here as a program looking at Notre Dame. You're now 10 and two. You've got a shot for a new year's six game against a big time program. There's still a lot to play for. For Notre Dame, yes, mm-hmm. they're five and two. We're disappointed. They're not going to be a playoff team, but it, it s- championship or bust should always be the to me the standard for what the goal is at Notre Dame. It's a championship, but it's not championship or bench everyone and get ready for next year when you're not playing for a championship anymore, because there's still momentum you're building towards next year. So, Brian, I would say the answer to this is yes at positions where it's close. You've got a veteran. He's kind of doing okay. But you got mm-hmm. this young guy that just needs to play more, right? Like, so you say, well, okay, then you should bench Cam Hart to play Christian Gray. But Cam Hart's playing great football right now. Mm-hmm. So wh- you're not going to do that, right? Because that's not fair to Cam. But if you're going to do that at quarterback, then you need to do that at, well, Joe Walt's probably not coming back next year. He's probably going to the NFL, so you're going to bench Joe Walt? And, because, like, that's where this goes, mm-hmm. right? So, so bench Zeke Carell for Ashton Craig, bench Joe Walt for whoever is going to come <laughs> back next year, right? Um, and I'm being, I'm, I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not, this isn't taking a shot at you, Brian. I'm just saying, like, if this is the standard you're going to set, then you need to set that standard for your entire team. And then the final point is good luck getting a transfer quarterback ever again if you make that move with a guy like Sam Hartman. Because it's different with UCLA. They they brought a kid in nobody had ever even really heard of from the MAC with the intention of you're going to be the quarterback until Dante Moore's ready. Mm -hmm. Good luck going – let's say Riley Riley Leonard does jump in the portal next year. Good luck trying to convince him to come be in front of Kenny Minchie and C.J. Carr if this is first time we – Stuff hits the road. We're going to bench in. We're going to put in the young guys. So, Brian, I, I'm I'm sympathetic to this notion, but I still think this team has a lot to play for. Now, if they lose to USC and Sam throws three more picks, yeah, and, and now you're going to point where like it's not even about the season's over. It's about is our quarterback play good enough for us to win football games? Then we can have a conversation about that. But it, can, it, it I just don't think we're there yet. Yeah. to be honest with you. And honestly, right now, if Notre Dame did make a quarterback change, my concern is that they'd probably put Steve Angeli in the game, not yeah. Kenny Minchie. And that's a different conversation for a different day, but yeah. And just to kind of piggyback off of that, you know, just to continue, look, it's funny because and you're a great example of this, a, probably a better example. 80% of the stuff that you say is 100% factual about Notre Dame football. The 20% that you don't say would probably get people to understand a lot of things. But it's a reason you don't say the 20%. So when we sit here with confidence that Jared Parker more than likely is going anywhere, it's because of knowledge of certain things that happened on the way to Jared Parker being hired. That kind of gives us the confidence. While fans are looking at, oh, the last three games and the record, Notre Dame just operates a certain way. So I can say with pretty much certainty, and Brian probably feels the same way. Jared Parker isn't going anywhere. Yeah, I mean, I'm just not uh, ready to have that conversation. I, unless, I want to see Jared Parker get ready for USC. I'm not even unless, at that point yet. Unless something yeah. dramatic happens, and like people are talking about, we can get a transfer quarterback and get his OC to come to Notre Dame. What? That's not how it works. That's not how it works. Like, what are we? Yeah. What what are we talking about, man? Like the same way you gave Marcus Freeman opportunity to get better. Jared Parker is a first year offensive coordinator. Deserves well, the same. Well, he's not. I mean, 
in the same position as Marcus Freeman is like. But it's still his first time in that role. He was not the play caller at West Virginia. He was not. He was the offensive coordinator name, but he was not the play caller. And he's seven games in. Seven games into Marcus Freeman's tenure, he was four and three with an ugly win over UNLV. Coming off that, it lost to Stanford and Marshall. Turned it around pretty good. If the issue is having some the similar issues kind of moving forward, right? Then, right. If if things don't change and get better, then we can have that conversation in the year. But it's just not really a conversation. Right. I, that's I, that's I, an, I it's another silly, have it's just another silly comment. The fact that you're comparing the way Notre Dame does business to the way Auburn and Oregon does business is right. laughable. Right. It's laughable. And it means that you don't know the school that you root for. Right. Go check the history of Notre Dame. That's all you have to do. Yeah. It's not happening. Here's another one, Sean. This is an interesting topic of conversation. I'm surprised it isn't being discussed more. Fighting Irish fan 91. Are we starting to see stamina, strength, toughness drop off during a season like we used to under Longo? Are we missing Bayless more than expected? This, bro, this this Bayless conversation has been very interesting to me because of the way things happened. And we have to take everyone at their word for what went down. But stamina and strength, and it happens with every college football team going through a college football schedule. Kids lose weight. Defensive linemen lose weight. Uh, Travis Hunter, like the prediction for me was, okay, if he's playing the first four weeks, if he's playing 120 plays a week, by the time he gets to, gets to week 9, 10, it'll probably be down to like 90. Just from attrition, like no one is able to play a full season without stamina, strength, yeah. And toughness being affected. Now, um, strength coaches have a huge role. In yeah. That. I mean, Sean, we heard it from 2017 on. Yeah. The last four years of the Brian Kelly era. We'd be sitting there. I'm, I, I remember sitting there at the NFL Combine with it was the year that Tony, it was 2020 NFL yeah. Combine with like Tony Jones. And it was like right before all the COVID stuff hit. And you'd ask Tony Jones and Chris Fink and these guys about Notre Dame and who had the biggest yeah. effect. And they'd all start talking about Matt Bayless. Yeah. Right. Like, oh, Matt Bayless did this. And look, now, I don't was know. It, let me ask you a question. Was it – was the Matt Bayless effect even more important because of the era Notre Dame had just come out of from a strength and conditioning coach? You know, when you Possibly. go from one extreme to the other yeah. – Possibly like, because all those kids played in 2016. Yeah, that we're, we're talking about, right? Possibly, yeah. but most of those kids only played in that for one year. So, like, we're mm. talking about like the the Tony Jones. Tony Jones only played for Paul Longo for a year, mm-hmm. and he spent the rest. It was just more about how there was a confidence that they were always going to win at home, and they're always mm-hmm. going to win in November because of Matt Bayless, because that's what he preached, mm-hmm. right? And so, I, I. Man, I, I'm sorry. I just have a hard time. We can in one – well, we – I don't speak for you because I'm not sure you pin on this. I can in one breath talk about the positive impact that Matt Bayless had throughout his tenure and how important he was and then just say, but what we're seeing right now has nothing to do with Matt Bayless not being here. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the things I was hopeful for, and I talked about it during – is like, look, he laid out the game plan for what the what it was going to be like during the season. Like, that had been decided already. But it's one thing to have the playbook. It's another thing to know how to call the plays, mm-hmm. right? Like, I could take Steve Sarkeesian's playbook, Lane Kiffin's playbook, and hand it to somebody and say, hey, call these plays. And he's not going to call them like like Sark, like Lane mm-hmm. Kiffin, and, and so forth and so on, right? And so, yeah, I think this is a big part of what we're seeing. And, and you'd always hear complaints from players during the summer, and I'd hear complaints from parents. <clears throat> they work us too hard in the summer. We're tired mm-hmm. and, and get to fall camp. But then it's like they drag a little bit fall camp. But there was a perp. There was a method to the madness, right? But then they would be, by the time they got to November, you're like, man, this team is fresh, mm-hmm. right? Because there was a there was a purpose to it. Right now, this team doesn't look fresh. I mean, it just – it doesn't. And 
they're gonna have to figure it out. I mean, they are. I mean, and and, and the other thing too is people have this like feeling like buys are magical, right? So buy weeks are this magical thing where during the buy week you give everybody uh, like fairy um, buy week dust, and you're good for the rest of the year. You're mm -hmm. healthy for the rest of the year. And and my answer to that is like Notre Dame had a bye week last year after the fourth game of the year. And by game six and seven of that, they were pounding teams coming out of the yeah. bye. Yeah. You know, I mean, their seventh game out of the bye, which was the 11th overall, was a 44 to nothing beatdown of Boston College. Mm -hmm. You know, so like buys don't reset you back to the start where you're just as fresh as you were the first day of fall camp you get a little bit rested but then you're back to the grind yeah and so uh, you know buys aren't fairy dust they don't all of a sudden magically make you better if notre dame had a bye week before they played louisville there's no there's no evidence that they would have all of a sudden come out against louisville and been better because it wasn't about they were tired they yeah. weren't, they didn't want to be there is the, is what their body language showed, Sean. I mean, there's a, there's a difference. You've seen, you, you keep using NBA references. There's a difference between when you're watching a shooter in the fourth quarter, he just has no legs. Yeah. There's a difference between that and the second half of that Phoenix Suns playoff game where Kobe Bryant was sending a message that he wasn't going to, he play. wasn't going to shoot a play. Yeah. Right. I mean, th there's a difference between those two things. Right. Yeah. And so, that's the concern I had about this. That's why I, I put in the message in the, the post game show or not the post game show, but the live chat, what I did right before kickoff was like, dude, I just, I am not loving the energy right now. There's yeah. a difference between that and they're tired. You don't know pregame if guys are tired because they're still going out there and, and all it. Isn't it, that it just, something it, it you gave down in the second half? What's that? Yes. Yeah. If you're tired, like energy yeah. and things like, Oh, let me, what do you think about this? Um, I was talking to Cam McDaniel last week, and he said um, the mental approach is just as important for coaches to pay attention. Yes, 100%. During, during practices. Yeah. Because he said it's been shown by studies, like mentally when you're not there, that's when injuries yes. happen in practice. And he well, said, mentally, you have to be also locked in to your team as well. Yeah, yeah. For execution, yeah. you start to see it. If you're not mentally locked in, yeah, it's why you've got to know what's going on with your players. Yeah, you've got to know if a guy's having problems with his girlfriend. Yeah. You got to know. You've got to know. Like midterms are not an excuse, but if you pretend like midterms aren't don't don't exist, mm -hmm. that's even worse. That's worse because yeah. you've got to you've got to have a plan for how to handle it. Right. And this is Marcus Freeman's third, second year as a head coach in Notre Dame, but it's his third year at Notre Dame. He was here in 2021. Right. And so you've got to know, hey, midterms, this is the problem and this is the plan that we got to have. So I'm just not sympathetic to some of those things about the midterm and about being tired because you knew you didn't have a bye week until after the eighth game of the year. You knew that you needed to plan accordingly to where your team didn't get wore down. It's why it was so important at the beginning of the year that you played more guys. And in some instances they did and other, under other instances, they did not. Mm -hmm. And, and we, you know, we talked about, it's not just about getting your backups in, in the second half. It's also about working some of those younger players in during the first half thing. We talked about this, right. And so all of that plays a role into this type of thing. So, you know, the, the mental part is a very important, Sean. It's like you, you, you don't just have a great week of practice. And then show up on Saturday and your guys aren't mentally there. Now, you may have a great week of practice from an execution standpoint. Go out on Saturday and don't execute very well. That happens all the time. I've I've joked, and this is a joke because it's it's true. Like I, I've had weeks, Sean, where we just had great weeks of practice. I mean, I mean, the ball seemed seemingly never hit the ground in our pass game. Yeah. And we go out there on Saturday and we couldn't complete a pass. It just and then there's been weeks where we couldn't go we couldn't complete 60 60 percent of our passes in rva routes on air and it's like dude we we, we suck like, just far just the execution during the week of practice was not good but mentally we're so pushing them and we go on saturday and just light you up so the execution thing sometimes you don't really know what's going to happen on saturday you do that you you practice you prepare but sometimes it's just it doesn't happen on saturdays now if it if it becomes a pattern then you're doing something wrong but like there's no way they just had the best attitude in the world Monday to Friday of this past week. And then on Saturday, it just showed up and they just didn't have anything. I just, I've never seen that before. 
So again, that comes down to what did you do as a coaching staff? Did you beat them down too much mentally? Did you beat them down too much? I mean, are, you know, again, sometimes, and this is what made Lou Holtz a master, you know, yes, he scheme was good and toughness and fundamentals and all that. But Lou Holtz was the master at the mental manipulation of his football team. And I use that in yeah. a positive manner. And the players will say it, man. Like we hated when we played like Navy or somebody that was bad. We hated it. Because coach was the whole staff, just all why? Because they know the film is not going to get you fired up and locked into the game this weekend, Sean. They yeah. know it's not that. No. But they also were like, but Miami week, man, it was a different deal. Why? Because they knew you didn't need the mental motivation of me constantly reminding you played Miami this weekend. They didn't need they didn't need me riding you. I had somebody tell me that during the week of practice for Ohio State, there were some things that were different. They were they, even more this and doing this. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's, that's, no, no, no. You did the opposite thing. You right. got too tense. You got too tight. Too tense. Yeah. And that's what Brian Kelly was like. His team's got so butt tight during big games because he was that way that they played exactly that way on Saturdays yeah. every time. You know, so, so that's the thing about Lou is Lou was like, hey, guys, and he would play the whole, we got no chance and, and this team is so great. And it's just like, and his guys were just ready. I mean, by the thing I said, they were ready to go, right? And and that's the mental part, Sean. And yeah. then there's the other mental part. If you got to know what your players are going through, this is why it's so important that the assistant coaches have relationships with their players beyond just football. I got to know this. This kid's got a mom who's got going through some stuff. This kid's got a girlfriend issue. Now you may say, "Hey, look, man, you're look. I know you got some girlfriend stuff, buddy, but I need you to be out here, you know. But you still need to be able to have that conversation because you know what's going on." You know what I mean? Like, I promise you, bro, you're not going to be missing her in a couple months or what, you know, or, you know, maybe it's advice like, hey, you know what? You guys need to sit down and talk. And, you know, I mean, you may really know how close he is. Like, because, you know, how some guys on the football team, Sean, is they date a girl for two weeks and they're ready to marry her. And then like every yeah. other week they got a new girlfriend that they're ready to marry and they're devastated when they break up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like, hey, man. Like, but then you may know, hey, this guy's been dating this girl since high school. Yeah. Right. And there's something going on like, you know, that's going to affect him because he's 21 years old. He's 20 years old. Right. And so those are all parts of it. But but bigger picture, it's about you've got to know where the psyche of your football team is and you've got to be able to adjust accordingly and know and what I they think need. To back your point up, there was there was a transfer out of the program last year. That literally was dealing with life circumstances that impacted his play on the field, right? And low-hanging fruit, once again, from fans, it's easy to turn on a kid, say negative things about a kid when he's not performing on the field. And you had no clue that he was dealing with certain life situations or changes in his life. And this is why I say relax to the fan base like critique we can critique be disappointed all of that but at the end of the day i encourage people send tobias a nice message right on social media when you show up saturday go crazy for this yeah. team because they need your energy it's real easy to sit back just be a normal low-hanging fruit fan criticize be mad that's that's easy but to take the next step and actually encourage these kids. That's why Sam Pittman, when he stood up for his team post game um, after they lost to Texas A and M, and told the reporters, "Yo, relax. You don't know what my young men are dealing with on a daily basis, and I'm not about to allow you to pile on them." Right. I applauded him as a head coach, and I wish most head coaches did that for their players. Because the fan bases have absolutely – I remember what college was like. And I didn't have to go play mm -hmm. and practice. And it was still a difficult transition for me, dealing with life. So I can only imagine what these kids go through. So not only are they trying to stay strong physically, but they're challenged to stay strong mentally on – and off the field. And Sean, and that, that's why Marcus Freeman does what he does during press conferences. As yeah. far as like not piling on, not like, well, you know, this guy's got to do this and this guy, you handle that stuff. You got to know that this guy's got my back. 
You right? have to. Now there also still has to be accountability, and it that's that's what makes this is a lot tougher than people think. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's the reality of it. And, and it was tough because of that. I'm sure it was super tough for Matt Bayless to make the decision he made. Yeah. Not just not because of the impact physically to these young men, what he was emotionally and mentally to a lot of these young men. Yeah. yeah. Somebody just said something too I want to address. Somebody said Marcus Freeman said today it was about execution. Isn't that blame on the kids? There, that's okay. That's fine. There, it's okay to say, hey, we got to execute better. You know, we got to do a better job getting push up front in the run game. That's different. That's that's not like my center's got to snap the ball in a hurricane. That's mm -hmm. different, right? DJ Brown's got to not miss tackles in space. That's throwing a kid under the bus, right? That it's okay to to create accountability, and this is what we we're we we're kind of getting to earlier, and we haven't gotten to that question mark yet or that question yet. But like, it's okay <clears> to say we can't turn the ball over. Right, like we, we can't turn, we can't put that ball on the ground. We that's 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 fine. There needs to be accountability for play. What we're talking about is like is coming out and saying like, why did you lose that game? Well, our offensive line went out there and just got their butts kicked all game, and and yeah. we couldn't get anything going, and so that's why we turned the ball over. That's throwing guys under the bus, right? Hey, look, uh, I'm not worried about play calling, and then say this, 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 which lets you know that yeah, there's some things that got to get fixed. There's accountability there, right? So there's a ways to do it, and so uh, to where it's okay to say we got to execute better. Mm -hmm. That that that's that's fine. That should be said. They do, as opposed to saying, well, you know, we played pretty good football on Saturday, with the exception of, you know, like I'll give you a perfect example. What Brian Kelly did after the Ole Miss game bothered me. These are the guys we have, fellas. We're, you know, like, I, I, it's like the, you know, like, that's like saying our kids suck. What do you want me to do? That's different than saying, hey, you know what? We got to play better. We're better than this. We got to, we got to execute yeah. better. We got to do this. That's not throwing your kids under the bus. That's saying, I yeah. demand more from them. They're yeah. better than this. That's different than Marcus Freeman saying, hey, guys, I don't know what you want me to do at receiver, okay? Wolf Fuller ain't coming through that door. Michael Floyd's not coming through that door. This is what we got. This is what we got to play with. That's basically you told, told everyone in the country, you think your receivers suck. And that's what Brian Kelly did last week after the Ole Miss game. He basically said, hey, fellas, I'm sorry. Our DBs suck. There's nothing we can do. It's not coaching. That's wrong. That's throwing players under the bus. Sitting there saying after a game that you turned the ball over five times and had stupid penalties and saying, we got to execute better. That's accountability. Mm -hmm. right so i understand the question and it's a fair rebuttal that came from um i think major uh major pain asked that question mm -hmm. it's a fair question but there's a difference in that regard in my opinion all right got a, still got a ton more man brandon plinster thank you for tapping in plinster i'm sorry and MF literally went on to say in the PC, we may know what USC is going to do, but we still have to stop it. It's the same thing with us. It comes down to execution. So basically, even with 11 in the box, just execute. Now, I don't think that's quite the same thing, um, but I understand the point. I mean, at the end of the day, it still does kind of come down to that to a degree. And that's why I say this is where the players got to kind of have. They, if players are pointing the fingers at coaches, this is a weak-minded football team. It, it just is. And it doesn't mean that they're necessarily wrong. If they, if the player's like, dude, that was a stupid third and one play call. Okay. It was, well, but if that's what you're, if that, but if that's what you're saying, it's like, okay, but what about the guy that did this? What about the guy that did, what about the play that you didn't make two plays before that would have made it to where you weren't even in a third and one. That's Absolutely. what I'm talking about. Absolutely. Right. So like we talk about the fourth and one, uh, sneak that didn't work and that was a bad play call but if you're looking at the coach and saying why are you sneaking sam hartman there as a player it's it's for me to say it's fine it's different i'm not a player i'm yeah. i'm an analyst but if i'm a player saying that's like well hold on it, like let's i'm gonna use audric estimate as an example because i don't think audric would be this way so i'm just using an example and and i have no evidence this happened this is a hundred percent made up example if audric estimate told me after the game that man, we lost because on fourth and one, they didn't give me the ball. 
on fourth and one. I'd have said, well, they gave you the ball in third and two and you made the wrong cut. Yeah. Right? Like, I want Audric Estime to say, man, it shouldn't even come to that fourth and one. I should have made the right cut on that third and two and we're not even in this situation. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So, like, that's – when you've got that going on at the player level, that's when you know you got something. Players under Brian Kelly knew that he wasn't going to do things they needed to do, but they're like, doesn't matter. We're going to go do what we need to do because it doesn't matter if they call this play because this guy can't this guy can't guard me. There was a level of sometimes even a, a confidence level that that was probably beyond what the the talent they actually had. To be yeah. honest with you, you know. But um, I just look at it and say, if that's what you're doing, if the players have lost confidence in the coaches. Um, you have bad leadership. And you have bad character from a player standpoint. And it's not even about whether they're right or wrong. It's about, I don't want you focusing on that. Yeah. If you played the perfect game and I made a bunch of bad calls and we can blame, we can blame this. I'll take it and I'll quit. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll step, I'll, I'll go resign. If you can show me that you did it, you guys did everything right in this game. <clears throat> I will offer my letter of resignation right now. Yeah. That's not the case. Yeah. It's like, was the play call to throw the go route on, on the fourth play of the game, a good call to Rico Flores. No, I didn't like that call. Does Rico, does Sam need to throw a better ball? Yeah. Does Rico need to fight for the ball better? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right. So uh, if, if you're in Rico Flores does not strike me as the kind of guy that would come off the sideline being like Sam threw a bad ball or why'd you call that play? I think he's probably yeah. thinking I got something. He'll, job. he'll learn. He'll right. learn. He just strikes me as the kind of kid. that's just, that's how he's just like, dude, I, that's on me. Mm-hmm. Right. Just strikes me as that kind of kid. Um, I could be wrong, but he just does. But if that's what you're doing as a player, you have a terrible culture from a player level. I don't care. I don't care what the coaches do. Just like I hate when coaches are like, man, I made all the right calls, but the players didn't execute. Really? Yeah. Real, really? That's your takeaway? Yeah. I told Sean the only time I ever almost got in a fight as a coach with another coach was when we were in a staff meeting and co- the O-line coach is like, hey, guys, just know it's not us in the room. We're doing what we need to do. It's them. Yeah. Dude, I'm – I um I went off, I went off, and um, you can't be either of those. Great football team, Sean. Yeah. When things don't go right, the first thing I do is look in the mirror. You what have do I got to do to be better. You have to. Yeah. You have to, and look on the surface, like you said, this statement. Yeah, I rock with it, but you literally came in against Ohio State with a run game that went totally against your tendencies to go directly against what their linebackers do. That's why you came in running the two running back system Mm -hmm. because they neutralized the aggressiveness of the downhill linebackers at Ohio State. So what are we talking about? Ohio State had no clue you were coming with that. Now, because they're smart players, they finally adjusted to it right. late in the game. Right. But you caught them off guard with it. Right. It was so similar to what we were praising Louisville for doing early in the game against Notre Dame with the, the shovel stuff. The or shovel the, stuff. The pitch stuff. The yeah. pitch stuff, yeah. It's like that's what your job is. So, yes. They were just smart surface, enough not to go back to it in the third and fourth quarter. <laughs> right. On the surface, <laughs> no yes. USC is going to know what Notre Dame wants to do. Notre Dame is going to know what USC wants to do. Right. But there are certain things that you can't coach and that are not on that play sheet. For USC, the things that 13 can do off script, that's not on the play sheet. I mean, it's not. You can't account for it. You just have to have players on your defense make plays to counter that, whether it's standing covers longer, chasing him down and getting him on the ground. That's football, right? Notre Dame, unfortunately, doesn't have that. So, yes, you're going to have to present things to USC that makes it look like, yeah, we're doing exactly what you think we're doing. But we're really not. We're going to get you with a couple of plays, some cheap yardage, cheap first downs with you thinking we're doing what we usually do. And that's what you're supposed to do as a coach. That's just part of it, you know. And that's why, that's part of the reason why the offensive line looked so good against Ohio State because they were given something that neutralizes 
what the other team is really good at. Wow, you put your offensive line in good position instead of just asking them to man up and beat the other team for four quarters. You don't do that. You know, you coach to put your players in advantageous situations. They did that against Ohio State. They did a really good job of doing that against Ohio State. You know, a couple of fourth down conversions here or there what drives are still going. You probably have points on the board in the first half. And the game is probably different, but that's the, it didn't go that way. So, look, I think we said it three hours ago <laughs> during the show. Man, dude, you ha I don't care how good your players are. It's your job as a coach to put them in advantageous situations. Mm -hmm. That's your job. It's not your job to roll out the balls, as they say in the NBA, and just tell you guys, go ahead. We got talent. No. You have to coach. Matter of fact, great players more than likely would like to be coached harder. They yeah. want to be pushed. Yeah. So... All right, let's keep rolling along here, Sean. Here's a here's a here's a good one here from Brian Hockney. We can kind of answer this one pretty quickly. <laughs> uh, Coach Devine said there are two kinds of people in this world: Notre Dame lovers and Notre Dame haters. And quite frankly, they're both a pain in the head. <laughs> Do you agree? <laughs> I think I think most Notre Dame fans are not that way. There are some, sure. Every fan base has them, but it's like I was at the Louisville game and and a guy comes up to me. He's like, you know, Notre Dame fans are the best. So gracious. And it's just like, yeah, I get that all the time. I get that all the oh, time. Heck yeah. For the most Every part. fan base has their idiots on Twitter and social media and message boards. We They all have them. Like, I, I don't know the context of that. I, I, Dan Devine coached at Notre Dame half his career before I was born. I mean, he was yeah. gone and I was two when he was no longer Notre Dame. I don't know the context of that, but I mean, I get frustrated at some Notre Dame fans that are just like, I'm not paying attention the rest of the year. Oh, well, if that's what you're going to say, then, you know, come on, guys. You know what I mean? How big of a fan are you? They're five and two and ranked in the top 25. I'm frustrated as heck that they're five and two right now. Yeah. But I'm just going to, I'm not going to write any more articles this week because I'm just so mad and I don't support this team. Like, you know, but that's such a small portion. Of yeah. Notre Dame fans. Yeah. I mean, at points in time in this chat, we had 600 people in the chat. Why? Because they love Notre Dame. They want to be here. Yeah. You know, so. And you realize it's something that you gave me, Jules, early on when I started with Irish Breakdown and eventually um, started doing Lucky Lefty. Um, look, man, I love the interaction with Notre Dame fans. I love the chat. But at the end of the day, I can't be upset with the, the emotions of Notre Dame fans. I can't tell you how to feel. That, and that about, passion is why we have the jobs that we have. Yeah, I can't tell you about your feelings about Saturday night. I can't. You know, we can have a discussion about the, the feelings and what I see and what you see. But I'm never going to tell you not to feel the way you feel yeah. about your team. Like, please. Man, get through it the way you have to get through it. See, I'm Sean? happy because the next day after most Notre Dame games is church. Yes. It helps me out a lot. I'll I'll say this, Sean. If Notre Dame fans had the proper view of where football should rank and the list of things going on in our world right now, you mm -hmm. and I'd be driving trucks for a living mm -hmm. right now. So I'm not going to sit there and say that, that that passion is a problem because that passion is why we have people, hundreds of people in these chats and, si and thousands mm -hmm. of people signed up on the message board and why we had over a million page views last month and over 600,000 downloads on our podcast last month and all that because of that passion. Mm -hmm. Well, passion sometimes is going to get people to say things that you look back, you're like, yeah, I probably shouldn't have said that. It's okay. I do that. You know what I mean? Like, um, so I, I, I love Notre Dame fans because they are a very unique breed. That doesn't mean I'm going to agree with everything they say. And when I do have chastisements, it's done in love because mm -hmm. 
you know, but but I, I, if I didn't love the Notre Dame fan base, honestly, Sean, I'd go find a better like a, a fan base that was less that did have a lower standard for what excellence is, right? If I if I if I didn't appreciate that, I'd I'd say, you know what, man, I, I don't like the fact that so many Notre Dame fans expect championships. I'm gonna go cover Virginia football. Yeah. Right. I I, yeah. I love it. I, I love that most Notre Dame fans do want Notre Dame to be different. In some way, yeah. What different means is going to vary from fan to fan, but no, I, I do, and I'm not just saying that because, you know, it's Sean. You know this. It's what I really believe, you know, because it can frustrate you sometimes. And I wish people would just not be that way about this particular thing. But yeah, at the heart of it is a love, and that's the one. That's why I don't like a lot of politics in our show. I don't allow because it's the one thing is that I may be a Republican, you may be a Democrat. I'm not a Republican, by the way. I may be from the South, you're from the North. I may be from, you know, this place and that place. I may be this faith, uh, you know, you're that faith. But at the end of the day, what's the one thing we have in common? Love Notre Dame. Football. Love, the, love Notre Dame football. Yeah, and that's the one thing that can always be unifying. You know. Beautiful thing. Crying belly. Actually, man, I like to say this because crying supports. I know IP, he definitely supports CFB Nation as well. Uh, you have one of the best names, my brother. That crying belly is hilarious every time I see it. Is it at all concerning that Freeman's first comments had to do with turning the ball over on offense? I get the ball security is important, but 70% of his comments on offense are about turnovers. I mean, that. If I think people talk about that's, that's at the core of his beliefs, yeah, about how games are won and lost. I mean, well, and, there, and there's a lot to that in this game, Sean. Yes, I mean, you get the ball in the first drive of the game, you complete a four yard pass, second and ten, second and four, you get a 10 yard pass, you get a mm -hmm. 15 yard pass, you got first and 10 on your fourth play of the game, you're already in Louisville territory, and you throw a mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that that's a that's a problem. You go into the second half. Right. And it's it's seven to seven. You've tied the game up. You've got some momentum. Your defense just forces a three and out. It's like your third straight three and out in a row. And you get the ball in Louisville territory at the 45 yard line facing the third and one and you fumble the football. Right. Like, yeah, that stuff matters. That stuff absolutely matters. Now, now, my frustration for uh, for coach would be that's why your fourth and eleven call was such a bad one for me because that's a coaching turnover, mm -hmm. in my opinion. What you did there was a coaching. That's the equivalent of, of Sam Hartman throwing into triple coverage. You flinched, right? Because it's twenty four thirteen. Your defense was still doing the things you you know to help maybe keep you in the game. He talked about having enough possessions, bro. You need two possessions. There's nine minutes and forty nine seconds left in the game. Like if there was like three forty nine left, I'd have been like, you know what? Yeah, I get, I get you, I get you. You got to do what you got to do. There's <laughs> nine minutes and forty nine seconds left in the game. It's way too early to be worried about possessions. It's a two possession game. If they score there, it's a three possession game, and now it's definitely over. Right. Right. So no turnovers absolutely played a huge role in that football game. Now, did they have five? From the standpoint of five causing them to lose, no, because they the last interception was thrown at the end of the game when it was over. Yeah, you know, like you know, there was a minute and a half left. They just recovered an onside kick, I believe, if I remember correctly. And you still needed two scores in a minute and a half. The the, the odds of you doing anything at that point in time were 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 not good. But yeah, the the turnovers in that game absolutely played a big role in that game. There's no doubt about it. There's no yeah. doubt about it. So I think I think sometimes as fans, and this is the beautiful thing about the fandom, kind of connected to what we just talked about previously. Um, certain things stick out to me in watching the game, and I'll talk to Brian, and he'll want to talk about something else that stuck out to him. And if we all get together, we'll all we will all have five or six totally different things that stuck out as the major issue of that game and they're all part of the reason why things went the way they went now from a perception one is more important to me one might be more important to brian and one might be more important to you guys in the chat but either way to marcus freeman as the head coach he comes back he watches film 
And this is what he wants to start out with. Yeah. I mean, this is because like crying belly says this one to note that obviously five turnovers is bad, but the offense sputtered pathetically turnovers or no. And I'm like, not really, because again, the two turnovers we just pointed to were, were made were in drives. Louisville territory. Yes. Right now they weren't deep into Louisville, but they, you had clearly done something to put a drive together mm -hmm. to get going. So you could say, well, you know, like the 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 first the first drive I talked about, right? They'd are they made some plays. They got the ball at their own twenty five. They made some plays to get into Louisville territory, just like that, right? Second drive, you sit there and say, "Hey, look, um, you know, y your offense was sputtering a little bit, right? You got aided a little bit by the fact that they had a that they had a um, a penalty, but it's kind of like, but whatever the case, you had just completed a ball." You had mm -hmm. just done some things to get into a third and one situation. You're in Louisville territory. You turn, you don't turn that ball over right there. You get one yard and don't turn that ball over. All of a sudden, you know, Notre Dame's got a field goal. Well, now at late in the game when it's 24, 13, maybe it's instead it's 24, 16. And there is no Marcus Freeman going forward on, on third, and, you know, third and, or fourth and 11. Right. So yeah, turnovers matter because turnovers, especially in those instances, they were all turnovers where it was like, they shouldn't have happened, right? I've, I've said this before. You, I think my concern, one of my concerns with Marcus Freeman is, I can, I, I'm concerned he has a little bit of too much of Brian Kelly in this regard. Brian Kelly made turnovers to be such an awful thing mm -hmm. that players were so afraid to, and coaches were so afraid to make certain calls on offense, or players are certain, you know, Ian Book was afraid to make certain throws on offense because the reaction to turnovers was so stark. Yeah. Right. You yeah. can't be that way. Yeah. Turnovers are going to happen, and and I'm and I'm okay with turnovers. As far as okay, meaning like I can live with it. I'm never yeah. happy you turn the ball over. Yeah. More so interceptions, fumbles kind of always bother me. They just they just do. Yeah. Uh, but turn uh, interceptions sometimes are going to happen. Hey, it's third and nine. I took a shot. We were at midfield, and yeah. okay, it is what it is. But when you when you fumble a ball on third and one in Louisville territory, that's a problem for me because that's kind of close to the territory Marcus Freeman might have wanted to think about. Let's go for it here, you know. But see, that's also my whole thing is you, here's the other issue of it though, Sean. Is you could say, hey, look, that's who he is. But here's the other thing: he always says we're an offensive line driven team. You had second and one. You threw a pass. You tried this trick run play on third and one and fumbled the football. You're an offensive line driven team. You line up and run the freaking football. You know what I mean? To your running backs. Now, it doesn't mean you go 14 personnel like they did on that first and 10, but, you know, line right. up and spread and do do something, you know, run the ball, right? Because that's the thing is like, and sometimes Marcus Freeman coaches to what he says he believes in, but then other times you're like, but that's not really who you say you are. And yeah. I think that's still the learning process that he's going through as a, as a. It's, it's as funny a because I don't look, our coach didn't, I remember coming up, high school our coach never had a problem with and most nba coaches preach this as well turnover turnovers are going to happen but we can't have live ball turnovers that lead to points for them right if you throw the ball throw a bad pass it goes out of bounds and we have a chance to get back on defense and set our defense that's okay things happen but just a bad mistake that leads to a 301 going the other way, and they end up with an open three or something. Right. Now you talking about basketball, they, right? Yeah. So you're basically proud. saying, like, if you really try to fit that pass in the baseline, and boy, you know, yeah. hey, you know, but yeah, but it's nothing that's just lazily like throw a cross court pass yeah. and the guy picks it off and runs it back and dunks it for two. Yeah. Now the crowd is right. into it. Now we're trying to come back against a loud crowd and score on offense and communicate. Right. Now things are complicated. It was and they can set up their press now. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, football, yeah. I look at it. Chris, to me, Chris Tyrese drop pass, that was a turnover. That's a turnover mm -hmm. in my eyesight. Technically, that's not a turnover, but that's six points. You just gave up six right. points, right? Can't do that on the road against good team. Sean. We get a big pass. We get a big pass. Blake Fisher gets a penalty. Now the crowd gets into it, and we're behind the chains when we were just 40 yeah. yards down the field. That's a turnover. Yeah. Might not be technically, but as far as the game momentum. Ex you want to know why Marcus Freeman said we got to execute better? It's all that stuff right there. Mm -hmm. The inter first interception, execution. The fumble, execution. The 30-yard 
play that got taken back because of the Blake Fisher penalty. Execution. False starting on third and one that yeah. backs you up. Execution, right? Yeah. Uh, all those – Chris Tyree not catching that pass. Execution. Sam Hartman sailing a, a, an over route. I think it was Rico Flores over his head. That's execution, so he's right? He's wide like, open, yeah. Right. Those are all things that are uh, – O-linemen letting guys come. Those are – and that's the whole point for all the stuff about they weren't mentally ready to play, blah, 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 blah. What, what was the manifestation of it? It wasn't, it, it, that's exactly what it was. Yeah. If you're and not all locked it, in mentally, those things against good teams, those things will they, happen. They beat you. And that's what will get you beat. It's that and right those, there. Two of those plays, he just named five or six. They execute two of those plays. They, we're talking about a one possession game in the fourth quarter. And, and to your point, too, Sean, it may be where Notre Dame has the lead in the fourth quarter. Absolutely. Because if Notre Dame, as bad as Notre Dame played in the first half, if they have a yes. lead going into halftime, and then you force that fumble from Cam Hart, and then you go put it in the end zone, that's another one. That's another missed opportunity where yeah. you could, that's, you know, to me, that's like your basketball scenario. I intercept that pass, I go down, and I lose the ball as I'm going up the dunk. Yeah. You know, like, you, you get those chances and you just can't, you can't fail to capitalize. And it was, yeah. it, 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 look for Mark, we got to execute better. Yeah. If they execute better in that game for all the other stuff we talked about, they win that football game, Sean, they just yeah. do. You yeah. said they execute on 40% of them. They, it's a one possession game. That's a low percentage on those plays. That's all it takes. That's yeah. all it exactly. takes. Against good teams. And, and that goes to, that's why the margin for error for better teams, for more talented teams, is what it is. They don't have to play their best to win the game. Louisville needed the energy from the crowd, the atmosphere, Notre Dame to play below the level of their talent, and scheming from Jeff Brom to win that game. They needed all of that. They needed all of that. And Notre Dame, with two big plays, they're right there in that game. As bad as they play. As bad as they play. That's – that's. got another super chat here, Sean, that kind of is a little bit about something we talked about, but I did want to – Thank you, SB. Uh, Mark Freeman justifies some of the third down calls with a we just have to execute. How long until the players just lose confidence? I'll argue is poor management to ask people to do the near impossible. I I, I have uh, I, that is like just to me so far off of reality. I well, mean, I think you said you know to focus on one excerpt from uh, the press conference without listening to the rest of his press conference right. and the other things that he touched on. He went a little bit further than we just have to execute. I mean, and, and and I don't know, like it's poor management to ask people to do the near impossible. I, look, we've we argued, Sean, earlier in the show that they're not putting guys in the best position to play, but that's a long way away from that, right? Like the third and one was a bad call, or the third and one that on the handoff was a bad call. Yeah, but handle the snap. It's now the second time teams crashing off the edges caused you to make a big mistake. Like you got to yeah. fix that. And and failure to execute. Here's another thing: failure to execute. When you ever, if you ever listen to the things Marcus Freeman says, Marcus Freeman does not view execution as a player only problem. No, he has said plenty of times that it's our job to get them in position to where they can execute. Yeah. If guys aren't executing because they don't know how to get off the line of scrimmage, they're not executing. Players yeah. aren't executing on release moves. But who who's responsible? All ultimately, when that continues, it's the position coach. Right. So um, I don't think that's a player only thing, but I, I just um, some of the some of the third down calls were bad calls. But I've said this before, man, this isn't just something new today. Sometimes you're going to make calls in a football game that aren't perfect. Like if if you require your coach to make the perfect call all the time, then you're going to be disappointed. Yeah. You, you just will. There were some calls Jeff Brown made on Saturday. You're like, why are you running that right there? You know, it's like third and one and you're running a jet sweep. Why? Yeah. Why? You know? But the, the the point is, is like if the I'll say it again, if the players are losing confidence because the head coach in a game after they had the penalties, they had the missed tackles, they had the missed. So it's Jared Parker 
is an idiot. And so Chris Tyree dropped that ball because he had no confidence in Jared Parker. If that was true, and I don't think that's true because I don't, that's not who Chris Tyree is. But if that were true, then he can't play for me. If if Blake Fisher goes to a guy's face mask, negating a 30-yard penalty, a 30-yard play, because yeah. he doesn't have faith in the coaches, you can't play for me. You don't have yeah. the mental toughness to play for me if that's causing you to fail to make mistakes, right? I mean, those are not coachable mistakes. When the whole, entire offensive line is catching, that's coaching. Yeah. Yeah. That's coaching. When when the offensive line fails to recognize over and over a mistake, that's coaching. Right? When a player blows a assignment, that's a blown assignment on that particular play. You don't overreact to it. You know, there's certain there's certain mistakes you you live with and certain mistakes you don't as a coach, right? Yeah. But if the players are losing confidence in the coaches and and that's causing them to play this way, then it's that's a them problem. That's a them problem 100%. Because there's plenty that I can point to to say, hey, look, bad calls or not, if yeah. you play better there, that works. You win that football game. That's yeah. true against Ohio State. The, we said the third 19, it's a bad call. But I've also said this. If Ramon Henderson plays that play, the same exact way D.J. Brown played the backside seam route, it's a ball game. It's fourth to 19, yeah. and yeah. Notre Dame's going to win that football game. Yeah. So I don't like to call, but you got to execute. you got to execute it. I didn't like Al Golden justifying the call at the end of the game and then saying, yeah, but we need to execute. I didn't like that. I didn't right. like that because you need to own your part in it. But the players need to own their part in it too. Yeah. And um, and, 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 let, and I think they will. I don't, I don't, I think fans, and I've said, I think fans tend to project their own feelings about things yeah. on, like every time Notre Dame loses a game, okay, the whole class is going to decommit now and it never happens. Yeah. Right, yeah. like Miami goes on the road and loses to flipping Georgia Tech on one of the worst calls I've ever seen. That same weekend, they flip the receiver from Georgia. Yeah, who's really good, Nikar. Yeah. Right, kids do. Kids don't have the same emotional attachment to the program that we do as fans because CJ Carr hasn't been loving Notre Dame since the minute <laughs> he came out of the womb. Right. Cam Williams doesn't have the same love that you and I have maybe over 45 years of being fans of Notre Dame. They're right. looking at it differently. They're yeah. going to look at, hey, man, if I'm on the field that day, I'm going to make that play. We're going to beat that ranked team. If I'm at Notre if, – if you're if you're a safety at Notre Dame, you're not thinking, man, what a stupid play call. You're thinking, if I was a safety in that play, I'd have laid that dude out or stepped yeah. in front of it, and we're winning that football game. It's not like they went out and got to be 40 to nothing, folks. Right? So – you know, it's the same thing here. It's like we are projecting our emotions and frustrations with coaching onto the players. Yeah. If the players feel that way, then Notre Dame has much bigger problems than who the offensive and defensive coordinators are. Yeah. Much bigger problems. That tells me Marcus Freeman does not have the locker room and that it goes way beyond play calls. Sure. Yeah. I way think play calls. It's like the me, rapture happening over there. It's no, like, the light, the sun is like literally coming through the window <laughs> now this time of day. You know, it's crazy. <laughs> but you know, I don't have a problem with the question. I, the, you know, big picture, um, I understand what Marcus Freeman is saying. Big picture, without mm -hmm. the nuance of oh, this play here, this play there. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, because I've been raised like this, and um, we honor um, men and women who have served this country for doing the near impossible for, for, for centuries. Landing on the beachhead in North, that was near impossible. And we're here today because it was done. That's what the armed forces are all about. Even on the football field, if they don't execute, they have no chance of winning because they don't have the talent to win. Their lifestyle is all about execution. So big picture, you know, being disciplined will give you the opportunity to do some near impossible things in your life. If you're disciplined enough. But the nuance of it is something I understand that the fans will be like. Yeah, you know, it's a 10 in the box. We only got five offensive linemen with a tight end and a running back and a quarterback. We probably need to do something else. So from a nuanced standpoint, I under, understand that as well. But, you know, big picture, I think football coaches 
a lot of sports coaches in sports ask their their players to do the near impossible in preparation. I mean, that's shoot. You know what's run impossible? These, run these gassers, run these stairs, come down and practice. Like you're asking me, my yeah. body's about to, you're asking me to do the near yeah. impossible. Asking but, Tennessee State's players to go out there and do things to beat Notre Dame is the near impossible. Asking Notre Dame players to execute against Louisville is not the near impossible. It's called, that's why you're on scholarship at Notre Dame. End of the day. But I mean, I understand what fans are saying from like from a nuanced standpoint on this play, this formation. Sure, against but see, the thing is, Marcus Freeman said that he that he said, "Look, yeah. look, if if, yeah, yeah. if we can't do this, then we shouldn't be calling that play." Mm-hmm. So it was it went both ways. Mm-hmm. It's the near impossible thing that kind of gets me a little bit. It's like I'm just hey, like, Navy I, Navy walked into Notre Dame Stadium a few years back and did the near impossible. Had lost 40 something straight. Had years. lost 40 something straight to Notre Dame, but they did the near impossible. I mean, you, 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 that's why you do what you do. That's why you go out there and compete, no matter what the challenge is. You go compete. That's all I asked Pat Coogan, Zeke Carell, and the interior of that offensive line to do against Ohio State. I know what you're going up against. All I'm asking you to do is compete. You don't have to be perfect. Against them, just compete, and that's exactly what they did. And them competing and playing their butts off gave Notre Dame a chance to win that game. Yeah, that's it. That's it. There's no way you can. It's 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 almost nearly impossible to to dominate that that Ohio State defensive line. To ask the, any offensive line in the country yeah. to do that. Before Michigan's four. about the only it's, team that's been able to that's, do it. That's been able yeah. to do it. So. You know, I look. I mean, I'm sorry, man, because this is not tapping into me. Like, you know, my belief system. It's like, yo, what I've just gone through. It's like, man, you can't. Don't talk to me about impossibilities. Don't talk to me about blessings. Don't talk about to me about overcoming challenges. Everybody watching in the chat, you can overcome anything you want to overcome, man. It takes belief. It takes belief. It takes commitment. And these players, that, that's why these players and this coaching staff, that's why they practice every day. That's why they're practicing now, because they believe they can beat USC. We might not feel that way coming off Louisville. They better they, believe it. They believe it. Yeah. That's all that matters. They better. They believe That's the key. They better. That's it. I hope they and, they and when they take the field Saturday, it's on them. It's not on us. It's on them. To show and prove. And that's it. And no one knows what the outcome is going to be. But those young men, yep. they have it in the palm of their hands. They that's get right. to decide what happens Saturday night. Because, Sean, the thing is, is like we spent a lot of time questioning play calls at the end of the Ohio State game. Mm-hmm. But I'll say again, if you execute the call plays that were made, DJ has mm-hmm. a pick, Ramon might have a pick, and the game's over. Right. So so if, if the players have that mindset, then that's a them problem. That's a them problem. End mm-hmm. of the day. And and I, I and I don't think that they're the, I don't think that's what this team is. That's the other thing is all, that I think that th- my point was this is fans projecting our feelings about the coaching staff onto the players. We do that mm-hmm. in recruiting too. Every time their name loses, well, pff, everybody's gonna decommit now. Mm-hmm. No, that's you, that's not them, right? I mean, Manti Teo commits to Notre Dame despite his official visit taking place in a game where fans were throwing snowballs at the Notre Dame players and they lost to a really bad 2-9 and Syracuse team, right? Like, Notre Dame signed the best recruiting class they've had in the last 25 years. They signed mm-hmm. after the year that they went 3-9. and nine. Mm-hmm. Players, players and fans are different. Recruits and fans are different. We need to stop projecting our frustrations onto them. But if he is correct and they do lose confidence, that's not that's not on Jared Parker now. Golden, that's on the leadership mm-hmm. of the uh, from a player level. Mackenzie Kelly, thank you for the super chat. Offense not working. Run bootleg left with right handed quarterback. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. <laughs> I feel you. Did it last week too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stephen F., thanks for the super chat. Why did they not give Freeman an experienced OC? 
I mean, we, we spent a lot of time on this, Sean. I mean, yeah, I mean the whole buyout we, thing, you can blame it on – Notre Dame blames it on the Utah AD – I mean, the Utah um, – Andy Ludwig's agent. You know, other people blame it on Notre Dame. It was a, it was a, it was a cluster, you know what, no matter what. And once that went through, Jared, you know, Jared Parker was the the guy. Marcus Freeman immediately went to it, right? Yeah. And and again, he hasn't done well the last couple of weeks. But here's a, three weeks ago, people were talking about how Jared Parker was like, man, this is great. This is such a best <laughs> offense we've seen in a long time. And you know, he's got to he's got to get better, right? But he's shown yeah. some chops at times to do the job. He's got to do better, and we're going to find out this weekend, right? Yeah, it um, is. Uh... You're right, bro. You're right. It is um, something I continue to say. You know, look, once Marcus Freeman accepted the terms, a, a job has to be done. That's it. Go do the job. It's no different than anybody else taking a job where you might have wanted 95000 as your salary and they said we can only give you eighty five, And you have to work a few weekends a month. If you accepted those terms, knowing that's not what you wanted, then hey, do the job until something else comes along, until you have another opportunity to make a change. Do the job and get the job done. That's it. That's it. It's like, I'm tired of hearing about Jack Swarbrick. Like I talked all summer about Jack Swarbrick. Disappointment, what I heard, things that happened. Makes no sense to blame the agent. Yeah, I'm sure the agent didn't want his his 15% or 10% of that buyout. Well, what they said was is that he gave Notre Dame the wrong numbers at first. Yeah. Okay, but again, that's that's stuff you got to make sure you figure out beforehand. You get the number, you go, hey, look, just make sure this, this. Oh, hold on a second. Now, that's not right. No, hold on a second. Let me hold on. Let me send this to you. Let me double check this. Right. Like Sean, you and I have been in conversations where when we were, I sent you a contract. It's like you look through it. We talk through it. Oh, shoot. Hold on a second. Actually, matter of fact, this happened with the CFB Nation guys. Yeah. I sent them a contract and I had, there was like one thing that they weren't clear about how the money got split up. So they let me know. I redid it, sent it back to them. That's what you do. Hey, just make it clear. So just so we're close, this is just so we're clear. And, and you and I did this when we signed a contract. I sent you a contract. The numbers were correct, but you went, okay, just so I'm clear, yeah. this is what I'm doing. If we do this, this is what we make. If I do yep. this, this is what we get, right? Just so we're clear. Oh, shoot. Actually, Sean, no, it's not actually supposed to be that. Now that you say that, that's actually supposed to be this, mm-hmm. right? That's, you know, so. But at the end of the day, as I said before, none of the things Jack Swarbrick did having to do with why Notre Dame has lost their last two football games. Yeah, you know. Tyler Evans, thank you for the super chat. Can you take a minute and laugh at Miami and Georgia Tech ending? That was terrible. I mean, he did it at Oregon. That was terrible. had the same thing happen. So that is – You think he'd learn. He he has to step in front of those young men and apologize. Yeah. Yeah. I I would think he would as the head coach and say, you know, guys, this is on me. Yeah. And I know that, you know, the replay booth failed. He was down. The running back was down. They should have signaled down and said, look, he was down. Game over. So, but you don't put your team in that position. Once again, we're here talking about the position that head coaches and coaches put their young men in. It should never, your point, it should never. Like I had something happen to me one time, Sean, and um, I, I did something. And then my boss reacted to it in a way that was total bull crap, total bull crap. And my dad knew I was getting screwed over. But you know, my dad's mm-hmm. message was to me. That's why he shouldn't have done that to begin with. Because once you did that, you gave him the ammo he needed to come at you. It was a coach that I'd worked for, and he didn't like a lot of the credit that I was getting from the player level for the success yeah. we were having. And yeah. he got jealous about it. And so he's always looking to kind of find something that I did wrong. And I did something that what I actually, I didn't do anything. I was accused of doing something that I didn't do. And, but, but I allowed the circumstances to be where he could make that accusation. And there wasn't anything I'd say about it. Yeah. That was the lesson to me was like, yeah, but, but had you not done this, this isn't even an issue. Yeah. Right. And, and that's to your point. That's what Mario Cristobal says is look, 
This isn't on the officials. Yeah. This isn't on the running back who fumbled, even though he didn't yeah. fumble. I thought he was down at yeah. that point. This is on me. Yeah. I, I but the other thing too is, man, it should never come to that against Georgia Tech. They just got their brains beat in by bowling they green. Played, How was that even a close they, game? Miami played a horrible yes. first half. Horrible yes. first half. It just shows horrible. when you show but up with the wrong mindset. That goes to what we yeah. said. You can't look, you can talk execution as a coach all you want to. Your team is not going to be at their best every game. But your players found a way to win. Or put that they found a way to put themselves in position to win. In that position, you can't make that call. Or in that position, you can't have 10 men on the field. The last two plays. The, the both of those core correlate to me. Like you get effort from your teams. You can't do that as a head coach or as a coaching staff at the end of a game. You can't. Beef Eater, ND08. Brian, I've taken midterms at ND. Bless you, Beef Eater. Bless you, my man. <laughs> I was brain dead, but fine physically. I worked 90 hour weeks while uh, winning two natties in rugby. In my experience, the nonstop adrenaline blowout from both drills the edge and causes stupid mistakes. I'll take I'll take his word. All I'm going to say is, is like if you're applying this to Notre Dame, is like I, I'm not quite sure what you're trying to say. Are you trying to justify struggling during midterms week? Okay, then it would be something that's a problem every year. Number one, and for the better teams in Notre Dame, it's. It's something they battle through. We've never said it's no problem. We've said as you battle mm -hmm. through, you know it's going to be that way. Mm -hmm. You use it as pro you properly evaluate your time for that week. You adjust practices if you need to for a team, whatever. There's things you do that work. That's why some teams win and some teams don't in those circumstances. Um, the other the other part of it too, man, is look at the end of the day. You've got how many fifth and sixth year seniors who aren't even really taking the same kind of midterms you're talking about, right? Like DJ Brown's a six year senior, hmm. right? Like he's been graduated for a, a while, you know, like, yeah, he's taking real classes, but it's just different. My understanding is it's different for graduates. I mean, it's, this, was Sam Hartman throw three picks because he was going through six classes and dealing midterms the same way that, that, Rico Flores was <laughs> no. Did Blake Fisher make that mistake just because it's midterm week? I'm sorry, man. That's an excuse. Mm -hmm. That's an excuse. I, it just, it just <clears throat> is, you know? So I just, yeah. It's like, it's like people say, you know, like, um, no name struggles out of, you know, a week after playing Navy. Remember that whole thing that was the, that was the talking point. Like, yeah, that's because those weren't very good Notre Dame teams. All of a sudden, when Notre Dame's good, it's not a problem. It's like, oh, man, Alabama's a tough place to play. No, Alabama's a tough team to play. Absolutely. Because beating Alabama at Alabama wasn't a problem for Louisiana Monroe back in 2007. Why? Because Alabama stunk, yeah. right? It's, it's you know, the, the, the great teams, it's not easy for them. It's every bit as hard as it is for yeah. the bad teams. But the great teams have plans for it. They overcome it. They don't use them. They don't use them as excuses. They use them as justifications to be even better. And that's why that's why I bring up the academic thing. Players always say Lou Holtz would Lou Holtz would never shied away from it's tougher at Notre Dame than other places. Yeah. He leaned into it and said, "That's why you're going to be great because nobody has to do the things that you guys are doing." So by the time you got to Saturday. You were so pissed off that you had to take midterms. That you're going to take it on that other team because you had been convinced by the Notre Dame coaches that, that those guys basically don't go to class and don't have midterms to study for. And you're going to take it out on them and punish them for it. That's what Lou Holtz's teams did. You know, not all the time, but the really good ones did most of the time. And that's that's just, you know, that's just – I just, yeah. I appreciate yeah. you, though, man. I do appreciate the Super Chat very much. Oh, Iris, thank you for the Super Chat. Rewatch the game. Specifically, watch the O-line rotation. Seemed like bad plays happen. Even with our best, how do you think the rotation impacted the game? I just – I'll just say this, and I won't get into specifics, but if what I said – if what I was told happened, I just think mentally they weren't 
locked in. Yeah. They just weren't well locked in. And that, and that can cause you to just not be in rhythm. And un, you can't have uncertainty as football. The, one of the biggest dangers to a football player to execute a high level, Sean, is uncertainty. Yeah. What am I supposed to do here? What do I do when he does this? What do I do? Am I going in this next play? It's uncertainty. And um, that's why the rotation between Harry uh, that Harry Heastan did with Robert Hainsey and Tommy Kramer was so good. There was never yeah. any doubt about who's going to play. It's rotating unless you get in a two-minute drill and then Robert was going to go in. Or in the second half, if you're in four-minute offense, which means you're going slower, you're running, trying to run the clock out, Tommy was in. There was You didn't have to tell him. They knew. Oh, yeah. two-minute offense. Robert, you're in, right? Yeah, I got this. Didn't have to tell him. They knew. It was prepared. It was practiced. There was no question who was going to do what. Uh, you can't have certainty, uncertainty, I mean, when you're when you're playing football. Got to know what you're yeah. doing. And you got to know what, what do I do if he does this, what do I do if he does that. It's, it's all part of the deal. Garf, Cassidy, it was not in the loss to Louisville. I'm talking about the overall system at Notre Dame. These are referred so this to, like refer to this. earlier. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I understand all that, Garth. Sean and I, I mean, it's like Sean said, we talked about that during the offseason. And there's a time and a place for that, Garth. And, and we are not we are not sitting here as, as Notre Dame administration apologists. And, Sean, anyone that knows me knows that I'm exact opposite of that. Mm -hmm. The exact opposite of that. I just am going to – I'm just still, though, we're in the middle of the season. And right now in the middle of the season, the things going off the Notre Dame football program right now are related to decisions <clears> and, and things that are being done by the football – program mm -hmm. simply put now are there things that marcus are there fights that marcus freeman needs to fight to make things better for his program absolutely I, we literally say that we talk about those every off season so i'm i'm with you if, in that regard it's just to me i just i'm not so much in the mode to have that conversation during the off during the season that's an off-season conversation but i appreciate you clarifying i do we got a super sticker from Terrence Westbrook. Terrence, thank you very, 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 very much. And then he has another question here, Sean, from Terrence. Uh, East St. Louis Lincoln. I, I, I know that. <laughs> Being a person of Illinois. Use Luther in the slot also. The Cardinal Ritter team with Jamison Williams. Luther also was in the slot. So, uh, yeah, it goes back to what we said about Coach Drinkowitz. Um, and Missouri, you know, finding a way to get the best out of his best player. That was the number one wide receiver in the recruiting class when he came to Missouri. And um, that just goes to, you know, what we talked about, finding a way to get the best out of the right. wide receivers that Notre Dame have right now. It's in his defense a little bit, I'm not a big fan of – of him but in his defense you had two guys your two best receivers last year dominic lovett and luther burden were both slots and they yeah yeah so and they both i think they both transferred out didn't they love no, luther burden stayed love it went to georgia yes yes and, and so what, what drink was said yeah. him leaving made it easy for us to make this move yeah it's not like because like what yeah. i would say is like man that was if they, they didn't have a slot, they had some kid, just some random kid playing slot last year. I'm like, that's a, that's coach. You you knew who he was. You saw him. This you know this is his game, and and they kind of had to play him outside. Otherwise, you couldn't get him. That, and so what we said about Jaden Greathouse, like you need to be able yeah. to find ways to get Jaden Greathouse and Chris Tyree on the field together. Yeah, right. It's your most explosive player and your most solid steady player, right? Yeah. And and um and once Greathouse is back to being 100, that's just something they're going to need to do. But you can't play them both if they're both – it's like it's problem with Jane Thomas. I'm not even hammering the coaching staff for not having Jane Thomas be in the slot all the time because you've got too many guys that are natural slots. That's that's yeah. goes back to some of the recruiting woes that happened before Chancey Stuckey got here. You know, um, But they kind of had to do it last year because him and Lovett were the same guy as far as positionally, and you were trying to get them both on the field at the same time. But, uh, you know, once he left, it was a no-brainer. Yeah, we're going to play Luther. Missouri, I think Missouri does the same thing that you're asking Notre Dame to, right? Because Mookie Cooper is an interior uh, slot receiver as well. And they find a way for him and Luther Burton to be on the field at the same time with formations and everything. So it can be done. 
It's not like, oh, we can only have one of these guys on the field at the time. You got to adapt your offense to fit it. If this guy's not a boundary player, then I'm not going to ask yeah. him to do the same things that I asked Javon McKinley to do or absolutely or Miles Boykin to do. We're going to have to adjust. We talked about that last year when we when we thought that Lorenzo when Lorenzo Styles was the boundary. So look, he's not your typical boundary. So this is what you got to do schematically to adapt. Yeah. To fit your, hey guys, we got three slot play. Our three best receivers are all slot players. Okay, we got to yeah. get them on the field together. But here's what we got to do with our pass game to make it work. And. That's, yeah, that's but because traditionally, do. traditionally Notre Dame has those big yeah. outsized re receivers in their third or fourth year to finally right. take that step. Well, Deion Coles, he's hurt. Right. He was supposed to be that guy. He's hurt. Right. So now, you know, adjust. Right. And then last one, Sean, before we end the longest show you and I have ever done. Hey, we keep doing that every time. It's no problem. This is by far <laughs> the longest show we've ever done. Daniel, thank you for the super chat. I had to grieve after Saturday. I understand, Daniel. But I am back. I am as well. I love what you guys do, and we'll get this fixed. I am rooting for Marcus Freeman. Will Parker be here next year? I mean, we talked about that earlier, Sean. Yeah, um, I, I have I, I have no reason to even spend time thinking about that. And that's no disrespect to you, Daniel. I understand that. You just got to understand where I'm at in my job. My job is to focus on the getting ready to beat USC. I'm worried about what Notre Dame needs to do to beat USC this weekend. That's where I'm at. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk big picture things like in the article we're today, but it's all centered around, okay, respond against USC. Because here's the deal. If you go out and beat USC this week, and get yourself uh, – here's my prediction. Whatever they do against USC, they'll do to Clemson. That's my prediction. If they lose to USC, I, I feel like this team is just going to kind of go down in the tank and they'll lose also to Clemson. If they beat USC, they'll beat Clemson. Because that's going to – why? Why do I say that? Because if they beat USC, it tells me this team, to a degree, got themselves right this this week mentally, coaching-wise, player-wise. They may still be – they may be tired and all that other kind of stuff. Right, you got the bye week coming up. If they go out mm -hmm. and beat USC, it tells me that they they fixed some stuff this week, right? Yeah. They had some come to Jesus moments as players and coaches and all those other kind of things, and they went out and beat a quality football team in USC. And and so if that happens, then I then they'll 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 get right. They'll get right. Well, That's why this game is so important, you know. Because like, what if what if the offense finishes the season, including against USC and Clemson, like they started the season? Mm -hmm. Well, then we're like, hey, there was a Jared Parker had really a three week rough stretch in his first year but outside of that we did some really good things so you're gonna fire him because he had three bad games in the middle like well those are those are pretty big games very yeah. true yeah. very true but first year blah 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 blah. he can make all excuses let's see what he can do it, 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 so i don't or he just may it may continue to be the same problem yeah like i, I don't know yeah. all i know is right now what they did the last two weeks not good enough Let's see what they do this week. Let's fix this week. Because right now, I'm not firing anybody right now if I'm Marcus Freeman. I'm not worried about that. We'll, we'll, we'll have that conversation when we get here. We'll talk about special teams and offensive play calling and safety coaching and defensive coordinator and, and all these other things in the offseason. Everything <coughs> – you didn't win a championship. So, yeah, you have to evaluate everything in the offseason. Some, some guys may need to go. Some just, hey, let's adjust. Let's adapt. How can I make it better for you? Right? Um, but I'm not having that conversation after seven games when your team's five. Like sometimes I feel like we act like they're like two and five. Like this is like 2016 again, right? Like it's as I said, man, this, this is going to be just like 2016. Like literally, they could literally lose every single game they play the rest of the year and still have a better record than they have in, had in 2016, right? So, I mean, hey, I'm with you me, on the grieving part, man. That, that was a that yeah. was a rough one. That was a rough one, and it's I, I hope they get it fixed. But as far as if you're rooting for Marcus Freeman, then then the, you want Jared Parker hired to work. Yeah, that's the reality. You, you of it. do. You forgot about. We forget about that connection. Like that's one of his decisions. Like right. You want it to work, and I will say this. I anticipate that he'll be back next year. I fully anticipate that, and uh, I think the gods or the weather gods are preparing something very special on Saturday night. Like if you want it to be an attitude game, 
I think you're going to get that type of atmosphere on Saturday night. You know, you want a team to come in that wants to throw it all over the place and they have to go against the elements and you're going to get something special. If it's, it's going to be a, if it turns into a trenches game on Saturday night, I understand why Vegas has Notre Dame favor. Sure. I fully understand. I don't know if they looked at the weather before they put out the line, but hey, I totally understand. If it becomes that 40 degrees, rain, cold, and that's the type of game it is on Saturday night, Notre Dame has a really good chance, a really good chance, but they have to go out and play. It's not like USC is going to lay down. They still have to go out and play. So, right. uh, because USC has shown no battle and they were down yeah. 17 to nothing against Arizona, they're not going to lay down and die. No, because you know why? Because they're like, Hey, look, man, there's no score. We got Caleb, there's no mm-hmm. score we can't come back from. We got Caleb Williams. Mm-hmm. So, go keep playing, go keep battling. Go, hey, defense, we're getting our butts kicked. We need to make one stop right now to give our QB a chance. You know what they say? We just need to give Caleb one, one, one series. We just got to make one stop, you know. Sean, before we go, I did want to respond to something else. Something, some, some, a response here. When I talk about it's different for graduate players, uh, I don't want people to think that I'm saying it's, it's, they don't care. That my understanding, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, if you've got a, a master's degree from Notre Dame or been in the graduate program, the volume is different and the scheduling is different, is what mm-hmm. I'm told. So, like right now, there's undergrads that are taking five, six classes. You got five, sometimes five, six midterms. Mm-hmm. My understanding is if you're doing a graduate program, especially part of the football program, you're not taking five or six classes. Not all of them have midterms and your schedule is a little different. That's what I'm referring to. So I'm not saying that getting a graduate degree at Notre Dame is easy. It's a different schedule. We've, t- we've heard about guys that are graduates that take like two classes. It may be two hard classes, but it's still two classes compared to six or five. That's what I'm referring to. So I just want people to understand what I'm talking about. When I say it's different for graduates, plus they've been through this before. If you're a fifth or sixth year guy and you're still struggling during midterm week, you should have had it figured out by now. I'm sorry. This is not new. Didn't just creep up on you. You've known this was going to be the midterm period since the schedule came out forever ago. So I just, yeah. Anyway, what's going to take us out of here, Sean? Once again, thanks for joining us today on the mailbag. Be back tomorrow. Did you guys do the? Uh, we're gonna do upon, it tonight at eight. We're gonna we're gonna have a further review tonight at eight. Uh, That's IP the plan. Nation. I got to talk with Vince and just make sure there's a chance we just may not do it at okay. all. Especially since some of the conversation you and I had today is a lot about yeah. what we were going to talk about yeah. tonight. Yeah. Upon further review. Yeah. Uh, but I just got to get with Vince. So it, it may not happen tonight, but as of yeah. right now, the plan is 8 o'clock. Yeah. But we want you guys to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and share. And let everybody know Irish Breakdown. Hey, best at the biz when we're talking about Notre Dame football. Don't forget Sean Styers, IB Nation tonight. Uh, great show. And I think I'll be with Sean once again this Wednesday night. For the mailbag, the mail back. yeah, yeah. I think I'll be with him. This Vince Wednesday. has a the viewing and the funeral for his father is going to be this yeah. week, so they're going to mix around some guys and some things like that. So yeah, absolutely. And then I'll be on with uh, my guy Ryan on Friday for the recruiting the round. Recruiting up. And then we'll be have a the re- big weekend for you guys. Sean. Huge, huge weekend. And then we have the rest of the week with our shows where we'll be breaking down this matchup between Notre Dame and USC. As the Trojans invade South Bend and Notre Dame Stadium, it should be one for the ages. Folks, if you have not subscribed to the CFB Nation channel, do it. That's where you guys can get all the lucky lefty shows. They're going to be breaking this down. And, of course, our CFB All-America team. I'm actually probably going to be on with the CFB All-America team at some point in time this week to talk about the Notre Dame game. So make sure you subscribe to CFB Nation as well so you can get your podcast filled of my guy Sean and Malik, and they're always having like former players on, so they just yeah. they it's a it's a much different type of show than what we do, in in some ways, in other ways, but we're still gonna we're still gonna tell you what we think and tell Absolutely. you how it is. So CFB Nation, subscribe, I'm, check it out. I'm, we can get lucky, I'm, lefty. 
I'm shocked it took this long for an Elijah rushing question to pop up. <laughs> That's because our fans know better. Yeah, it can't be coming to Notre Dame. Robert, I wish he was an option because he's really good, but he's not coming to Notre Dame. No, I think he has his eyes uh, kind of maybe towards prime time. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So that's going to do it, folks. Have a great rest of your day. If you're still in with us, IB Nation Sports Talk right now is live. Right now, go join them. Check them out. Take a little bathroom break, get some food, get back in with my guys. It's Vince and Sean. Get with them tonight. Talk to you guys soon on the Irish Breakdown Podcast.